Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech, th beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the true uh, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. <coughs> are there any documents to be tabled? Uh, yes, President, I table documents and uh, pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham. The Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the routine of business for today. Is leave granted? Leave's not granted. I'm sorry, Senator Birmingham. Deputy President, uh, pursuant to contingent notice of motion standing in my name, uh, I uh, move to suspend so much of standing orders as would allow me uh, to be able to move a motion related to the routine of business for today. Uh, um, yes. So you have five minutes to speak to that motion if you wish. Uh, I would ask senators to uh, respect that Senator Birmingham has the right to be heard in silence. Thanks, sir. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, President. So, President, uh, I note that the government has a proposal on the notice paper today for a variation of ours today. Another variation of ours from the government, this time, though, to apply the guillotine in relation to their climate bills. To apply the guillotine in relation to their climate bills, and in applying that guillotine, their intention is to ensure that debate concludes, debate concludes by 1.30 p.m. today. 1.30 p.m. today. Let's understand that we haven't even started the committee stage on this bill yet. There are eight pages of legislative amendments proposed from the crossbench and elsewhere around the chamber, from seven different senators. There are some 16 different amendments, some of them detailed amendments with nine different clauses attached, and the government's proposal is to truncate this debate into this morning only in relation to the passage of these bills and the conclusion of the committee stage. Well, Deputy President, the coalition is making an offer to the government in this regard. Don't have the guillotine. We're happy to stay here as long as it takes until the bill is done. That is the motion that we're circulating. We're not preventing you from concluding this bill. We are, though, suggesting that you should live up to the higher standards you said that you would bring to government. You, as an opposition, continuously criticised the use of the guillotine. You continuously criticised the use of the guillotine. Senator Wong herself at one stage said that she would remind those opposite that whatever criticisms you might have of us, you are guillotining when you have been offered more time. Well, Deputy President, the motion I seek leave to move offers more time. It offers more time for those opposite to be able to have their bill considered. Indeed, Senator Wong then prescribed motive as to why the then government was guillotining. She said, you are not guillotining and gagging because it is the end of the session. Well, it's not the end of the session right now. You're not guillotining and gagging because you have to get the bills through. Well, they certainly don't have time pressures to get this bill through. You are guillotining now so that you can hold a prime ministerial press conference in time for prime time television. Well, guess what they're doing? Guess what they're doing? They're guillotining by 1.30 today so that they can hold a prime ministerial press conference in time for prime time television. The exact criticisms that Senator Wong levelled against the former government 
they are now doing essentially in this first week, the first week in which the Senate has got down to the consideration of legislation and business. This first time. Senator, as I've said, the motion being circulated in the chamber gives the opportunity. We will stay as long as it takes for you to be able to have the bill considered, get the bill done. But for those on the crossbench to equally have the chance for all of their amendments, be they the Greens amendments, be they other crossbench amendments, to get the airing that they deserve through that process. And this is an invitation to the crossbench. If you don't like our proposal, that doesn't mean you have to go with the government's proposal for such a short, sharp guillotine either. You don't have to work to the Labor Party's media cycle. You don't have to work to the Prime Minister's press conference schedule. You can dictate your terms, because what is being proposed in the motion that Senator Gallagher has brought to the chamber is far too short. What is being proposed demonstrates an arrogance from those opposite already, clearly working in collusion with the Greens, that they think they can just ram things through, that they think they can just use this Senate as a rubber stamp, that they will do whatever deals outside of this chamber but then not care about what happens in this chamber. Well, this is an opportunity for the crossbench and for the Greens to demonstrate that they're bigger and better than that. Because, of course, the Greens themselves were an even more strident critic of the use of guillotines previously. And yet last night we saw the Greens amazingly guillotining their own disallowance motion. They moved to guillotine themselves in that process. So this Greens is an invitation to you too. Live up to the standard, Senator Waters, that you called for previously. We have said we're happy to sit longer. We're not seeking to prevent debate. Indeed, we've indicated we will give primacy to the climate change bill, as we will then to dealing with other important bills, such as the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, as is scheduled. All we're proposing is extra sitting hours, time for debate, rather than the use of the guillotine. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham, and I remind you I am the president. Um, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. Well, it's 2022, and some <coughs> things in this world don't change, oh, do right. they? That's and one right. thing that never changes, no matter what, no matter what facts are put on the table, no matter how many of their safe, moderate Liberal seats they lose, one thing that will never change is the coalition That's will right. never support action on climate. Right. Will never support action on climate. And Senator Birmingham comes in here and says, "Oh, we want, we want a debate. We'll stay here." Well, you've had nine years. You've had nine years and an election campaign where you lost seats on this issue. That's a matter for you. The Australian people have spoken. Enough delay. Right. No amount of talking will change your mind. No amount of talking will give you some principle on this issue, because on this you have no principle. On this you have had no principle in a decade. And you all know that. Mr Senator Canavan and before him Mr Abbott. And all those, including Senator Betts, who don't believe that climate change is real, have been, have been perverting your policy position on this for years, and the Australian people are the ones who have suffered. The Australian people are the ones who have suffered. And those so-called moderates over there, who know this is the right thing to do, just roll over. Just roll over. Uh, while the right wing of the Liberal Party and the National Party continue to control the agenda. And no matter, I'll, I'll take the interjection, it's not true from Senator Michaelia Cash. I'll take that interjection because I've really noticed her. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologise. Uh, or was it you, Senator McKenzie? I'll take that interjection from Senator Bridget. Uh, it's not true, she says. It's not true. Well, it is. And history demonstrates that as does the election result. If there were ever a parliament that had been elected, regardless of what differences of views we have, to take action on climate, it is this one, in this place and the other. So don't come in here and pretend that you are somehow uh, safeguarding democratic principles. You're not. You're safeguarding your outdated conservative position, which, which the Australian people have left behind. That's what you're safeguarding. You're safeguarding your internal unity because you don't have the spine. You don't have the spine to take on to take on the people in your party room. And no matter how long we are here, 
you will not change your votes. It doesn't matter how many I have been in this chamber for debate after debate on climate, and you will never change your position, no matter how much I'll take. Oh, yes, yeah, Senator Rennick, case in point. It doesn't matter how much debate we have. He will not change Order. his position on climate. He will always. He will always say stand in the way of progress. I, I said in a, in, a, in, a, in a comment in the chamber, in, a, in the chamber some time ago. It's like the last days of the Soviet Union. It's like the last days of the Soviet Union. You know, against progress. You know, the world has changed. The world has changed, but you're still holding on. You're still holding on uh, to opposing action on climate. Now, I do respect that there are those who have different views. You know, Senator Roberts Senator has McKenzie. different views on this. I understand that. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the government has been elected with a very clear policy position which is reflected, which is reflected uh, in the legislation before you. Everybody knows that no matter how long we stayed, we could debate this all week, those opposite would not change. And I would remind them, I would remind them uh, that, that, that they have chosen also to filibuster on a range of other matters so they didn't have to so they deferred debate on this. Delay, 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 obstruction. Well, I think the Australian people have had enough. I think the Australian people have enough. And on that basis, President, I move that the motion be now put. Yeah. Order. Order. I'm going to put the motion. So the question is that the motion. The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The eyes. Uh, sorry. The eyes will move to the right and the left to the. Uh, oh my goodness me. I was at the ball and I don't even drink. So, anyways, let's just start again. Um, <laughs> the eyes should move to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the eyes and Senator Cadell as teller for the nose. Order. There are 36 ayes and 34 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now um, put the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham, Birmingham to suspend. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required? Can we ring the bells for one minute? I ring the bells for one minute. Question is: The motion is moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the eyes and Senator Giacconi as teller for the nose.
Uh, stop the count. Uh, Senator Pocock, you need to res sit down. I remind all senators, once uh, uh, that tellers are appointed, you are to be in your seat and not moving. Please continue. Order. There being 34 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <clears throat> I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Climate Change Bill 2022. Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022, second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge. I just ask senators to quickly move to their seats. I'm about to put a second reading amendment. So the question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Cadell as teller for the noes. Order, there being 13 ayes and 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, I believe, Senator Roberts, you foreshadowed a second reading amendment. Did you wish to move that? Yes, I still want to move it. Okay, so do you want to move that? <laughs> oh, sorry, I move my uh, second reading amendment. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Oh, I beg your pardon, four minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
order. I lock the doors. So the question is, the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to, though the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being three ayes and 45 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just wait for senators to resume their spots before I put the next question. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order, there being 36 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I believe there's a committee stage, so I call the clerk. Climate Change Bill 2022, Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Down the oh, Senator, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and I rise to move Australian Greens amendments uh, one to three on sheet one six one six by leave together. Now these leave amendments— Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Uh, these amendments would increase the targets for cutting pollution in this country to something resembling science. Now the bill that we have before us today was designed not by climate scientists but by political scientists, and the flimsy 43 per cent uh, emissions reduction target that this bill will enshrine is not enough. It's not based on science, and it puts us nowhere near the one and a half degree aspiration of the Paris Climate Agreement. It puts us closer to two degrees, which we know is an incredibly risky scientific situation, where we may see uh, catastrophic effects that set off a chain reaction that are not stoppable. Now, I don't know about anyone else in, in this chamber, but I can't actually bear the thought of that. We must do everything we can to stop that from happening. And so we are moving today to change the targets in this bill to a 75 per cent reduction 
by 2030, which is what the science says is necessary. Now, people will have heard us say before that this isn't just the Greens' proposition. This is what international scientists are recommending is the necessary uh, target for our nation to help us do our bit to globally keep warming limited to one and a half degrees. Now, we don't have support for this amendment. Spoiler alert. Uh, the two big parties will both oppose this because we know the influence of the fossil fuel sector on this building. And it continues while those political donations continue to flow into the coffers of both of the big political parties. And I see the now opposition shaking their head that we keep mentioning this inconvenient fact, but one does wonder what is the basis for climate policy of the other parties when it's not science. And when they do take millions in donations from fossil fuel companies, it's pretty hard not to draw the conclusion of who's in charge of writing climate policy. So that's why we are moving today to increase the targets to 75 per cent by 2030 and to make sure that our net zero target is brought forward to 2035. Now, we can actually do this, and I have a lot of confidence and optimism in the ability of our nation and our workers to take this transition seriously, to create the fantastic domestic manufacturing opportunities that 100 per cent renewables will provide. This could be a real boon for our economy. And I think most people understand that. They know that coal is on the way out, even the coal workers themselves. They know they're being lied to when the big parties claim that coal will still be employing them in decades to come. They just want to know what happens next and they want a chance to say what happens next in their local region, and they deserve that say. And you'll hear uh, us continue to talk about a worker-led transition and a transition authority. We look forward uh, to progressing through various different channels uh, because this country is ready and capable of having 100 per cent clean renewable energy and a prosperous economy that will flow from that. So we can meet net zero by 2035, and we don't really have a choice. Because look at what we're already facing with the natural disasters. Uh, I'm from South East Queensland. We've just had terrible floods that we are still recovering from, of course, that then went down to the northern rivers, um, exacerbating the homelessness crisis that was already there. We actually can't take the increasing severe and regular natural disasters. It's too much for people to bear. So we've got to do everything we can to avoid that. And having targets that reflect science and give us the best shot um, of not only uh, managing those natural catastrophes and lessening them, but actually embracing uh, the future, the new green economy that will be good for workers, good for regional communities, good for our agriculture sector, good for our tourism sector, um, good for all of us. It is a jobs generator. There are no economic downsides except for the coal and gas companies who are used to bringing in record profits, paying no tax, ripping off their workers and having fancy dinners with people in this building. They are the people that will miss out under a clean economy, and I'm OK with that. So we're moving this, uh, moving this amendment today because if we stick with the 43 per cent, it just makes the task harder later. If we've got science-based targets that we can work towards delivering now, that transition can be smoother and it can be managed. If this government kicks the can down the road, then the task for the next parliament will be harder and those cuts will need to be deeper and faster rather than um, an approach that is based on science from the outset and allows us to plan that transition to 2030 and to 2035. So there's no Science won't forgive us if we kick the can down the road. Um, now, as I said, I don't expect we'll get support for this amendment today because, sadly, uh, the fossil fuel companies seem to have more influence than the scientists in this building. Maybe one day that will change. Perhaps we'll see a government with the guts to say we're going to ban donations from fossil fuel companies because we're sick of them running our democracy. Um, certainly, the Greens have been saying that for 10 odd years, and we look forward to the day when that actually becomes law. Um, but until such time as that happens, we want to see this 43 per cent target increased in this term of parliament. And as many of my colleagues have said, the climate wars are not over when you are still ignoring science and when you are opening new coal and gas mines. And as we know, and I'll be asking the minister some questions about this, as we know, 
there are 114 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline that this government has to decide whether they're going to approve or not. And so that brings me uh, to my first question to the minister, and it's about your modelling behind the 43 per cent target. Have you factored in the emissions from those 114 new coal and gas projects, to be specific? There's 69 new coal mines proposed in the pipeline and 45 new gas projects. Have you factored those emissions from those projects into your modelling to create your 43 per cent target? Minister. Oh, Senator Doniam. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I uh, was very interested in this amendment and uh, I note the points that have been made by the Leader of the Australian Greens in proposing this amendment, but I also am interested in modelling um, and uh, just in relation to the points that have been made around the idea that we would be replacing 43 per cent with 75 per cent, setting aside the fact that the Coalition believes legislating something that it doesn't need legislating given the commitment made by the new Australian Government uh, to the relevant international bodies around our emissions reductions target. The, as it's been said by your own environment spokesperson, this is just a symbolic move. But I would be interested in what modelling the Australian Greens have done on the impact to household bills uh, if this uh, new threshold were brought in. What would it cost? Uh, for you know any household, what increase to the average quarterly power bill, what cost uh, to uh, those who wish to fill their car up with diesel, their Toyota Hilux, for example, uh, what cost would be uh, applied to household budgets that are already under pressure? Because as we know, and we only yesterday had the what day is it? Thursday, two days ago, had the Reserve Bank of Australia um, hand down their decision around uh, interest rates, which of course we're seeing passed on by the major banks. And so I think all of us in this place have a high degree of concern, at least I'd hope, for the impact this would have on household uh, budgets. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that's uh, one of the most important things we need to have regard for here. And as I've said uh, many times, um, there are two fragile things that we need to look after here. One is the environment. We need to do practical, science-based, common sense, uh, take uh, steps in those regards to protect the environment, but also we need to protect the economy because without a functioning economy, much like without a healthy, thriving environment, we can't live. We can't keep the houses warm, the lights on, the ovens cooking our dinners. So I just wonder, um, and uh, you know, I ask this question like uh, Senator Wish Wilson, as someone who comes from a state where our energy generation is 100 per cent renewable uh, for domestic consumption, something I'm very proud of, although we do uh, use coal to create concrete, which is probably one of the only materials that's going to be able to be used to replace timber when we phase out native forest logging in this country, unfortunately, it appears is going to happen. But uh, I would be interested, though, back to my original question Order. Uh, around what impact the Australian Greens uh, propose, or have, based on what modelling I'm assuming they've done for this proposal. Or if there is no modelling, please tell us, because that just demonstrates there is no regard for the impact on Australian households and the budget's already under strain. Senator Roberts. Chair, I wish to add to my questions, add to questions rather from the Greens and from Senator Dunningham to the Minister. Um, this has been described, and I reinforce that, as the most important bill that's ever been introduced into this parliament in terms of its costs and consequences on the people of Australia. I want to quote from an independent economist, Dr. Alan Moran, some of the costings that he found. And these cannot be sensibly refuted, Minister, because they came from the government's own figures, budgets, department reports, state and federal. In summary, the report states, and his report is titled, The Hidden Cost of Climate Policies and Renewables. It was prepared in August 2020. In summary, the report states that the financial impact of climate policies and renewable subsidies, this is an additional cost on electricity, additional cost. This is not basic cost for electricity. This is additional cost due to the financial impact of climate policies and renewable subsidies. Cost households at least $13 billion annually, or around $1,300 per household. Now, when the median income is $51,000, the after-tax income median is about 46. How the hell can anyone on $46,000 a year take home 
afford an extra $1,300. That's before the impact of this savage rise to 43 per cent that the government proposes. In addition, this was when the Morrison government was in, in power, accounts that the extra climate policies and renewable subsidies account for 39 per cent of household electricity bills, not 6.5 per cent as the government typically quotes. 39 per cent, almost 40 per cent of the cost of a household bill is additional cost due to climate policies and renewable subsidies. There's a net loss of jobs in the economy with every solar and wind job created causing 2.2 jobs to be lost in the real productive economy. Is anyone interested in that? Because it's not the people in this house that will be affected, it's people, the large majority of Australians who, has, who will suffer. We've also seen that the market distortion that increases the whole, through subsidies to solar and wind increases the wholesale price of electricity to $92.50 per megawatt hour, up from $45.40 per megawatt hour. These are the costs, and it's going to be horrendous. It will cost Australians trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. It's a highly regressive tax because it is going to be much more impactful on the, the vulnerable and the, and the uh, people on low income. And yesterday, we saw Senator Wong the leader of the government in the Senate proposing this bill, unable to define what net zero is. They do not know what their own policy is. We just wanted a simple interpretation from the minister, from the leader of the government in the Senate as to what, what uh, net zero means. Could not provide it. I'll tell you why you can't provide it. Because you've never provided any logical scientific points, which are simply empirical scientific evidence provided in a framework that proves cause and effect. No one in this chamber or any predecessor to anyone in this chamber has ever provided that. You have never, you have never provided specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on any climate factor, whether it be temperature, air temperature, ocean temperature, land temperature. You never provided on the, on the frequency, severity, duration of storms, droughts, floods, snowfall. You've never provided it on, on ocean alkalinity, on ocean salinity. Never provided the specific impact. And yet that is fundamental to any policy. If you cannot provide the specific impact, how the hell can you make a policy? If you cannot provide the specific impact, how the hell can you make a cost-benefit analysis? If you cannot provide the specific impact, how the hell can you measure progress? So Senator Pocock's got some good amendments, we see, but there's no basis for the, for, the, for the actual policy. You can't track the progress without the specific measurement. What is the impact of human carbon dioxide on any climate factor? Nothing at all has been ever pr provided on that anywhere in the world. 67% of Australians did not vote for the Labor Party to be in government. 67, heading for 68 per cent, yet the debate has been gagged. And Senator Macdonald in 2016, father of the Senate at the time, admitted he brought the set to the Senate's attention that the climate science has never been debated in this chamber, never been debated in this chamber, and it still hasn't. I've challenged Senator Waters many times. I challenged her 12 years ago in October 2010. She ran from the debate. She would not debate me. I challenged her again in May 2016, ran from me again. I challenged her here in the Senate. She ran from me and has refused to debate me on either the corruption of climate science or the science. That is fact. Order, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. A uh, question, Chair, on, on, on process. Um, Senator Waters had a specific question to the minister. The, the, this uh, in-committee stage is really a chance for us to ask the minister questions and get responses. Uh, I understand Senator Roberts has amendments he may wish to speak to. I haven't heard him talk about that yet. I was just wondering if we could actually bring this back to what uh, in-committee stage is designed for, where we can actually scrutinise the legislation. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I obviously uh, recognise your point, but I'm sure that Senator Roberts was getting to the questions that he might have to the minister. So, Senator Roberts, uh, that, that's not really a point of order, uh, but Senator Roberts, I will uh, suggest that you get to the questions uh, before your time expires in four and a half minutes. I am getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Senator uh, Waters has talked about, quote, targets that reflect science, but the minister has not provided any science ever to back this 
policy, this, this bill up. Neither had the Greens and Senate, and Senate of Waters in particular. Then she talked about science-based targets. Never have we seen them. The point I'm getting to is that my, my amendment will be requiring cost-benefit analysis to be inserted into the bill for future progress reports, future reports from the uh, Climate Change Authority. And I want to know if the, Senate, if the Minister understands that there has never been provided any specific quantified evidence. So how the hell can we ever have a basis for this, this legislation? Is, is the Minister aware, for example, that Ten senators have put in writing the fact that nowhere have they been provided with any evidence from their party or from the parliament. I'll read these names out. These are the, these are the names of senators and MPs with character, with courage, with integrity. Mr Lou O'Brien, Mr Craig Kelly, Mr Kevin Andrews, Mr George Christensen, Mr Bob Catter, Senators Erica Betts, Connie Fuhrer of Andy Wells, Jared Rennick, Senator Hanson and myself. They have never been provided at any time ever in Parliament or from their, from their, from their uh, parties with such evidence. Is she aware, is the Minister aware that this bill of hers builds on Prime Minister John Howard's position in satisfying the, in complying with the UN's Kyoto Protocol in 1997? And later on, in two th after, he re after he introduced the renewable energy target, stole farmers' property rights through his government, and he, he then said in 2013 that he was agnostic on climate science. Agnostic on climate science. I care about that because it's hurting people right around the country. So my point is, Minister, my, my amendment introduces the concept of cost-benefit analysis into climate change. It introduces the need for specific evidence into, into the basis for legislation. Will you support my amendment? And if not, why not? Senator Canavan. Chair, uh, uh, I just wanted to return to the uh, amendment moved by uh, Senator Waters. Um, in this debate, uh, it's a simple amendment um, seeking to change the uh, net zero or the sorry the the targets, the emissions targets um, under the Act, uh, under this bill. Sorry. Uh, so, so my understanding here of this uh, amendment um, is that it would change the 43% target by 2030 to at least 75% uh, uh, by 2030, uh, and also. Uh, substitute uh, a, the net zero target with almost a what is termed here a negative emissions uh, target. My, my primary question uh, to, uh, to the Greens, uh, who I believe Senator Waters moved this on behalf of, uh, mm -hmm. is, is the, uh, are these targets, are these increased obligations on Australian businesses, Australian industry, matched with reductions that would occur overseas from other countries? Uh, are they expecting that the increased um, emissions reductions that we would partake in just the next eight years, uh, would other countries be expected to match those before we take the same reductions on our own industries? And it's an extremely pertinent question given what is happening around the world right now and particularly what has happened since, uh, since the Glasgow conference only, only last uh, November. So less than a year ago, less than a year ago, all the all the, uh, 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 the rich and uh, well-to-do uh, uh, members of our, our global society flew in on private jets to Glasgow and the surrounds. In fact, the Glasgow airport was too congested. They had to go to other airports close by. Uh, there was that many private jets. There was a flotilla uh, of private jets flying into Scotland. Uh, so Armada, Armada, not since the Spanish Armada had the British Isles been attacked uh, uh, in this way. They flew in. And, and they made all these commitments, and, and we're all told coal is dead and what have you. Less than a year later, less than a year later, European governments are now subsidising fossil fuels. Now, yesterday, the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom announced massive subsidies to people using electricity, which comes from gas and coal in the United Kingdom. Less than a year later, less than a year later, 
the Germans' Greens Party, the Greens Party, may I remind the Australian Greens, they never, they don't talk much about. I used to hear the Greens talk a lot about the German Greens because I believe their party kind of started in Germany. That's where that sort of, you know, the, the first Greens Party came from. And I suppose they're just following. They're, they're following the, the German Greens. Soon, the Australian Greens. I look forward to the Australian Greens reopening coal-fired power stations in this country. But they, they had their, they got they got their start in Germany. They often mention, but they don't mention them much anymore. Uh, they're very silent about uh, their colleagues there uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the east side of the Rhine. Uh, there in Germany, the Greens have opened up, or they are opening up, in, they're in government, they are opening up 21 coal-fired power stations right now. 21. Now, my question to the Greens is, is, are we, is this policy going to make sure it's going to make it mandatory that our businesses shut down and reduce their emissions by 75 per cent by 2030, 75 per cent. But we will let, we will sit back and not even criticise, we'll just let the German government open up coal-fired power stations to keep their petrochemical industries, refineries and smelters going. Is that, is that the plan? I mean, and, and, and how would this plan, which seems unbelievably unfair to Australians and to Australian businesses, but how would this plan in any way help the environment? I mean, I think that's what we're all here for, or what we're debating here, to, to apparently reduce emissions to protect the environment. That's the, objective, that's the objective of this bill. The objective of this bill is to help reduce the impacts of global climate change and, and make our contribution um, in, in that way. But, but adding on this extra burden uh, to Australian businesses, how would that in the context of Europe reopening coal-fired power stations, Italy said last night only that they're reopening coal power stations. How would how would how would us putting this burden on our businesses while Europe's going the other direction in any way affect the climate uh, at all, even one iota? Uh, and and why would we do that to our own businesses and industry? Because um, I, I do give the Greens um, some. Uh, uh, leeway here, and at least that the United Kingdom government have themselves committed to, I believe, a 68 per cent reduction in emissions or something of that level. Or, sorry, 78 per cent reduction in emissions by 2035, so a little bit later, but 78 per cent reduction in emissions. So similar to what the Greens are suggesting here, as I say, the United Kingdom doing nothing to get towards that by um, fracking again and opening up the North Sea, etc. But, but that's their target. Like the Greens' target of 73%, not 75%, not far off that, albeit five years earlier. But have uh, my second question to the Greens is: um, What analysis have you done of the impacts of the United Kingdom's 78% target on their own economy, their own business, their own cost structure? Uh, because a slow-moving disaster is unfolding there uh, in the United Kingdom at the moment, at least in part due to their naive and ill-thought-through commitments uh, to net zero emissions and, and, in this case, particularly a 78 per cent reduction by 2035. Because of those commitments that they have made in the last few years, the United Kingdom had said no to fracking. They had banned fracking right across the British Isles. Uh, because of those commitments, uh, they had uh, refused to release and licence uh, new uh, gas exploration uh, areas in the North Sea, which has been for decades the United Kingdom's um, uh, gas and oil uh, access. And so because of all those commitments, they have left themselves in a position where they are vulnerable to the aggression of a Russian dictator uh, and are now having to take desperate measures just so people can heat their homes over what are brutal uh, winters uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it is an uh, unbelievable situation that a developed country uh, months away from winter beginning cannot guarantee that people will be able to stay warm uh, and at this stage, unless something changes, it is not too dramatic to say that almost invariably people will die over the European winter unnecessarily because of these failed, naive climate change policies that have put Europe in this mess. That, that is exactly what's happened here. They have refused to take sensible decisions to develop their own resources uh, and allow uh, their countries access uh, to reasonable amounts of energy. Uh, and now they're in this position where there, there is not many options available for the United, the United Kingdom. Uh, the new Prime Minister, uh, Minister, Prime Minister Truss, has already announced that she will cap electricity bills. And while that may see as some temporary relief 
uh, for British residents, it is going to create a whole lot of other problems that have not even been considered yet. Number one, number one, the cost, the cost, the projected cost of this price capping uh, scheme is is estimated 130 billion pounds, billion pounds. So a quarter of a million, a quarter of a billion Australian dollars, uh, just this winter or this next year. Uh, that is to put that in context. The, the the United Kingdom pandemic response, their JobKeeper scheme, which they termed a furlough scheme, their furlough scheme only only cost the British taxpayer 53 billion dollars. So the costs of net zero are approaching and probably will exceed three times the cost of the pandemic response in the United Kingdom. Has there ever been a more costly, uh, uh, more failed policy than net zero emissions? It is failing and failing so quickly. It's only been a few years since we ever heard of the term net zero emissions. It was kind of invented over the last decade by some corporate types associated with Richard Branson. And, and in 10 years, over the last decade, it, wasn't, it didn't come from the grassroots or you know, from any, any public uprising, it was a corporate plan. And, and over the, this 10 years, it has led to utter bankruptcy uh, for what were once proud and developed countries. And we and the Australian Greens are saying, let's, get, let's do that. Let's do that. The, the, the Australian Greens here, through these amendments, are saying, look, what's happening over there in the United Kingdom with their 78% target? Looks fantastic. Looks really, really good. <laughs> let's do that here. I mean, shouldn't we pause here? We should just pause and not further go down this track, which is clearly in, inflicting enormous pain, enormous pain on the British taxpayer. It is unclear yet how this will actually flow through in the next in European winter because the, Europe, because the United Kingdom government is destroying the price mechanism, which is trying to ration demand, given there's not enough energy. Uh, now they'll destroy that link and people won't reduce their power demand because prices won't go up as high. They still will not have enough energy so it's very unclear what will happen now, whether there'll be blackouts, whether there has to be government mandatory type uh, restrictions. Indeed, the president of the European Union, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, last night said that they may have to have mandatory controls. She actually said mandatory controls on energy use, in her words, to flatten the curve, to flatten the curve. Where have we heard that before? Mm. It'll only be two weeks, Senator Rennick. It'll only be two weeks. Don't worry about it. Uh, we will all, we're all in this together. Well, I don't think we should go in this together uh, with the United Kingdom. I think the Greens need to explain to this parliament why we are adopting the same targets that have failed in the United Kingdom and, and potentially would inflict the same amount of pain on Australians that is Order, happening to the British Senator people right Canavan, now. Senator your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's great to uh, address the uh, chamber on this uh, very, very important bill. Uh, and I'd just like to address uh, Matt Canavan's, uh, Senator Canavan's uh, concerns about the environment as a result of these renewables, um, because I, that you know, is what really concerns me on, about the path that we are taking, is if we continue down the path of constantly getting rid of our baseload uh, energy in this country, like coal, and replace uh, it with wind and solar and lithium batteries and transmission lines, uh, we are going to create an environmental catastrophe. Now, I touched on this last night. However, uh, it is well known that wind farms kill millions and millions of birds and bats. Uh, they kill apex birds. They kill lots and lots of bats. Bats, uh, many people probably don't know, are uh, one of the major pollinators, uh, along with bees, in our environment. Um, they also, uh, and then we've got the issue, of course, with batteries. Um, batteries come from rare earths like lithium, for example. Lithium's a 1% ore body. You have to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of metal. Uh, that involves an intensive electrolysis process that in itself requires lots and lots of energy. However, uh, these rare earth mines, it's just not that simple to go in and get the ore. You have to go and mine around and around and around. So quite often, uh, you're going to have to have a, something like a stripping ratio of 10 to 1. So you might have to move 1,000 tonnes of dirt just to end up with one tonne of metal. Now that metal, after it's been extracted through an extremely energy intensive process, then will get shipped over to China where it's put into a car battery. Uh, and then that car battery is then shipped to uh, the States where it's put into a Tesla. And then the, the, the Tesla comes back to Australia where you basically have to charge the battery by sticking it into the wall and using coal-fired power station. Uh, so that, uh, using you know, coal uh, energy uh, powered from coal. 
Now, the other thing, of course, we've also got solar panels. Uh, I just put a, an article up on my uh, Facebook page this morning about the economic, uh, environmental catastrophe that we've got going on over in California at the moment, and we'll have the same catastrophe here, whereby we've got uh, um, dangerous uh, substances leaking from these solar panels uh, once they are uh, put in, um, taken to uh, the trash. And, this is concerning because, as, as the head of the CSIRO uh, said in estimates to me, uh, it costs three times the amount to recycle a lithium battery as it does to actually produce a battery. Now, so the question is, and um, you know, this is a, is a big concern, is how are we going to afford, and what is the Labor Party going to do about recycling uh, all of these um, rare earth batteries? So, uh, and then the other thing we need to touch on, of course, is the transmission lines. We are going to have to have hundreds and hundreds of kilometres of transmission lines. Now, the Labor Party have already earmarked a $20 billion rewiring Australia fund. It's not rewiring Australia fund. It's additional transmission lines that are going to have to connect all these little tiny solar, uh, solar and wind farms uh, because these solar and wind farms don't produce anywhere near the same amount of energy as what a coal-powered fire station does. If you go back to the 90s when 70 or 80 per cent of the uh, East Coast uh, was powered by a coal powered fire, uh, you only had about 30 power stations and you only needed a limited number of transmission lines to get the power to the actual home. However, uh, you know, what I really want to talk about today um, is address the issue uh, that yesterday when uh, Senator Wong couldn't actually define what net zero was and I, uh, and I spoke to her about it this morning and she goes, well, Senator Rennick, why do you think so many scientists have all got it wrong. Well, I don't actually follow scientists. I actually follow the mathematics behind the science, and in particular, the actual algorithms that underpin good science. Now, last night, and I'll, I'll do this again because I can see Senator Chisholm sitting over there with a silly grin on his face. I actually, the first scientist I referred Order. to was none other Senator, than- Senator um, Rennick, please direct your comments through the chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, first, the first paper I raised was none other than Albert Einstein's 1917 quantum theory on radiation. Now, he himself says that radiation is so insignificant it drops out. And this is the thing about the whole science argument about how you know, we're living in a greenhouse effect, etc., etc. At the end of the day, the two strongest forces uh, of heat transfer in the environment is actually convection and conduction. Now, climate change theory wants you to believe that the atmosphere is a closed environment. Okay? The way a greenhouse works is that it traps convection. It traps convection. So during the day, as the sun heats up the, the greenhouse, the air rises. I'll order, Senator Rennick. Uh, Minister, on a point of order? Yes, it is a point of order. Um, the, 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 the tradition in our chamber is to have a wide-ranging debate. There is a motion, however, bef before the chair from Senator Waters, uh, and an amendment before the chair, and I do wonder if um, Senator Rennick is being relevant. He, he may be, but I, I wonder if you might remind him of the question before the chair. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Senator Rennick, I will remind you that the question before the chair is uh, that the amendments moved by Senator Waters be agreed to, and I would direct you to be relevant to those amendments, uh, and if you have questions for the minister, to get to them in a timely fashion. Thank you. I am being relevant uh, because, at the end of the day, whether it's a 43 per cent reduction in CO2 in the atmosphere or a 75 per cent reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere, it doesn't really matter. Because, at the end of the day, it's convection that drives heat transfer in the atmosphere, not radiation. Don't believe me? Take, take Albert Einstein's words for it, right? Because at the end of the day, carbon dioxide only absorbs and emits photons at two frequencies. One's at 2.8 microns, which according to Planck's law, has five times more energy, and that's incoming solar radiation. And the other one is outgoing long wave radiation at 14.8 microns. So the whole point of this discussion is to actually debunk the whole junk science behind climate change. And I did this last night, but I'll just run you through the five different laws that, I, like, that, prove that, so, that disproves climate change. Number one, first law of thermodynamics, convection, uh, conduction. Sorry. Basically, all carbon dioxide it does is absorb and emit photons that come via the sun. 
Now, that, that law actually is Einstein's special theory of relativity, E equals mc squared. And as I said last night, you know, he came up with that theory in 1905. Interestingly enough, he didn't get a Nobel Prize for that. He actually got a Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, which is one of four papers he wrote in 1905. And the photoelectric effect impacts the fact uh, that you know, that's where it comes into every, every uh, molecule has a specific uh, vibrational frequency, and it's at that frequency it can only absorb heat. Uh, now, the other uh, law that I also used last night was Wine's law, and that actually describes the frequency at which the CO2 molecule will actually emit heat. And as I pointed out last night, that law says that carbon dioxide only emits heat at 192 degrees Kelvin, which just happens to be negative 80 degrees Celsius. So the only place where carbon dioxide is going to actually be releasing heat is either at the bottom of Antarctica or about 10 kilometres up in the troposphere. Now, this matters, of course, because this, is, uh, this actually disproves okay, the fact that this science is bogus. But I'll continue. What I have here is actually an energy budget from the Australian Academy of Science. Now, they want you to believe that downwelling radiation averages out per, on a 24-hour period over 342 watts uh, per square metre. Now, funny, funnily enough, the CSIRO says that the downwelling radiation from CO2 is 333 watts per square metre. That's a difference of 9 watts per square metre. What does that tell you? That these guys can't even measure downwelling radiation. They can't even measure it. We're told the science is settled, but they can't even measure it. But guess what? The IPCC says that the increase in downwelling radiation since 1750 from the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is only two watts per square metre. So get this, their error in measurements has got a margin of error of 400 per cent. Right? 400 per cent. So you can't even measure what it is you're supposed to be spending billions of dollars on properly. How's that going to work? Not too good. But here's the other crazy thing. They want you to believe that the downwelling radiation from carbon dioxide is actually stronger than the incoming solar radiation from the sun. Now, that's actually absurd, because as we know from Planck's law, uh, from 1902, I think it was, that effectively the solar radiation has a higher, vib uh, higher uh, frequency of about up to 100 times in the ultraviolet range and the visible light range, visible light range is about 30 times stronger than 14.8 microns in the infrared range, they want you to believe that infrared has more energy than actually uh, ultraviolet and visible light. I mean, this stuff is, is pathetic. But here's the real doozy. Here's the real doozy. What's missing in all of this energy budget, people? I'll tell you what it is. A bloke, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a bit of a clue here. A bloke by the name of Isaac Newton uh, uh, hypothesised this back in about the 16th, 17th century, and that, of course, is gravity. These guys want you to think that photons aren't influenced by the gravity of the Earth, which just happens to be 5.6 trillion billion tonnes. They seem to think that that's not going to have a pull on a photon. So the whole thing's totally debunked. So my question to the minister is, is why is there actually 40 different... Uh, models to calculate net zero as per, okay, if the science is settled. Because that came from the head of the CSIRO who said there were 40 different models used to calculate net zero. The science is not settled if the head of the CSIRO in this country says that there's actually 40 different models and which model are we going to use here in Australia and how do we know that model isn't going to be, uh, is, there isn't going to be arbitrage between the different models, between different countries who exploit that, uh, uh, the confusion in climate change to milk Australia dry. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, uh, Senator Minister, you I are am president, so I will call you. Uh, terrific. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, if we needed any more graphic demonstration of the chaos that beset coalition government energy policy over the last nine years, uh, we've had it this morning. Um, so far, the contributions from the coalition side have included Senator Canavan, who has indicated that he believes net zero policies are failing policies, although, as I understand it, that is the current policy of the coalition. Gov of the coalition. Um, 
We've had Senator Rennick. So Na Senator Canavan doesn't believe in net zero. Senator Rennick actually just doesn't believe in the science, and he's leaving the chamber. And in that, of course, he is joined. Order. Senators um, won't cast aspersions on other senators leaving the chamber. True. Please, Minister. My apologies, Senator Rennick. Uh, and Senator Rodick, Ro he, Roberts, of course, also does not um, accept the science, and he doesn't. Uh, accept that anyone has ever provided him any Order, evidence. Order, Minister. Senator Roberts. Science, that's the basis of my Senator point. Senator Roberts, that's not a point of order. Minister, please continue. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Senator Roberts has on many occasions asked for people to provide him with empirical evidence, and I, of course, have sat through extended exchanges at Senate Estimates where Senator Roberts engaged with the CSIRO on the extensive science that is, in fact, in the public domain and available to him. But he's asked particularly about uh, what's been provided to him in this chamber, and it has been engaged with on many occasions in the chamber as well. With the agreement of the Senate, I'd like to table just one contribution, which is actually a speech that I made uh, in 2016, funnily enough, in response to a request from Senator Roberts that we put the science on the record. And on that occasion, I read through uh, the names of the 20 most cited peer-reviewed papers about climate change and its effects, uh, which was compiled by Thomson Reuters. Now, of course, I made the observation at that time that there were, uh, in 2013, 4,000 papers um, that expressed a view on climate change. Um, there are vast quantities of scientific information available to Senator Roberts. And the problem is, of course, that Senator Roberts cares not to engage with them. And that is, that is the problem with this argument. There is nothing that can be provided to, in response to this request for more information that will ever satisfy Senator Roberts. Um, but on that, I do uh, seek the leave— Order, Minister. Senator Rennick. A paper is not an algorithm. Science is underpinned order. by algorithms, Senator, not uh, Senator papers. Rennick, that's not a point of order. Minister, please continue. So I do seek uh, the leave of the Senate to table this speech, which is a record from hands. Leave is granted, Minister. Thank you. Um, but no wonder, no wonder it has taken a Labor government to land a climate policy and an energy policy, because the previous government was so racked by division and dysfunction, so unable to gr agree amongst themselves that nothing was ever able to be done. And the cost of that is being felt by the Australian people. It's being felt by an energy market that is ex experiencing real challenges, and it's also the opportunity cost. The jobs that might have been in regional Australia, a part of Australia that the National Party claim to be so concerned about, the jobs that might have been there for young people leaving school now might have been developed in new industries of the future, stymied, not developed, because of inaction and uncertainty. And of course, time after time, business came before us and said, what we're looking for is certainty. What we're after is a clear policy that will let us make final investment decisions, that will let us plan for the transformation of our businesses to meet a low-carbon future. So little of that was possible, so much of it impeded by the chaos and division and dysfunction, and it's why the bill that's before us matters. Now, the amendment before the chair um, from Senator Waters seeks to change the target. I don't think it will be I've come to a, as a surprise to Senator Waters that we will not be supporting this amendment, and I wanted to just step through why. We have a mandate for the targets that are proposed in this bill. They are ambitious targets and they are responsible targets. It's a target that we sought a mandate for during the election. We have talked about it after the election and consult further with our community and we will be sticking with that policy. It's a mandate that we respect. It is a significant step up in our ambition. It is an achievable and responsible contribution to global efforts to keep to 1 to 0.5 degrees of warming. The net zero by 2050 target is consistent with the Paris Agreement global temperature goal to hold global temperature increase to well below two degrees and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees. And the bill does emphasise the importance of climate science. Its object clause um, refers to the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. 
It requires that the climate change authorities' advice to the Minister for Climate Change on targets must explain how the targets have taken into account the matters set out in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, including the global temperature goals. As set out in Clause 10 of the bill, this is a flaw in Australia's emission reduction ambition and not a ceiling. Our aspiration is that the commitments of industry, states and territories and the Australian people will yield even greater emissions reductions in the coming decade. The Australian government outlined in its updated national and determined contribution under Article 4 of the Paris Agreement on the 16th of June 22 that this is our approach. And in addition, each successive target must be more ambitious than the last, as required by the Paris Agreement. The government must consider independent advice from the Climate Change Authority prior to making each new nationally determined contribution. In concluding, and I expect Senator Waters wishes to make another contribution, uh, I will just respond to her question about the way that the government deals with proposed projects in the oil, coal and gas sectors. Essentially, there are, as you have observed, a range of projects that proponents have flagged as possible projects in the future, and they are at different stages of development. Um, as you will know, the economics of resource projects are changing. Um, the projections that are developed by the Australian government are regularly updated. They incorporate the emissions associated with the anticipated demand for Australian exports, um, and that is something that is updated on a regular basis. Senator Pocock. Chair. It's, it seems like a pretty sad day in Australia when in 2022 we're hearing arguments about climate science after however long of the bullshit that Australians uh, order, have had Senator to... Senator Pocock, that language is not parliamentary. I ask that you withdraw. That may be very well, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Pocock, I ask that you find another term to use. I, I withdraw this truth. Thank you. The, um, In 2022, to be to be trying to debunk climate science in 10 minutes, I think is why Australians are so so frustrated. And you know, it's the arguments we're hearing are about Russian uh, gas prices, which is thanks to the two major parties not actually having good policy in place, which prioritises Australians, that we're actually subject to export prices. So. Let's keep that in mind when we, when we hear the talk of Russia. We don't import gas from Russia. Why are we, why are we subjected to those prices? We've heard about how 43% is ambitious, yet there's modelling showing that if you add up all the states and territories commitments, that potentially gets us to 42%. So if 1% if is ambitious, you know, I, th I think Australians are going to be, be asking questions. We, we know that climate policy is increasingly complex. In Australia, we don't have a, a cap-and-trade framework, and these reductions in emissions will come from more targeted policies. With this complexity, there's the potential for uncertainty around investment decisions, particularly investment in renewable energy. I'd like to ask the Minister, is the government prepared to consider a process that would set out the emissions reductions expected of each sector? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Pocock, and thank you for your constructive approach to this debate. Uh, I'm happy to confirm that this government is not scared of accountability and providing detailed information on our emissions and policies across sectors. Uh, under paragraph 12.1d of the bill, the effectiveness of the Commonwealth's policies in reducing emissions in the sectors covered by each policy must be included in the annual statement, and the government will meet this requirement. For example, the safeguard mechanism has a particular focus on reducing industrial and fugitive emissions. Our national inventory reports, quarterly updates and the official projections of emissions under the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement already detail sectoral emissions. For example, our last quarterly report released last week found that for the last full year of the previous government, emissions for the year to March 2022 are estimated to be 487.1 megatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, the 1.5 per cent 
uh, increase in emissions over the year to March reflects annual increases in emissions from the stationary energy, transport, fugitives, industrial processes and agriculture sectors. The report details the emissions of each of these sectors, as well as electricity, waste, industrial processes and land sectors. Our official projections look at changes in these sectoral emissions over time and our challenge of reversing the decade of inaction, secrecy and denial. These sectoral emissions and projected changes will also be clear in the annual climate change statements. We are already working with the policy frameworks for key sectors, such as our National Electric Vehicle Strategy and National Energy Transformation Partnership with the states and territories. The issue of sectoral emissions will also be a key issue for the Climate Change Authority's advice on future targets, including the 2035 target. Senator Waters. Chair, and um, I too would like to observe that it's nice to actually finally get to questions in committee stage because that is in fact what this part of the debate is for. Um, and so I thank the minister for um, almost answering my question. So I'm going to have some more questions about this. Um, there are 114 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline, and I, I did ask whether or not the modelling that underpinned the 43 per cent target, which I understand was prepared by Reputex, factored in those 114. Now, my understanding is the answer is no, but I think the minister actually shared some information about departmental modelling for future coal export demand. So my, my first um, question is actually to explain uh, what question the minister thought she was answering and then to answer my actual question. But I have some supplementary since I fear the uh, diatribe of climate denialism if I sit down will resume. So I'll ask all of my questions while I have the call, lest I not have an opportunity in future. Uh, the International Energy Agency in their coal 2021 report showed that Australia has more new coal export mines than anywhere else in the world. So I want to know how the government thinks it can meet the 43 per cent target while opening these new coal mines. And I want to note that the New South Wales and Queensland governments have approved three coal mines since this bill passed the House of Representatives. And I'd like to ask whether the government intends to reject approval for those coal mines. And I want to note that BHP has just put in an application to run a coal mine until uh, I don't even know how to say it. 2113, 2113, uh, which is insane. Um, and how is that consistent with the government's climate bill? So I'm really keen for, um, for the Order. minister to respond to how on earth we have a chance of meeting this inadequate target whilst opening and considering opening 114 new coal and gas projects. And I want to just note that I'm flattered by the questions uh, from the opposition about cost of living um, and global progress, uh, but I, I fear that they're actually not uh, genuinely asking for me to respond. Uh, but the answer, of course, is the cost of living for not acting on the climate crisis will absolutely dwarf everything else, um, as every thinking person understands, and this bill does not even get us close to the Paris Agreement, so it is clear that Australia is a global laggard. So with that done, Minister, I'm interested in using committee stage for its appropriate purpose. Minister. Mm. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so in answer to your first question, uh, the Reputex modelling built on the 2021 projections published by the then government. And the 2021 projections assumed some new fossil fuel developments in light of projected global and local demand. You asked more generally about the government's approach to new projects. Um, this is an issue that has been well litigated in this chamber and outside of it, uh, but I will go through our approach um, again. Business, industry and investors also the same thing. Domestically, we need to upgrade the transmission, uh, upgrade the grid and inject more firmed renewables, and the government agrees that this is what is required. Um, we are not unrealistic about the role of gas in our energy mix. We understand that gas plays an important part in powering communities by firming and peaking electricity and as feedstock and a source of heat for industry and for manufacturers. Any new large-scale coal or gas project will automatically come under the remit of Labor's reformed safeguard mechanism. This is the way that we will be reducing the emissions of Australia's biggest emitters. 
The government has released a consultation paper on the design of the safeguard mechanism reforms with the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water beginning an extensive consultation process across the country, and we strongly encourage all stakeholders to have their say. Uh, we also need to support our Order, trading partners. Minister, as it is 11.15 a.m., the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress and we will We will now move to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Shoebridge. Oh, um, yes, Acting Deputy President. Um, pursuant to notice of intention given yesterday and also on behalf of Senator Tyrrell, I withdraw business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, standing in our names for the next day of sitting, proposing the disallowance of the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment, Prime Minister and Cabinet's portfolio measures. Number two, regulations 2022. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Deputy President, uh, Acting Deputy President. I present the fourth report of the 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the report be adopted. The question is that the uh, report of the Selection of Bills Committee be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Okay. I think the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or arrange, rearrange the business? Senator Chisholm. Uh, I move that. Uh, a government uh, business order of the day number six, military rehabilitation and compensation and other legislation amendment in capacity payments bill 2022 be considered from 12.15 p.m. B, government business then be called and considered till not later than 1.30 p.m. C, general business order of the day number 18, restoring territory rights bill 2022 be considered during general business and D, the following bills be considered at the time for private senators bills on Monday 12 September 2022, uh, one offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment benefit to Australia Bill 2020 and parliamentary privileges amendment Royal Commission response bill 2022. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Farrell. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. <laughs> I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Farrell for today on account of ministerial business. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Clark. Uh, Chair, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of um, business of the Senate. Notice of motion number two for today, postponed to the 12th of September 2022. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the consideration of the climate change bill 2022 and a related bill be taken as formal. The is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. It is so ordered. Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. The question is that the uh, Senator Birmingham. So, Chair, just, uh, just for clarity, because I was having a conversation sorry, at the time, we're on uh, Government Business Notice of Motion Number 1. Yes, that is correct, yes. Senator Birmingham. I can ask that the provisions of that be put separately, please. Uh, are you seeking leave to... No, it's, uh, how would you like it divided, Senator Birmingham? Uh, for uh, parts B and C uh, to be put separate from parts A, D and E. Uh, uh, Senator Hanson Young. We just have uh, Senator Birmingham's request repeated. 
Senator Birmingham. Please Th repeat the request. Thanks, th thanks Chair. For, uh, for uh, the convenience of, uh, of the Senate, uh, I am asking for uh, the vote on parts B and C to be taken separately from the votes on parts A, D and E. Uh, the, the consequence of doing so uh, would be uh, to give priority to consideration of the Climate Change Bill, would take priority over all other Senate business, uh, would do so uh, without limitations in terms of the conduct of that debate, including without time limitations, uh, um, but would enable that to continue throughout the rest of the day just without application of the guillotine. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will put the question on parts A, D and E first. So all those of that... What? A, D and E will be first. Uh, so all those uh, in agreement with... All those of the opinion that parts A, D and E be agreed to say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will then put the question on parts B and C being agreed to. All those that of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is uh, government business number one, which Senator Birmingham asked to be split. So we are now dealing with B and C from that motion. And the question is that B and C be agreed to. Uh, the, eye, the eyes shall move to the right. We, sorry. Yes, sorry. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So I'm now moving to general business. Notice of motion number 33, standing in the name of Senators Cash, Mackenzie and Davey. Senator Askew. Thank you. On behalf of Senators Cash, Mackenzie and Davey, I ask that general business notice of motion numbers 33 and 34 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motions. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 33, standing in the names of Senators Cash, Mackenzie and Davey, and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Now move to general business notice of motion number 34, standing... Oh, beg your pardon, we move both of those together. Uh, can, are there any committee memberships? Uh, the President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. <laughs> Senator Chisholm. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. There's messages. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives supporting the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is the motion is moved by the Minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Motion Act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 to provide for paid family and domestic violence leave and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. 
Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, climate change bill 2022 and a related bill, further consideration in committee of the whole. Uh, I just need to change the chair because we're in committee of the whole. Is the deputy president around? The committee is considering the Climate Change Bill 2022 and a related bill and amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 1616, moved by Senator Waters. I call Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair. Um, my question for the Minister um, is a, a simple one. Um, I have three very simple questions, one, one that leads from the other. Um, it's been reported uh, through Climate Analytics, Climate Council, widely reported in the media, that the ALP's 2030 target of a 43 per cent emissions reduction is consistent with two degrees of warming globally. Uh, do you agree with that characterisation, Minister? We've been very clear. Uh, Senator Wistjordan, thank you for the question, that the targets that we have adopted put us on a path to meet our Paris commitment objectives, uh, uh, Paris objective commitments. And as you understand, the Paris Agreement asks uh, the world to contain warming to less than two degrees and to leave open the possibility of containing it to one and a half degrees. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, very cute with your language there, uh, path to meeting the Paris Agreement. My colleague, Senator Mar uh, Maureen Faruqi, uh, said that your target uh, failed the Paris Agreement publicly, and that was fact-checked by the AAP, who found that it, uh, she was indeed correct. Your 43 uh, per cent target uh, is consistent with two degrees of warming, which is above the one and a half to well below two degrees of warming. That is the Paris uh, target. Um, so I'm just going to assume that the two degrees is, is, uh, is uncontroversial. Um, Minister, my second question to you is, uh, do you also agree uh, with the IPCC uh, forecasts uh, first released in uh, November 2018, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, differentiated between one and a half degrees and two degrees in terms of its impact on the ocean, and they were saying that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees rather than two degrees would likely be the difference between the survival of the Great Barrier Reef coral and its complete decline, uh, according to the United Nations assessment of the climate science. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change special report uh, basically said that if global warming reaches two degrees, which is consistent with your target, more than 99 per cent of coral reefs were projected to decline this century. Indeed, uh, an annual bleaching event was expected on the Great Barrier Reef and on the world's coral reefs. Minister, do you agree with the science and that characterisation by the IPCC? Minister. Um, Thanks very much for your question, Senator Wish Wilson. And I think I have answered the question about our objectives. We are committed to the Paris Agreement. We are not only committed to reflecting those commitments in our own approach to policy here in Australia, but we are committed to participating in the global conversation to make sure that the world can reach those objectives. Because there is no disagreement between us uh, on the questions you raise. A warming world is dangerous for people and damaging to ecosystems. And we have to do everything we can as a country and as a globe to contain warming. 
the Paris Agreement gives us the best chance of doing that. You will know better than I that the world has been through stops and starts in our ability to generate global momentum. It mattered a great deal to strike the agreement that was struck in Paris, and it matters too that at Glasgow the level of ambition globally was increased. It matters that businesses in Australia are being encouraged by investors globally to set their own targets. There is a momentum towards change and there is more that is going to need to be done. Uh, but Senator Wish Wilson, I think where you are really going to is a question about our target. And I've answered that question already in response to questions from Senator Waters. We went to the election and sought a mandate. And we did it in a particular context. We did it in an environment where this country, under the government of those who now sit opposite, were unable to land an energy policy and unable to land a climate policy for nine years, a period in which almost nothing was done by the Commonwealth government on decarbonisation, where the heavy lifting was left to other people, to local communities, to businesses, to states and territories, and going to an election and receiving a mandate and a wide mandate to, implement, to begin a process of change led by the Commonwealth is no small thing. You may think it's a small thing, and that's fine for the Greens, but for a party that seeks to be the party of government, taking a commitment to the election, having it scrutinised in the context of election, having it debated with those opposite who, as we've seen this morning, want to deny the science and want to design who want to dispute the objective of net, em of net zero emissions, as Senator Canavan did, means something. And it means something to walk into a room and to update your nationally determined contribution in the presence of AIG and the ACTU and the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Clean Energy Council, building consensus and bringing people with you matters. We have a mandate for the target that is embedded in this legislation. We are pursuing the policies that we took to the election. And that is actually more important than you appear to be willing to acknowledge. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, earlier on, at the very beginning of committee stage, I did ask a question to the mover of this amendment around what modelling had been done with regard to the uh, impact on retail power prices of inserting a 75 per cent reduction target. And in response, at the end of her last contribution, the leader of the Australian Greens said she was flattered by the question but declined to answer. All I asked for was what modelling, if any, existed, and none has been provided. So I can only assume there is absolutely no regard for uh, what impact this would have on household budgets. I presume that is the standard that we are now setting. We will just focus on one side of the equation and not the other. I made the point earlier on, and I think it's not an unreasonable one, that in every decision we make, we should balance the economy and the environment, two very fragile things. We would never make a decision purely on economic grounds, and nor should we ever. The days of those decisions are long gone, thankfully. But we should balance those decisions. And I, so, it, the Greens do need to be held to account for such propositions. They aren't the party of government, and I hope they never will be. But when you come in here and try to alter legislation, and which will have, I believe, a very negative impact on something as simple as household power bills, you should answer the questions being asked about the amendment being put forward. I know no modelling has been done. They refuse to answer the question. Let that be known publicly. So I will then move to the minister and ask what modelling has been done on the impact of household power prices of your 43 per cent target. Minister. We've, we've had a, Senator Wish Wilson, we've had a question here. I'm giving the minister an opportunity to answer the question. I thought it was okay, Senator Wish Wilson. Chair, I also, I also had a question before the minister as well, before Senator Dunningham jumped. Um, I, I, look, a couple of things. 
Um, Senator Dunningham, uh, the 75 per cent target is not controversial. Uh, it's been modelled by the IPCC. It's well recognised that that is what is necessary for us to meet the Paris targets. This goes directly to this uh, debate we're having here today and this amendment before the chair that uh, was put by Senator Waters. 75 per cent is not controversial. And I wonder if you have modelled the impact on power prices of the climate emergency in the next 20 or 30 years for extreme heat waves and extreme cold and floods. I bet you haven't even thought about the cost of inaction, have you? Anyway, I do digress, Chair. Uh, I'd like to get back to my question uh, to uh, the Minister. Minister, um, we also have a mandate, the Australian Greens. Uh, we have the balance of power in the Senate because millions of Australians voted for real climate action. And it's entirely legitimate of us to be in here fighting for our mandate and for the people that voted for us and for climate action, including for Senator Pocock uh, and the, uh, the one in three Australians who now vote outside the two major parties. The one in three Australians who now vote outside the two major parties. Um, it might seem like a small thing, one and a half to two degrees, but Minister, uh, I'm confused with your response here today because um, it's very clear that your target of 43 per cent, regardless of whether you feel you have a mandate for that or not, that's not the issue before the chair. The question is, does 43 per cent equate to an ambition of limiting global warming to two degrees this century. And it clearly does. Two degrees is different to one and a half degrees. In fact, uh, all the things we've seen, uh, especially in the last decade, uh, the extreme weather events we've seen in Australia, the fires, the floods, back-to-back uh, -back bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef, a bleaching during a La Nina year, uh, record La Nina weather uh, in the last nine months. This is all happening on one degree of warming above pre-industrial levels. Uh, we are talking about trying to hold that to one and a half degrees. Now, to put that in perspective, that is 50 per cent warmer than the planet right now. 50 per cent warmer. Your bill here today will double the amount of warming captured in this atmosphere this century. A hundred per cent increase. 43 per cent ambition on 2030 means a 100 per cent increase in warming on this planet. So the difference between one and a half and two degrees is so material. And my question, second question to you is, do you agree with the IPCC assessment that if we can't limit warming to one and a half degrees, we will see an annual bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef and the loss of 99 per cent of the world's corals, probably in our lifetime, Senators? probably in our lifetime. That's how serious this is. This is not climate ambition. This is not what I've been fighting for in this place for the last nine years, during the swamp and desert years of the LNP, as I've sat back and watched the fire burn the house down. This is not the climate ambition that Australians voted for. So we need to be very clear here. Why, Minister, for example, are you opening up 46,000 square kilometres of new ocean acreage to oil and gas companies to explore for the exact product that, when they burn it, is killing our oceans and warming our planet and condemning future generations on this planet. Can you please explain to me, and I'm asking this in relation to the second reader amendment that uh, was moved last night uh, in here by my colleague, uh, Senator Shoebridge, why are you opening up new areas of ocean to oil and gas exploration in a time of climate emergency while you are trying to limit emissions and Australia's emissions ambition? Minister. Uh, thanks for your question, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, and uh, what I'm going to take as a long preamble. You asked a specific question about um, acreage release, um, and I will answer that. Uh, Perhaps by saying that we're fully committed to delivering on our 2030 and 2050 climate targets. It's why we're here today and it's why we're debating it. Um, the release of offshore areas for greenhouse gas storage and petroleum exploration is an annual process. While we are quickly scaling up renewables, other forms of energy such as gas and oil continue to play a part in our energy mix. 
Our approach is to reduce emissions by growing the economy and supporting key industries, and we are working with industry as a partner on our journey. And we understand that gas is not a low emissions fuel, but it does play an important part in helping to power communities by firming and peaking electricity and as a feedstock and source of heat for industry. So equally, we understand the changing and reduced role that fossil fuels like gas will play in a, in a decarbonising global economy. But the truth is that the best way to drive down emissions is with policy certainty. It's with policy certainty, and that is the purpose of the legislation that is before us today. Thank you, sir. Senator Robert. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, Minister, um, I agree with you that there is evidence of confusion besetting the coalition. It has been doing so since John Howard's prime ministership in the, mid, in the early 2000s, when he changed his mind on climate, and then later on admitted that he was agnostic on the climate science. Minister. I will be reading your papers yet again, but let me ask you, because you still have not answered, what is the specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on any climate factor? I would like to know that number. That is fundamental to the basis of any policy or legislation. No one has provided it anywhere in the world. This is your bill. You need to provide it. Secondly, I only need that specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity. And if you provide it and it's accurate, then I'll be silent. This issue long ago became matter not of science or of the environment, it became a matter of integrity. We've got hypocritical parasitic billionaires doing a reverse Robin Hood, stealing via a highly regressive tax from the poor and the vulnerable. And you endorse that. We've got a Paris Agreement that is not an agreement. The Paris Agreement, they agreed that each country would do whatever it wanted to do. China said, up yours, we're not doing anything. India said the same. And Australia said, we will gut our economy. And now you're going to ramp it up even further. Senator Wish Wilson, I'd like your view on this minister. Senator Wish Wilson said that he has a mandate, his party has a mandate. Mandates do not supplant, supplant science. Mandates based on positions that are based on lies are not mandates. Until you provide this Senate and the people of Australia with the specific effect, specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on the climate or any climate or weather factor, we, you will not have a mandate. Senator Wish Wilson raised the IPCC. Let's have a look at the creator of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Order. Order in the chamber, <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, Senator Rennick. Senator Roberts will be heard in silence. Thank you. The late Murray Strong was the first UN Director General of the United Nations Environmental Program, a, a position that he created for himself after forming the UN Environmental Program himself. In 1972, he became the first Secretary General in 1972, uh, later on that year. Maurice Strong is the concocter of Climate Alarm, and after forming the IPCC in 1988, at his instigation, he wanted to create an aura of scientific endorsement. Never has the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change provided any specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on the climate. Never. He created an aura of scientific endorsement. He entrenched climate alarm through fermenting the staged delusion of grassroots movements in UN conferences, including Rio in 1992, which formed Agenda 21, Kyoto in 1997, which formed the UN Kyoto Protocol, and Paris in 2015, just after he died. At the same time, Strong built systems to drive behavior and enrich himself. Maurice Strong formed and part-owned the Chicago Climate Exchange for global trading of carbon dioxide credits. Al Gore invested in that, and in 2007, Kevin Rudd, as Labor leader and predecessor to the current Prime Minister, brought Gore to Australia 
to peddle climate alarm with the intention of starting Labor's emissions trading program, emissions trading scheme, involving carbon dioxide credits that would ultimately be traded on Maurice Strong's and Gore's Chicago Climate Exchange. Separately, law enforcement agencies have reported really strong, sought strong for alleged serious criminal act charges and then reportedly he went, exiled himself in China. This is the man who created climate alarm. This is the man on who your policies are based. Strong had been Under Secretary General of the United Nations and used that position to push unfounded climate alarm via the United Nations and later combined with the World Economic Forum. He was founding executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, responsible for the deaths of 40 to 50 million people from malaria when he drove, when the United Nations Environmental Program drove the ban on insecticide DDT and did so contrary to the science. That man had a track record of contradicting the science, vilifying the science, usurping the science, and then claiming the science, and he's, he's basically been responsible for the deaths of millions of people and now wants to impoverish the world. He's made two stated aims of his, uh, of his uh, life, would have put in place an unelected socialist global governance, which we can see the evidence of almost daily around the world and particularly in this country. And his second, his second objective was to de-industrialise Western civilization. The United Nations senior level, have, many of their leaders have said, that they want to put in place a new world order. That's what this is about. It is about control of energy, control of property, control of water, control of resources. It's control of society through the United Nations Environmental Program and then through the United Nations Agenda 21. Are you aware of these facts, Minister? Minister. Okay, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Chair. I just wanted to return to the uh, to the question before the chair, which is the uh, Greens uh, amendment. Just briefly, just briefly, I have made a contribution to this, but I, I asked a couple of questions uh, uh, of the Greens of Senator Waters and the amendment she she moved. Uh, very briefly and quickly, the questions were: uh, Does is there any link here, or is there any uh, uh, escape clause, if you like, for Australia that if, if other countries don't act and reduce their emissions to their proposed 75 percent, can we not go through with it? Uh, or are we locked in? Uh, and the other question was, uh, why are the Greens expecting a different outcome in Australia than in the UK, who had committed or have committed to 78 per cent reduction by 2035, a very similar target, and are in a complete and utter mess right now, uh, at least in part thanks to that target? Uh, I haven't received, um, not only have I not received answer to those questions, the leader of the Greens, Senator Waters, had the temerity to stand up and dismiss and hand wave, say, oh, we don't need to answer that because this is about a government bill. That was her, 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 you know, she, she's, she, she's too good to answer questions. And I just want to point out here, I think it's very important to point out, that the Australian Greens are very good at asking for transparency and information uh, from other groups, from the government and when we were in government. Uh, but they just cannot, when the shoe's on the other foot and they are moving an amendment, they are seeking to change our nation's laws. It's their proposal, not anyone else's. They refuse to answer basic questions. Uh, about their own proposal, and that if, na if nothing else, that is why we should vote this down, because they're not a responsible political party. Uh, they, this, is a, this is clearly a stunt from Senator Waters, not, uh, not a sensible and realistic attempt to change these laws, because she won't even ask, ba answer basic questions about her proposals. I, I give respect, at least the government minister has answered a number of questions in, in this place uh, through this committee process, but this is a committee, this is a committee of the whole. It's not a committee just to look after the government. It's not Senate estimates. It's a committee of the whole. And if you are going to come into the committee of the whole and move amendments, you should be expected to answer questions about the amendments you are moving. And if you can't answer those questions, we certainly should say no, no to this amendment. That's what we should do. And I just briefly want to also uh, take, uh, take an issue with the many interjections, I think it might have been a contribution, but at least interjections from the Greens who are saying, oh, you're just in the pockets of the fossil fuel companies over here. We're all uh, uh, funded by the fossil fuel companies. Well, I just want to point out, of course, we all know, don't we? We all know there's no money in renewable energy, is there? No one makes any money out of renewable energy. It's all a charitable act, isn't it? <laughs> it's, all, it's all, we know all the companies in the renewable energy space, they're all doing it out of the goodness of their heart. 
They don't make money. They don't have dividends. They don't have shareholders. It's all just charity. I, I just want to pay tribute and respect to all of those hard-working Australian investors out there who are building wind turbines and putting up solar farms and don't expect anything in return. They don't, they don't expect anything. All those people importing solar panels from, made from Uyghur slave labour, they're just good charitable organisations, these people. They've got, and I, can't, I will not stand here and have a word said against them. Thank you. Senator Wong. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, can I just indicate to the Senate, we, we do have uh, quite a number of amendments that Senator Pocock uh, and others wish to move. Uh, and uh, I have had an indication. I have. I have had an indication. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, actually, I think the difference between us and them is that when the senior people on that side actually said we would try and resolve the debate, uh, my people uh, did the right thing. Uh, whereas on your side, when your people say that you're going to try and move to the next amendment, you all jump. Now I understand there's a lot of division inside your party room, but can I can I just can I just make this point? Can I just order order? Senator Wong. Thank you. This is a, a, a debate where people have very different views. I accept that, and I respect that. I disagree fundamentally with the position Senator Canavan puts, and nothing I say will change his mind, and nothing he says will change mine. Uh, we, we do have some new crossbenchers in here, including Sen obviously Senator Pocock, who do wish to have the opportunity to move their amendments and speak to them. And so I would ask the opposition uh, and the crossbench. Well, there you are. Uh, and well, we have we have. We have time. That's, I'm asking for some courtesy. So you you have not. All I'm asking is, well, it's, chair. Senator Canavan. I have been Senator, very, oh, Senator Canavan. Mind, Senator Wong has the call. Senator Canavan. Senator Wong. I'm simply asking that we could vote on this amendment, allow Senator Pocock to remove the amendments he has circulated. And then you can do all you want uh, you know, through the rest of the committee stage, but it would be good if we could get through at least the first amendment so that other senators could have the opportunity to put their views, because they also have views, Senator Canavan. They also have views. So as a matter of courtesy, I'm, I'm requesting that. If the chamber doesn't wish to do that, it's a matter for the chamber. Thank you, Senator Wong. Okay. I, the question is that the amendments be agreed to, and for clarity for colleagues, it is amendments one to three on sheets one six one six, moved by the Australian Greens. All those in favour, say aye. aye. All those against, say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Uh, division. Call, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that amendments one to three on sheet 16.16 uh, be agreed to. Uh, those uh, that are in agreement move to the right and those against the left. I point tellers uh, for the ayes, Senator McKim, and for the noes, Senator Dunningham. Senator Askew. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 41. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Yep. Uh, if people could move uh, either out of the chamber or into their seats. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments standing my name on sheets 1621, items 1 to 5 only, and 1620 together. Okay. So, uh, is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator Pocock. Chair, yeah. I move amendments on sheets 1621, items 1 to 5 only, and 1620. Is leave granted? Okay. So can you, can go. Go. you can speak to those Thank now. You. Thank the you, First Sarah. Amendment on Sheet 1621 requires that the annual climate change statement considers the risks pre presented by climate change. Climate change presents unparalleled risks to the systems that support life on this planet and all the people and places we love, including the future of the, of the young people observing us today. Climate change is already affecting Australian farmers. A bears data shows that the average broadacre farmer in Australia has lost 22% of their profits since the year 2000 due to the impacts of climate change. Proper consideration of these risks leaves us with no option but bold action to reduce emissions. This amendment will allow the Australian people to hold the government to account 
if they fail to mitigate against the risks of climate change. Amendments 2 and 3 on sheet 1621 require that there is public consultation before the annual statement on climate change. These amendments will allow the scientific community and the broader Australian community to make clear the risks of inaction and the benefits of action. Amendments 4 and 5 on sheet 1621 require advice from the Climate Change Authority be made public before or at the same time as the annual statement on climate change. The explanatory memorandum to this bill uses the words accountability and transparency, transparency 18 times. This amendment means that if advice is not accepted, the government can be called out. This is fundamental to transparency and accountability. The amendment on sheet 1620 relates to ARENA. During the inquiry into the bill, concerns were raised in relation to the scope for ARENA to fund non-renewable energy sources and other problematic technologies. This amendment closes potential loopholes that could allow ARENA to fund such technologies. Thank you. Senators. Senator. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Pocock. And, um, we support these amendments, which improve the Climate Change Bill and are consistent with our intention to both legislate the targets and make their government accountable for meeting them. Uh, we consider that the risks to Australia from the impacts of climate change are real. We have to reduce emissions to avoid the worst of these impacts, but we're already living with the impacts of climate change. And making progress on climate adaptation is one of the key issues that I will be progressing for the government. The amendments also ensure that the authority must consult on annual climate change statements while recognising that consultation for this year is difficult in the time available. And they ensure that the authority's advice on the annual statement is not hidden when the statement is delivered to the parliament. Finally, we also support the amendment um, that you have circulated on sheet 1620 in relation to the prescribed functions of ARENA. We established ARENA when last in government to support renewable energy, and we have opposed numerous attempts by the previous government, first to abolish ARENA and then to make regulations to force ARENA to invest in the, government, the then government's pet projects, such as fossil fuel-based hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Your amendments are important in clarifying the functions of that organisation. Uh, more broadly, we thank you for your engagement, or I should say, uh, through the chair, we thank Senator Pocock for his engagement with us and his work to improve the bills. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I just have a few questions uh, for the Minister around the issues that Senator Pocock's amendments go to, which is increasing the transparency and accountability uh, for our, not just this government but future Australian governments in ensuring that our ambition on climate change and lowering emissions uh, is reflected with uh, measurement and accountability pieces throughout um, the government system so that Australians can be very clear on where the benefits of action on climate change occur and where there are clearly disbenefits, to quote um, some of the mayors from the mining community's submission to the inquiry on this bill. Uh, so, Minister, um, when I look at the nationally determined contribution uh, that was changed rightfully uh, on your government winning the election and having a mandate uh, to change our ambition as a nation on climate change, you, one of the first things you did was remove from that document a five yearly review of the impacts of our climate ambition on rural and regional Australia. And we have heard time and time again in the inquiry and in this place and out in our communities that, yes, on a pathway to net zero by 2050, there will be opportunities for our communities and our industries. But you're kidding yourselves if you don't think there's going to be challenges for these industries and these communities. And it is not just the National Party that's saying it, it's the union movement as well. And so part of our role as legislators is to think about when we implement these policies, making sure we mitigate some of the negative impacts on those communities. And we all know who they are and we all know where they are. And it is why our government 
in securing a pathway to net zero, combine that with over $20 billion of new money to support these communities, to seize the opportunities that a pathway to net zero by 2050 would bring, but to help them overcome the challenges. And you are choosing to legislate your target, which you didn't have to do, and you yourselves have admitted that it was it's unnecessarily unnecessary and largely symbolic. It'll cause a whole heap of unintended consequences, and I, I outlined some of those in my second reading speech last night. But in setting that ambitious target without putting in place significant support and programs and projects to support rural and regional communities. You're setting them up to fail and you are causing an incredible amount of stress and concern in our mining communities, our agriculture communities, our manufacturing communities. So my question to you, and I, I have a range of them, is why did you remove the five-yearly clause that we got written in so that future governments, before they update our nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, have actual data, not just on the benefits, but on the impact? Because even if you look at Europe and what they're going through at the moment, it's not all going to be plain sailing. And so we need to be cognisant and aware of that uh, so that we can assist our communities uh, on this journey. Minister McKenzie. Uh, thanks, Senator McKenzie. McAllister, sorry. McAllister. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're not giving her a second go. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie, for your question. Um, I find myself unable to agree with your characterisation of the regime that is being legislated. The Paris Agreement, in fact, requires signatories to update their contributions every five years. It is baked in to the Paris Agreement and the regime that we are implementing requires government to seek independent advice on every occasion uh, in each of those five-year intervals when we seek to update our agreement. What is, uh, and so it meets the objective that you establish, which is that the benefits and impacts of the uh, targets that are adopted by the Australian government be independently considered and advice be provided both to the minister and publicly. That is the nature of the regime that is being uh, proposed in the bill before you today. Um, what is curious, or what is most curious though about this is that when a specific proposition was put in the other place, your colleagues in the Liberal and National Party, not only voted against it, but called for a division so they would be on the record voting against the amendments put in the other place to ensure that the interests of rural and regional communities were considered in that advice. And I find that very strange, actually almost incomprehensible. So yes, we do think that regional economic development is important and our policies are expected to result in an additional 604,000 jobs to 2030 with five out of six of those jobs in the regions. What is harder to understand is why the National Party and the Liberal Party teamed up in the other place to prevent an examination of those issues in the reports provided by the Climate Change Authority to the Parliament. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, that wasn't my question. The fact that somebody had to come in and help the Albanese government appreciate that their ambition was going to impact the regions. You needed to just check with the AWU. They would have been very, very happy to tell you what that impact would have been. The fact that you raced off to update our nationally determined contribution and removed, and I've, you know, I'm happy to table um, your 2022 change to our NDC, where you explicitly remove what we had put in, which was the five yearly updated review. And you stand up here today and you make an argument like it was all Albo's and Bowen's kind of plan the whole time to make sure that rural and regional Australia impact uh, would be part of your plan. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't. And getting the Climate Authority to do this and only looking at the benefits 
which is what the concern of mining communities, labour towns around the country, uh, have with your bill, uh, is incorrect. And so a much more rigorous and authentic and genuine way to address that concern would be to have a five yearly review by the Productivity Commission. Uh, so if you were serious about actually genuinely understanding the impact and therefore um, ponying up on levels of support for those communities, then you would be supporting our amendment around the Productivity Commission. But I think it's the height of cheek to come here into this chamber and make out like it was always the Labor Party's plan, because it wasn't. Because if you read what you put forward in our nationally determined contribution, there is no mention of a review, there is no mention of analysis specific to rural and regional communities. Um, and that's just a fact. So my second question to you is, given that the impact is unquestionable, uh, the desire to move on a pathway to net zero by 2050 um, is occurring, what guarantee do rural and regional Australians have in your October budget that the programs that our government put in place to support those communities around the country, over $21 billion of new money, what guarantee do those communities have that your government recognises that there will be benefits and challenges for different places in our country? Before I call uh, the minister, just reminding you, Senator McKenzie, to use people's titles from the other place. Show them that respect. I didn't pull you up, but I will in future. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Chair. Um, rural and regional communities can be absolutely assured that this government is committed to the jobs and industries that will come from the clean energy transition and will in fact secure the futures of regional communities. We know that um, there may be changes in some communities. No one denies that. And had um, uh, Liberal members of your government decided to attend the Jobs and Skills Forum, they would have observed a very extensive, extended discussion um, between a range of stakeholders between a range of stakeholders uh, about the way that we will support communities to transition. At least part of that response lies in a uh, $15 billion reconstructing, Australia Reconstruction Fund, which will provide uh, various forms of support for new jobs and industries with a focus uh, in part on clean technology and with a strong focus on regional communities. Um, unfortunately, the actual consequence of the policy settings that have been in place for the last nine years under your uh, previous government uh, that regional communities have not been able to benefit from the scale of investment that would otherwise have occurred had there been uh, uncertainty for investors about the energy transition <coughs> underway. And we know that because during the period of your government, those investors, those businesses came before parliamentary committees over and over again and said to us that this was the case. They said to us that the consequence of having 22 different energy policies, none of which Senator were ever McKenzie, landed. you have the call later. Uh, the, the consequence um, of 22 energy policies, none of which ever landed, with that a whole series of investments didn't take place. And that has direct benefits, but the direct costs, but it also has downstream costs. Because during that same period, four gigawatts of capacity left the energy system and only one gigawatt was, uh, it was invested in to replace it. And that makes a real difference to manufacturing operations, it makes a real difference to power prices, it makes a real uh, difference to the capacity of the national electricity market to perform its functions.
There being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with the amendment to the Climate Change Cons Consequential Amendments Bill 2020, cir circulated by the Jackie Lambie Network and Senator David Pocock. The question is that amendment on sheet 1606 be agreed to. Those that have opinion say aye. Those against? No. No. I think the uh, noes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <coughs> One minute. I try. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1606 be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. I'll appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan for the noes.
There being 17 ayes and 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, pursuant to the order, I shall report the bills. is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bills are now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. They did. Yeah. Four? One. One. One.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bills be now passed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order, there being 37 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Change Bill 2022, Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. Senators, that concludes consideration of the bills in accordance with the resolution agreed to this morning. The Senate will now return to its routine of business, and we're on question time, so I'll call Senator Birmingham. Oh, you got it, Don. Yep. Uh, Minister Wong. President, um, I advise changes to Mr. Ministerial Arrangement. Senators, we are now in question time. We have Senator Wong on her feet. Please. Uh, Sit down in your seats quickly. I'm going to call uh, Senator Wong again. Senator Wong. Thank you. I advise changes to ministerial arrangements as Senator Farrell will be absent from question time today on account of. You don't miss me this much, do you? I'm feeling sad. I'm injured. I feel injured. <laughs> oh, okay. It is absent. I will represent the Minister for Trade and Tourism. <laughs> Minister Ga Senator Gallagher will, Order. <laughs> will represent the Special Minister of State, the Minister for Social Services, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the Minister for Government Services, the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. And Senator Watt will represent the Minister for Resources. 
and the Minister for Industry and Science. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to her failure yesterday to address the specific question of whether the government of the Solomon Islands was given the courtesy of advanced knowledge of her intention to publicise the Australian government offer of financial assistance for the conduct of the Solomon Islands elections on schedule in 2023. I again specifically ask the minister, was the government of the Solomon Islands given the courtesy of advanced knowledge of the minister's intention on Monday of this week to publicise the Australian offer of financial assistance for the conduct of the Solomon Islands elections on schedule in 2023. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you to Senator Birmingham for another question about Solomon Islands. I again refer to my previous answer and make the point that no announcement was made. Uh, as I said to him yesterday, I answered a question about Australian electoral assistance in the Solomons, which has been ongoing for 20 years. I am surprised that the government wishes to, knowing as they do, having been so recently in government, uh, and Senator Payne, I'm sure, could advise Senator Birmingham about this, knowing you know, the uh, challenge um, of uh, a greater contest in our region, that the, gov that the opposition continues to want to press this. Uh, I was very clear. I was. I was. I was very. I was very clear. Well, I'll take the interjection about we were so reserved in the campaign. We remember the campaign. We remember the attempts from those on the other side to call people who, who in our side of politics, a Manchurian candidate. I was an absolute disgrace. Uh, so, uh, I, I would hope there would be bipartisanship around uh, what is occurring in our region. The government, has been, the government has been very clear uh, about the importance of both the Pacific and Southeast Asia. We have had the Prime Minister, myself, uh, Minister Conroy uh, and others in the region. Uh, we have increased the, the assistance through the Development Assistance Program. Uh, we have shifted on climate, which is the first national security priority of Pacific Island nations. Uh, and what I would say to the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, that it might be best to leave behind some of the mistakes of, that were, were undertaken in government and perhaps work in a bipartisan way to strengthen Australia's security position in the Pacific. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. President, has the Minister or Prime Minister Albanese spoken with Solomon Islands Prime Minister Songavare since the Solomon Islands government released the extraordinary statement on Tuesday accusing the minister and the Albanese government of interference in their domestic affairs? And if not, why not? Minister. We, we will engage as in the way we consider, as the government of Australia, most appropriate for Australia's national interests with the government of the Solomon Islands. If, you, if the uh, for, Shadow Foreign Minister had been looking at I think some social media, he would have seen that Solomon Islands is, uh, I think the Minister Masoudi, Foreign Minister Masoudi uh, is visiting. Obviously, we will continue to engage with them as we do. And I have to say, I find it uh, passing strange that I get a question about engagement from a government uh, which had so little engagement, both before and after uh, a security agreement with China was entered into, and whose best response was to send Minister Zeselia. Point of order. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, point of order. The question uh, was specifically. Oh, the minister's finished. Uh, I invite you to make your second supplementary. Thank you, President. I refer the minister to her statement in relation to Timor Leste's use of media to pressure the Australian government when, whilst in Timor Leste, she told a media conference on 1 September that discussions between countries, quote, are best done respectfully and directly, not through the media. Does the media concede that she failed to live up to her own standard by publicly revealing details of the offer to the Solomon Islands government? And I again invite the minister to be clear as to whether she or Prime Minister Albanese have spoken with Prime Minister Songavare since Tuesday. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, we had a, a thank you, President, uh, and I'll take 
In response to the first part of the question, which deals with Timor Leste, is the minister might know if he uh, actually, uh, I hope he does take the time to familiarise himself. The context of my responses to media in Timor Leste, which, unlike um, many, uh, for many years, uh, we actually have visited. I think the last Australian foreign minister to visit was Ms. Bishop, uh, and I had uh, very good private discussions as well as public dis uh, as well as public engagement. Uh, private discussions with the president and my, my counterpart, the Minister for Finance. The, the issue which concerns Timor Leste correctly uh, is uh, the economic and fiscal difficulties they, they see into the future as the Bayou Undan field uh, and the petroleum fund diminish and the fact that the Greater Sunrise project has been stalled for years. Unlike your government, we will work with them to try and resolve that issue. Uh, Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Can the minister please update the Senate on the Albanese government's progress on ending the climate wars? And what does this mean for the Australian people? Uh, minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Pratt for the question. And, uh, for, for many people in this chamber, regrettably not those opposite, this day is a day that had been, has been a long time coming. Uh, a day in which uh, historic legislation has been passed in response to one of the most urgent and pressing issues of our time, climate change. It is no accident that the bill that the Senate has just voted on was one of the first pieces of legislation introduced by the Albanese government because we know that Australians deserve and our nation needs overdue leadership in this area. I'll take that interjection from the National Party. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic, is it? Well, it just really demonstrates how out of touch those are, those opposite are, how out of touch they are, and how little those in the coalition who actually might order. understand that the order. Australian people voted for climate change action uh, might want to be listened to might want to be listened to. So I want to first say, with the passage of legislation in this place, can I first acknowledge those who worked with the government constructively on sensible amendments, and can I also acknowledge the support from the business community, the Business Council of Australia, which said this legislation brings Australia a step closer to ending the so-called climate wars, which have been counterproductive and served as a handbrake on progress a handbrake on progress towards decarbonisation and have slowed Senator our Rennick. economy. And, of course, the National Farmers Federation, uh, who said in evidence to the Senate inquiry that the bills are, and I quote, framework legislation that can provide business certainty. Business certainty. I know it's hard for the National Party to realise that their base is not with them on this. It's, I know that's hard. Uh, but they are not. And of course, the investor group on climate change, which talked about the opportunity to unlock hundreds of billions of investment in climate solution, it is those opposite who are out of touch. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. President, are oh, there, yeah. what are the international implications of the Albanese government's climate policy? Minister. Thank you. And I again thank Senator Pratt for her supplementary question and for her, along with every Labor Senator's interest in progress on climate. Uh, the rest of the world does watch closely what Australia does on climate, and as well as lifting our international competitiveness, the passage of this legislation is a watershed moment in Australia's international standing. You know, countries of our region in particular look to Australia as a member of the Pacific family to act with respect for their existential interest in action on climate change. Uh, if the, if the, and if the shadow foreign minister actually wanted to ensure we had stronger relations with the Pacific, he would not have voted against action on climate change, which is precisely, precisely uh, one of the disadvantages to our national interests that the more, former government continued continue to hold on to. It is simply not good enough for senators to say, well, this country isn't doing enough or that country isn't doing enough. The, our Pacific family expects more from us. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. How does the Albanese government's climate policy listen to and deliver on the will of the Australian people at the last federal election? Minister. Thank you. Well, uh, President, we all know that this Senate, for too long, has stood in the way of climate action. Uh, and whether it's former Senator 
Barnaby Joyce uh, uh, or Senator Betts in the past or today, Senator Canavan, Senator Rennick and so many others. Too many senators have been part of the problem, not part of the solution. Unfortunately, some senators still persist, and we, we see Senator Rennick now. Uh, and, and, you know, the people who refuse to listen to the Australian people refuse to acknowledge the message at the federal election three months ago. So far, it's been more of the same for them. They oppose the climate bills they before, before they saw them. And what is most extraordinary is they just ignore the message of the Australian people. They just ignore the message of the Australian people. You're not, you're not content with losing touch with Australians in Boothby, Curtin, Goldstein, Thank you, Minister. etc. Your time you're has just expired. out of touch. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Early Childhood Education, Senator Watt. Minister, under Labor's proposed childcare changes, what will the increase in childcare subsidy be for a family earning $60,000? Is it true that the subsidy will lift from 90 per cent to 95 per cent under Labor's proposal? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, well, and yes, I am the representing minister. That is a statement of fact. And as the representing minister, what I can tell you is that the Order. Albanese Labor government will be delivering cheaper childcare for Australian families something that your government did not do. 97 per cent of families in Australia um, will be better Senator off Watt, as a result. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Hughes. Point of order of relevance. It was a very specific question. Is it true they will go from 90 to 95 per cent a family with $60,000? Thanks, Senator Ciccone. You should be the minister. Uh, Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. I have reminded senators I did remind senators yesterday, and I'll remind senators again today. When you call a point of order, you simply state the point of order and then not get into argument or other statements. Uh, I do believe that the minister is being relevant. He's just started answering the question. There were a lot of interjections already the minute he stood, so it's quite difficult to hear him. Um, but uh, I am listening carefully. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, as I was saying, I'm very happy about the fact that the Albanese Labor government will be delivering cheaper childcare to Australian families. Not just one family, not just two families, but 97 per cent of Australian families using the early childhood sector and childcare system will be better off as a result of our policy, something that you were not able to do in your first year, your second year, your third year, your fourth year, your fifth year, your sixth year, your seventh year, your eighth year or your ninth um, year. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes. Point of order on direct relevance. It was a very specific question that Thank the you. minister should be able to answer families on $60,000, uh, 90 to 95. Senator Hughes, there is no need to— Senator Hughes. You have asked me for a point of order. You may not agree with what I say, but I am the president, and it's your job to make your point of order, sit down, and then not further interject. Uh, Senator Watt? That's right. Uh, Senator Watt, I would draw you back to the question. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, uh, President. I'm happy to take the exact details of that question on notice for, for, the, um, for Senator Hughes. Um, the, uh, and I'm happy that she's showing an interest in this issue because I don't remember, I don't remember any opposition senator ever doing anything to support childcare in the way that the Labor government is doing. I, what I do remember, what I do remember, what I do remember is the is the now opposition copying the policy of the Labor then opposition when it came to childcare, but not delivering that policy in full. And then for that reason, that policy, what was then your policy, left a lot of Australian families much more out of pocket than ours were. Uh, That's Senator what I remember. Minister, please resume your seat. Please direct the minister to uh, actually answer the thank question. Thank you, Senator Hughes. I will remind uh, the minister. I know he's uh, agreed to take the question uh, on notice, but I, but I can, Senator, Minister, sorry. please resume your seat. 
Senator Hughes, Senator Hughes, resume your seat. I am not entertaining any further points of order from you on this matter. I have directed the minister to be relevant. Minister Book, Birmingham. Um, pre pre President, President, on, on the points of, uh, points of order that have been taken, and indeed uh, Senator Watt's assertion while you were speaking before that uh, cavalierly that he still has 30 more seconds uh, with a tone that apparently means he can say whatever he likes, um, just because he has taken the details on notice does not um, remove the obligation for him to be directly relevant to the question that has been asked and does not provide him with free licence to simply talk about the previous government, President. And I encourage you to draw him back uh, to the direct you. relevance of the question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. You might recall I was in the process of responding to the point of order raised by Senator Hughes, and Senator Hughes took it upon herself to interject again. So I've not been given the answer. I've not been given the opportunity to respond. I will draw Senator Watt back to the uh, question, and I would ask all senators to raise their points of order respectfully, and to sit down when asked to do so. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Um, as I was saying, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to remind the chamber, um, all Australian families who use the childcare system will be better off under the Labor policy that we will now implement than under the policies that existed under the former government. Uh, that, it took a change of government to deliver the cheaper childcare that Australian families so desperately need. There is one party that is delivering a cost of living benefit to Australians. It is Labor in childcare uh, thank and other you, areas. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, President. So, under Labor's proposed childcare changes, and I'm assuming you'll have to take this one on notice, but if you could stick to that, what will the increase in childcare subsidy be for a family earning $400,000? And is it true that the subsidy will now lift from zero to 27 per cent under Labor's proposal? Minister. Thank you, President. I, again, I'm happy to take the details of that question on notice for Senator Hughes. Uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, her colleagues in the House of Representatives are posing the same question to the actual minister to get that level of detail. Uh, if that's not occurring, perhaps she could have a chat to her colleagues about that. But um, I, think the, I think the other point to be noticed here is that, Order. as we have consistently said, President, uh, childcare is not simply a social welfare program. Childcare is not simply about economically supporting families who receive childcare benefits, as important as that is. Increasing childcare payments is an important economic uh, policy of this government to broaden particularly Senator women's McGrath. participation in the workforce. Having affordable childcare, regardless of income, is an important measure for this government to take uh, to increase women's participation in the, in the workforce. It is a shame that the former government didn't take the opportunity in any of the nine and a bit years that it was in government to do Thank the same you, thing. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. Now, whilst I appreciate the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the minister not been the minister, not my job, Minister Senator Watt. Uh, is taking it on notice to actually get the figures. Some of us actually have had a look at these papers. So perhaps you may like to explain why, under Labor's much vaunted cost of living support, it's proposing to give more than five times the extra assistance to a family earning over $400,000 than Senator it does Hughes, to a family time earning for the question has expired, Minister. Thank you, President. There's nothing quite like being condescended to by Senator Hughes, is there, to make one's self-esteem feel even that much stronger. Um, whenever I'm Our feeling minister, any degree of self-doubt— Minister, I'm waiting for silence. Uh, yeah, that was, I asked Hughes. the minister to withdraw. That was disparaging to me and to every woman in this place. He should withdraw. But, Senator Watt, if you think you were, if, if it would assist the chamber, if you withdrew. Well, I, if it would assist the chamber, I'm happy to withdraw. Thank I will point you. out that I was directing those remarks to only Senator Hughes uh, when it comes to condescending other people in this chamber. Senator, the, uh, but but if, Minister, I'm happy to withdraw if that assists the chamber. Seat, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. When I ask people to either 
in the interest of the chamber to withdraw or to withdraw fully, I don't expect it to be done. I expect it to be done in a serious manner, and for no other commentary to um, be put with that. So, if you would um, consider the chamber and withdraw and move on, thank you. In, in answer to Senator Hughes's uh, supplementary question, as I was saying in answer to the previous question, uh, something that the opposition seems to fail to grasp is that childcare payments are not only a social welfare measure. They are an important measure to encourage more women to participate in the workplace. We know that women's participation in the workplace is far lower than men's, and we know that increasing women's participation in the workplace is an important economic measure for this government. Oh, sorry. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Ruskin. Uh, a point of order on clarification. Is the minister saying that uh, childcare is a social That's welfare measure? That's not a point measure? of order, Senator Ruston. Please continue. Uh, order, order. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly, Senator Ruston. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. And if, if Senator Ruston requires me to repeat the point, the point I was making was that childcare payments are not only a social welfare measure, they are an economic development measure. Um, the Australian workforce needs more women you, and childcare payments will expired. assist. Senator McKim. Our order. Senator McKim has got the call. Thank, uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, yesterday's national accounts showed that profits share of national income hit a new record high and that wages share of national income hit a new record low. This means that in the 60 years that the national accounts have been kept and published, never have business owners been getting a bigger slice of the pie and never have workers been getting a smaller slice of the pie. Will your government now finally accept that in the domestic context it is corporate profiteering that is a key driver of inflation and that wages are actually not driving inflation? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator McKim uh, for the question on the national accounts and his ongoing interest in the economy. Um, I don't think we have ever, as the government said, I don't think we've ever said, uh, in response to the final part of, of your question, that wages have been driving inflation. I don't think anyone on this side of the chamber um, has been saying that at all. Um, on the broader question, there are some challenges that are, are clear in, in the national accounts, which makes our economic plan even more important than ever. To to um, roll out uh, in relation to some of those issues we've seen in supply chains, in, in relation to some of the issues around productivity. Um, on, the, on the point of um, businesses and their profits, I mean, we want business to do well. We think it is important that business does well, but we've been on the record a number of times, including as a major part of our election campaign, the fact that we want to see wages moving. And that's why we have done absolutely everything we can since coming to government to make sure that we are supporting sensible and reasonable wage increases, um, particularly in areas like the minimum wage for people working on the lowest wages in the country and also in the area of aged care, where we're supporting the Fair Work Commission. We've got some work underway around workplace relations reform, which, as you know, um, the Senate will have to deal with at some point uh, later this year. Uh, but we are doing everything we can to make sure that working people, people are getting a decent pay rise. That has been one of the major failings in our economy over the last 10 years. It was because we had this mob over there had wage suppression as a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture. We are breaking down that architecture because we want to Thank see you, wages Minister, growing. Your time has expired. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, today uh, in his speech to the Annika Foundation, RBO, RBA Governor Dr Philip Lowe yet again failed to acknowledge the role of corporate profits in driving inflation. And I might 
um, reflect neither did you just then in your answer. Yet in July, Dr Lowe said workers should anchor their expectation of wage increases at 3.5 per cent, well below inflation. Are you comfortable with an RBA governor jawboning down wages but saying nothing about corporate profits? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I'd have to go back and have a look at. at I remember the governor saying, uh, making comments about wanting to see wages with a three in front of it, um, and I, I understand. And my recollection is he was saying that at a time when inflation was sitting below three percent, sitting probably in the order of 1.7 percent. So he. My recollection of that was that the governor was saying that the uh, wages were a handbrake on the economy, or slow wages growth was a handbrake on the economy. He wanted to see them get moving. We are now, of course, in a very different environment, and I've only had a, a short opportunity to have a look at um, uh, Governor Lowe's uh, remarks today in his speech. Uh, but I think he went through in that speech explaining, um, you know, I think he used the word surprise around um, the increase in the rate of inflation. Uh, and he, he certainly went through it in detail about um, the unexpected nature of that inflation surge and some of the reasons uh, behind that. Uh, but I think his record on wages has been Thank you, that— Minister. Your time has Sorry. expired. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, last year Dr Lowe said that the RBA would not increase interest rates until wages growth was materially higher. Real wages are going backwards, but the RBA has increased rates for five consecutive months after effectively telling Australians they would not go up until 2024. Do you agree that we need some accountability in the system, and do you agree that Dr Lowe thank you, has Senator got to McKim, go? Thank you, Senator McKim. Your time has expired, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um Madam President, in the minute available, there was a lot in that to unpack, but I, I strongly support the independence of the Reserve Bank and the long-standing convention uh, that the bank should not be interfered with by politicians. I think the review that underway is useful, and uh, Governor Lowe has, has made some comments on that uh, today. Uh, I think we are. The, the Reserve Bank is doing uh, the work that they need to do to bring inflation down. Um, but the review will certainly assist all of us to ensure that the Reserve Bank uh, remains fit for purpose. And I think the governor has been accountable for the comments he's made and some of the decisions the bank uh, has made, uh, in, particularly in the last um, few months, in raising interest rates. I understand he's given this speech today. He's given a long press conference afterwards. So in that respect, um, he has been accountable for those decisions. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Yesterday, Australia and Timor-Leste signed a defence cooperation agreement. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the agreement will strengthen our defence relationship with Timor-Leste? Minister. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Billick for her interest uh, in foreign policy and for her uh, question, uh, which does go to a very important issue about how Australia can work best with the countries of our region to support and promote our mutual security and sovereignty. So, as we are, Australia is committed to supporting Timor Leste security and sovereignty, including through our enduring defence cooperation. So, the Albanese government was pleased to sign a defence cooperation agreement with Timor Leste, and the agreement signed yesterday by our defence ministers is a status of forces agreement that sets out reciprocal protections, responsibilities, and privileges each country will grant the military personnel of the other in its territory. It will allow both countries to increase defence and security cooperation, especially in the maritime domain, given our shared border and adjacent maritime zones. Uh, and this responded to particularly a priority that was expressed both publicly, uh, expressed publicly by the, uh, President Ramos Horta. It will announce our ability to operate together as required, conduct exercises and training, and cooperate on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I'm pleased to advise the Senate the agreement also means Timorese military members operating or exercising or training in Australia will receive the same protections, responsibilities and privileges as Australian personnel will receive in Timor-Leste. Australia welcomes this defence cooperation agreement. Uh, we acknowledge the contribution of the Timor-Leste government 
uh, and can I particularly acknowledge uh, my counterpart, Minister Magno, for her assistance in bringing this agreement to conclusion. The agreement provides the opportunity to deepen our close defence and security partnership with Timor-Leste. This is the government working to listen to our partners in the region and responding to their needs in order to maintain a stable, prosperous and peaceful region. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. How will the Albanese Labor government continue to help Timor-Leste build its economic resilience? Minister. Thank you, uh, President and uh, Senator Billick. Uh, thank you for that question because the economic resilience of Timor-Leste is uh, of great importance, not only to the people of, Timor, uh, of East Timor, uh, but to Australia, which has a, uh, you know, a, a stake uh, in uh, the Timor-Leste independence and sovereignty and obviously very close personal relationships and friendships between our two peoples. Uh, in the, my recent visit, I announced an additional $20 million in budget support for Timor-Leste to support its economic resilience and recovery from COVID-19. We are also on track to provide our first bilateral concessional loan for Timor-Leste for the development of Delhi Airport. We have a partnership to deliver a cyber, submarine fibre optic cable, the first such connection between Timor Leste and Australia. And we continue to support Timor Leste's ASEAN membership aspirations and its path to accession to the World Trade Organisation. We will continue to work with Timor Leste. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. It's great work that you're doing there. How does this agreement complement the Albanese Labor government's approach to strengthening our relationships across the region? Minister. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, President. Well, the, the government is looking to rebuild and strengthen our relationships in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and as um, senators uh, may be aware, we, we've obviously uh, across government, but from my, whether it's the Prime Minister, myself, or the uh, other ministers, both cabinet and within the portfolio, we are actively engaging in the region. Uh, you know, what we hear from other nations in the region, from friends and partners, uh, is the value of genuine engagement, of respect, of listening, uh, and most importantly, that we want to engage in a region that recognises that we are, our futures are shared. Uh, these are challenging times in the world. Uh, we all understand that, but it's best that we navigate these challenges together, stronger together with our friends and our partners in the region. Uh, the region does value partnership, uh, and that is the approach that this government will continue Thank to take. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is for Minister representing the Assistant Treasurer, Minister Gallagher. APRA's review of Superfund marketing expenditure found 12 funds spent $87 million on marketing between 2018 and 2020. Funds have a legal duty to spend members' money in a way that financially benefits the members. The regulator found funds had a lack of evidence that this spending can be justified. But instead of cleaning up this apparent waste of money, your government is cutting back on transparency over how this spending gets disclosed. Why are you making it easier for funds to spend the retirement savings of everyday Australians on billboards and TV ads promoting themselves when the regulator quite clearly says this money isn't delivering benefits to members? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Lambie for the question. Labor is committed to delivering accountability, transparency and good governance in every part of our financial system. Our world-class superannuation system is a massive success story, delivering $3.4 trillion in national savings and better retirement outcomes for Australians. Um, the, I think Senator Lambie is referring to the regulations that will come before this Senate around some changes uh, that were being made to streamline disclosure requirements for superannuation funds. Uh, and aligning those with the national accounting standards. Um, the new regulations will still require superannuation funds to disclose, um, in particular I th in relation to any political donations, and they will ensure that the new regulations will have a high level of meaningful transparency for superannuation uh, members. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. 
Um, thank you, Madam Pres President. This supplementary question is actually really simple. Under your draft and your members' meeting regulations, will it be easier or harder for members to identify specific payments their fund has made on advertising to industrial bodies and related parties? We just want to know, will it be easier or harder? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Well, um, I think the issue around the annual members' meetings is around um, uh, informing, you know, around process of holding those meetings. So the idea is that members are able to ask or to ask for further information through those mechanisms. So I would say that they are still able, they are still able to uh, ask for that. Inf they, well, if they're, well, they're if they're interested in that, then they will know they they want to ask about it. Uh, and then they can ask for it through that process and have the information provided. Uh, Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Okay, I was going to do a point of order. Okay, uh, the assistant minister has previously said these regulations need changing because the compliance costs for funds are too high. I just don't get it. Funds have to keep track of all their expenses and report the big number they add up to. So here's my question: How much extra would it cost exactly? For funds to tell people what numbers they added up to get to their final figure. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Well, if there are further information to provide to Senator Lambie, I will come back. Uh, I don't have a figure in front of me, but I do understand uh, that there that there um, is a view that aligning some of the requirements or or reducing red tape around these, but still allowing uh, requisite information that members will be after. Uh, is behind uh, the regulations that the uh, minister uh, has made. Um, I should say that the regulations still uh, do require a level of information uh, to be provided through these annual members' meetings. I see, and the government sees no reason why I think it's any reduced transparency for members, but allows streamlined reporting in line with some of the other arrangements, including the Australian accounting standards. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Carr. Carr sorry. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the Government's Code of Conduct for Ministers, Clause 3.11, Shareholding States. I quote, in recognition of the collective responsibility that ministers bear in relation to Cabinet decisions, this code requires that ministers divest themselves of investments and other interests in any public or private company or business other than public superannuation funds or publicly listed managed funds or trust arrangements where, Roman II, the fund or trust does not invest to any significant extent in a business sector that could give rise to a conflict of interest with the minister's public duty. What is the definition of significant extent? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, thank you to uh, thank you, President. Thank you to thank you to the senator for the question. And he refers to a provision uh, in the code, which, as I said yesterday, uh, does not um, uh, did not exist under the government in which he he was a member. Um, I mean, it is. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Carr. Point of uh, point of order relevance. I asked a question specifically in relation to the ministerial code of conduct currently in place. There should be no need to refer to historical documents. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. The minister has just uh, begun her response. Uh, I believe she is being relevant for the short time she's been on her feet, and I'll continue to listen. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, and obviously, uh, any legal phrase uh, can be uh, is subject to you know, interpretation, but I think the intent is very clear. The intent is clear. This is because, unlike those opposite, we, we recognise the potential and, frankly, um, at times inherent conflict of interest in ministers in a cabinet making decisions which, um, uh, whilst owning shares. Uh, so we have set a, a higher standard, uh, and I appreciate um, that. Uh, the opposition want to, to probe the, 
uh, the merits of that. We do think it's appropriate. Uh, it's in recognition of the collective responsibility that uh, members of cabinet or members of the executive bear in relation to, th to decisions. And uh, unlike uh, what has gone before for the last decades, we, you know, it was the prime minister's view, uh, shared by uh, his cabinet, that it is important that divestment is the way in which. Um, these matters are ultimately resolved in, and, and as you would have seen in the media, and I know the opposition have asked questions about this, uh, that is what is taking place. Senator Scar, first supplementary. We'll add that to net zero. In question time yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Hume, Senator Wong said, it is the Prime Minister's expectation that ministers do comply with the code. He, he is the Prime Minister, made that clear both privately and publicly. On what occasions has the Prime Minister privately made his expectations clear to each of Minister Shorten and McBain and Assistant Ministers Ayres and Kearney? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, thank you. I, I am <laughs> I'm certainly not going to go into every discussion the Prime Minister has, and nor would you would, no, no, nor would you expect me to. My, my, my remarks went to the standard that is, respect, is, has, is being expected. And I would say to you, questions have been asked in relation to a number of the ministers to which you refer uh, in the House in this week, and have, they have been appropriately answered. Now, I know that doesn't satisfy your thirst for some political hits, but they have been appropriately answered in the House. And I again say, Australians will look at you asking these questions, recognising that you never set such a standard for yourselves. You never set such a standard for yourselves. And we saw over the nine years in your government the number of ministers who did have shares in companies which may have been affected uh, by decisions of the federal cabinet. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Thank you, President. I think it uh, is more pertinent, pertinent to ask whether or not it satisfied the code of conduct as opposed to me. Minister, has the Prime Minister requested you or had any discussions with you about ministers or assistant ministers who have breached or may be in breach of the ministerial code of conduct? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, no. Uh, and what the Prime Minister has said publicly uh, reflects his private position, which is his expectations are that all of us comply with the ministerial code of conduct. Uh, Senator Babette. My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Can the minister name one country in the world where a higher share of solar and wind power has led to lower electricity prices? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Well, uh, I'd make the point. Uh, thank you to um, the senator for the question, uh, and I, I would say to him that uh, it is not a a highly contested position uh, by most who look at the energy market in Australia that the cheapest new form of generation is clean energy. Uh, and in fact, there is a, a live market experiment for that, and that is the state of the electricity market the, today. Uh, we, we, we have four, four gigawatts exiting, uh, uh, one coming in during the, the life of the previous government. I, I think those, those are the figures I, I recall. Uh, Senator, Senator McAllister will tell me if I'm wrong, uh, which reflects the lack of certainty in the market uh, um, and the lack of certainty as a consequence of the, the, those opposites' failure to deal with their internal divisions as they do today. Um, Minister. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam President. Just a point of order on relevance. Uh, uh, this is becoming a pattern. Uh, from um, uh, Senator, Senator Canavan. Wong. I don't well, need well, the statement. Is, well, my, my, what my is point your of point? Order, my point of order on relevance uh, is the question was clearly about whether a country in the world has experienced lower prices, yet Minister Wong, uh, as uh, I say, in pattern, is going back I to talk about the previous government's record. Thank Nothing you, to Senator do with the question. Sa Canavan, please resume your seat. Uh, I do believe the minister is being relevant. It is a broad topic, and uh, she is within the realm of the question, Minister. Uh, 
Uh, look, um, Senator Babbitt, I'm happy to look at, uh, ask the minister I'm representing if there are examples around the world of what we also see in Australia, which is that renewable energy is the cheapest form of new generation capacity. I, I don't think that's a, uh, that, that is an unremarkable proposition, a proposition that is shared by uh, uh, those who you know, manage our electricity system as well as the business community. Uh, so, I, ask, I respect that you know, Senator Canavan is you know, uh, very clear in his interjections about his views on this issue. It, they're not shared, uh, as I understand it, by the remainder of the coalition. Uh, but uh, we see, uh, as do business, benefit to Australian consumers from certainty that enables the investment in renewable energy in order to ensure we have a system which is, has greater supply uh, and relative, relatively lower prices. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, um, President. Um, the, the Minister has just referred to renewables as the cheapest form of energy just now. Now, in June this year, the Australian energy market operator found that on a per capita basis in 2018-2019, Australia added four to five times the solar and wind generation of any of the European Union, the USA, Japan or China. Now, if Australia is installing more of the so-called cheapest oh, forms sorry, of power— Sorry, Senator Babette, your time has expired. <laughs> um, Minister. Well, I, I, I'll try and do my best. I'm not sure where you got to in the end of the question, uh, but I, I think I, I think I understand um, the the gravamen of the question. And if I don't, I'm sure the senator can follow it up with a supplementary. Uh, but the proposition that we can simply stay with our ex uh, uh, the old coal-fired power uh, electricity generation and that's going to give us cheaper energy is just no longer the case. And you know how we know that? Because no private sector entity wanted to invest in new, in new coal-fired power. Well, private sector. I know Matt did. Senator Canavan did. But, <laughs> but, but my point is the market showed us. Now, now Senator Babette, I, I, I do recall in your first speech talking about the benefits of the free market. And what I'd say to you is the free market has spoken on this. The free market has spoken on this. And it hasn't gone down the path Senator Canavan wanted. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Order. Order. <laughs> Order. Senator Babette has. Thank you, Senator Babette. Last year, the Biden administration banned imports of key solar panel material from Chinese-based Hoshine Silicon Industry Co. because they were involved with the forced labour of Uyghurs in China. Will the government take similar action to restrict the importation of solar panels made from forced labour from the CCP? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. That, and that is a very good question, Senator Babette, and one, one that I, about which I am deeply concerned, as is everyone on this side. And that is why we went to the last election with a position to strengthen the Modern Slavery Act and regulation within our economy. Because whether it's from Xinjiang, as the, as the, the Senator has referenced, or elsewhere in the world, uh, and you know from the work that Walk Free and others have done that forced labour, which we regard in our heads as something of the past, is something of the present. Uh, and we should do what the, those opposite failed to do in government, in fact voted against, uh, provisions to strengthen the Modern Slavery Act here in Australia. We should be, uh, we should be clear about ensuring that we require companies to be uh, far more careful in assuring, assuring their supply chains uh, and that we do not allow uh, our purchases uh, unknowingly uh, to condone uh, forced labour anywhere in the world. Thank you, Minister. Senator Still. Yes, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Uh, how is the government working to improve Australia's resilience, response and recovery ahead of the 2022-23 high-risk weather season? Minister. 
And thank you, Senator Verstel, uh, who I know has been very interested in this topic in WA, Cyclone Saroja and other events as well. Uh, in recent years, we've seen the increasing impacts of climate change on our communities and our environment. From the most savage bushfires our country has ever seen to some of the most devastating floods on record. As our climate changes and natural disasters become more common, the way in which we manage our emergency response needs to change as well. Unlike those opposite, we are committed to acting on climate change, both through reducing our emissions and by supporting those communities most impacted by the effects of climate change. The bill we've just passed today is an important part of reducing those emissions and better preparing for future disasters also protects communities as well. As a country and as a government, we need to be better prepared and we need to respond more quickly to natural disasters. Unfortunately, when those opposite were in power, they did neither and that left Australians exposed. If we are asking Australians to be better prepared for natural disasters, then our government needs to do the same thing. And that's why last week I formally launched the National Emergency Management Agency, or NEMA, bringing together the capabilities of Emergency Management Australia and the National Recovery and Resilience Agency into a single agency. NEMA will bring together the capabilities of both agencies to provide support, prepare for the future disasters, lead the response when disaster strikes and remain deeply connected with communities during recovery. It simply made no sense to have two separate disaster agencies in two different departments reporting to two different ministers, which was the situation we had under the former government. Bringing these agencies together as one, NEMA, will provide better coordination at a national level and ensure that we are better prepared for natural disasters and respond more quickly. Good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst, and now NEMA will be a big part of that. NEMA will work side by side with state, territory and local governments Thank you, Minister. from beginning Your time to has end. Expired. Senator Stirl, first supplementary. As the Senate, what concrete steps the Albanese government is taking to prepare communities for future natural disasters? Minister. Thank you again, Senator Stirl. Uh, yesterday in the House of Representatives, the Albanese government introduced amendments to the Disaster Ready Fund legislation. These amendments will ensure that $200 million a year allocated in the fund is spent on disaster mitigation while maintaining our commitment to support communities as they recover from disasters. I think members on both sides of this chamber will remember the comments that I had to make about the former government's emergency response fund. Set up over three years ago with the support of the then opposition, with $4 billion in it, set up to spend money every year on disaster mitigation and disaster recovery. And by the time we got to the election after three years, it hadn't built a single disaster mitigation project and hadn't released a single cent out of disaster for disaster recovery. We're determined to change that, and I'm happy to report that this legislation has been welcomed by stakeholders across the community, from the Insurance Council of Australia and Suncorp to the RACQ and the Local Government Association of Queensland. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Thank you. Well, there is a great focus on floods at the moment. We know that parts of the country will experience bushfire. What is being done to prepare these communities, Minister? Minister. Uh, Senator Stirl and the President are both interested in this because WA, of course, experienced bad bushfires again last year. Uh, I've recently been briefed by the Bureau of Meteorology about what they are forecasting for the upcoming high-risk weather season, and members of parliament and senators were invited to a similar briefing this week as well. It's true that while there is a very high chance of, of a third La Nina this summer, bringing more rain and flooding to the east coast states, and we need to be ready for that, in addition, in central and western Australia, communities are facing increased chances of bushfire. That's why last week I met with AFAC, who coordinate the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, and they have assured me that the resources available to them are appropriate for this season and that preparedness activities are on schedule. And that may well include the redeployment of some aerial firefighting units to the west. Also last week, the new Australian Fire Danger Rating System was launched. This is a once-in-a-generation change to how the sector forecasts and warns about fire danger. Unlike our predecessors, the Albanese government is looking over Thank the horizon, you, ensuring we're better prepared. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Given today's announcement that the Labor government has appointed a working group on The Voice, can the minister advise the Senate if this working group will confirm the membership of The Voice? the selection process for The Voice and powers of The Voice prior to the proposed referendum? Uh, Minister. 
Do you have anything on that? Uh, thank you, President. Um, uh, I think those are matters uh, that the minister will be dealing with. I understand there is a meeting uh, tomorrow, uh, and uh, those matters are firmly within her areas of responsibility. Um, this will be an important group. Um, I heard. Sorry, it is a very important. Well, uh, thank you. I think this is. I think this is a very important group. Uh, dealing with an, an issue um, around uh, constitutional recognition, a, a voice to parliament that um, is one I think that we should all engage in. There is an opportunity here to do something uh, nation building, uh, something inclusive, uh, something that wrongs of, uh, or rights a previous wrong. Uh, and a lot of, and a lot of work thought. needs to be done. This Senate has a role to play in that about listening to different opinions, finding where Senator there is Thorpe. shared agreement to progress this issue that is important to so many Australians, including so many First um, Nations Senator Australians. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Wong. No, I'd ask you to draw Senator Thorpe to order. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I, uh, was, I did not hear any comments you made. Order! But uh, your constant interjections are disorderly, and uh, I would ask you to, Senator Mackenzie. At the time that I'm calling another senator to order for being disorderly, you yourself are disorderly. I would call senators to order and to listen to the answers to the question, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. What I was saying was that this, the referendum working group will be an important part of implementing a First Nations voice uh, to parliament. Uh, we want to progress it in a way that brings people together, understanding that there are different views about how to progress this, uh, but there is an opportunity here to work together <coughs> to do Senator something Thorpe. meaningful and respectful to progress reconciliation and to ensure that we deliver on some of uh, the, uh, well, on all of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in an organised and respectful Your time way. has expired. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary order. Order. Um, Senator Wong, um, order. Order. I would invite those senators who are constantly interjecting to put their hands up to ask questions when it's their opportunity to do so, but your constant interjections are disorderly. And Senator Thorpe, I've called you to order. It's not your chance to debate this. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Can the government outline how free, prior and informed consent will be obtained by Aboriginal Australians during this new group's engagement activities, given the body will form the basis of the Yes campaign for a referendum. Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. And again, I repeat um, the answer I gave to the last question, which is about the referendum working group uh, being an important part of implementing the First Nations uh, voice to parliament. It will assist the government and provide advice to the government. Uh, we have, um, in terms of the referendum working group, we have the Minister Linda Burney working with Senator Pat Dodson on that, uh, with a whole range of other um, highly eminent Australians. Well, I'm, no, I'm not going to argue with that, you on that, Senator Thorpe. They are highly eminent Australians. Yeah. First, first uh, rate Australians on this group. Senators, absolutely. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price. In of order to relevance, um, specific to uh, the question of how free, prior, and informed consent will be obtained. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Nambajinka Price. I do believe uh, the minister is being relevant, and I'll ask her to continue, Minister. Well, my point is that this is the working group will work through a whole range of issues in formulating their advice and, and progressing the implementation of this commitment. That is the job, and that is why it's thank been you, formed. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Nambajinka Price, second supplementary. Can the minister outline how much the new working group on the proposed voice model is costing taxpayers, including the expenditure already allocated to the National Indigenous Australians Agency on developing the model? Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are costs associated with um, progressing uh, the voice uh, to parliament. Um, there was provision made for some of this uh, by the previous government uh, when, or when, they were, when New Lock were in power, so there was some money put aside in the budget. We expect, we, we, will, we expect there will be some additional investments. We see them as investments rather than costs uh, that go to making sure that we do this properly, that we bring people together, that we unite a nation uh, and that we do it properly. Uh, that is why so much work is going in to making sure that the engagement mechanisms and the working Order. group uh, is able to have all of the conversations they need to have to bring people together to make sure that we do this in a way that unites the country rather than divides it. If there are additional costs, they will be Order. in the budget. Uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, and sad, but that's not true. I just have. Uh, I have two. Uh, at the conclusion of question time yesterday, I'm sorry. In question time yesterday, I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senator Hume in my capacity as Minister representing the Prime Minister relating to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. I have written to the Senator to provide additional information, and I table my letter to Senator Hume for the information of all Senators. Can I also indicate, in the course of question time, uh, Senator Payne, or the Leader of the Opposition, advised me that Senator Payne told uh, in fact, visited Timor Leste in August of 2019. Uh, so I correct the record in that answer. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I'd just like to provide answers to the questions I took on notice from Senator Hughes today. Uh, I'm advised that a family with one child earning $60,000 a year currently faces out-of-pocket costs of $2,430 a year. Under Labor's cheaper childcare plan, they will pay only $1,620 out of pocket per year. A family with one child earning $400,000 a year faces current out of pocket costs uh, of $16,000, and under the Albanese government's plan, they will pay about $12,000. Under the government's plan, 96 per cent of Australian families with children in childcare will be better off. This is a cost of living measure with an economic dividend. It will help get women back into the workforce unlocking an army of skilled workers our economy is crying out for. It's good for kids, it's good for families and it's good for the economy. Senator, Senator Patterson and then I'll go to Senator Scar. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt, of the Minister's failure to answer questions on notice 99 and 100, which are now overdue. But in doing so, I acknowledge I only given, gave him about 10 minutes notice of my intention to do so. So I will not be surprised if he doesn't have the answers on him, but I uh, seek his assistance in achieving a timely resolution to these questions. Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. Um, thank you uh, to Senator Patterson for the heads up on this. Uh, I will, of course, seek an explanation from the Minister and uh, respond uh, to the Chamber. Senator Scar. Mr Deputy President, uh, I rise to take note of the answer by Senator Wong to the question which I asked previously today. And in doing so, might I say that I'm absolutely gobsmacked by what is transpiring as we sit here today in the lower house with respect to the uh, investments and the disclosures made by the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus MP. It is absolutely extraordinary what is what is what is happening in terms of this issue in the lower house. And there was, in history, a famous affair called the Dreyfus Affair, going back in history, in relation to Captain Dreyfus, who was wrongly accused of doing the wrong thing back in the time of the, about the turn of the century, early 20th century. But it will be very interesting to see 
it will be very interesting to see where this, how this unravels. Because what we're finding out, what we're finding out is that the Attorney General appears through his self-managed super fund to have held a material interest or have held an interest in a, a managed fund called Greenscape, which holds just over 9 per cent of the shares, 9 per cent of the shares, or about $100 million worth in a, in a company known as Omni Bridgeway, which provides class action litigation funding. This is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. The Attorney General. And I asked a question of Senator Wong in relation to the definition of the Ministerial Code of Conduct, where it clearly says, clearly says that the fund or trust must not invest to any significant extent in a business sector that could give rise to a conflict of interest with the minister's public duty. So the Attorney General is not permitted under the Ministerial Code of Conduct to have an interest in a fund which invests in an entity which has a material potential conflict with the discharge of his duties. And here we have the Attorney General of the country, through his self-managed super fund, has an investment in a fund called Green Cake, which actually has, which actually has a material interest in a class action litigation funder. This wow. is extraordinary stuff. This is extraordinary stuff. This could be the end of this Attorney General. It is extraordinary. And I say this as someone in a previous life was a company secretary and used to have responsibility of oversight of the company's share trading policy. And I can tell you, in terms of interpreting significant extent, from a, from a, general, a general application in the corporation's world, an interest of 5 per cent is con considered material. 5 per cent is considered material. And in fact, any increase over 5 per cent in, in increments of 1 per cent has to be released to an Australian stock exchange in an announcement. And in fact, in fact, it's considered a substantial shareholding. So here we have a situation where the Federal Attorney General, through a self-managed superannuation fund, has an interest in a fund which owns 9 per cent of a litigation funder. This is extraordinary. This is extraordinary. I don't see how he gets a way out of this. I don't see a way through this for the Attorney General. On a plain reading of the Ministerial Code of Conduct, he's in breach, clear breach. And this is not de minimis. This isn't a few hundred bucks, a little one per cent here or there. This is an interest in his self managed super fund, which holds an interest in a fund that holds nine per cent of a litigation funder, the Attorney General. You don't get away from that. You don't get away from that. And of all the ministers, of all the ministers, I can excuse to some extent Assistant Minister Ayres, but for the Attorney General, the Attorney General to actually have such a have, have it appears on the face of it, and I'm looking at the article from the Age newspaper, James Masola, 8 September 2022, 2:42 p.m. This is extraordinary. The Dreyfus affair. This will be known as the Dreyfus affair, and just as Captain Dreyfus ended up on the literal Devil's Island in French Guinea, I, I suspect that the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus is going to end up in the Devil's Island of the Ministerial Code of Conduct. You don't, get, you don't come back from this. You don't come back from this. This is a material interest. This is a significant interest. That's what the code says. Senator Wong said it's all about intention. It's all about intention. Yes, it is. It is. And I expect the Attorney General, the first law officer in this nation to actually discharge his responsibilities and understand the significance. Nine per cent? He owns an interest in a fund that owns nine per cent in a litigation funder. Absolutely extraordinary. The Dreyfus Affair, 2022. Senator Pratt. Mr Acting Deputy President, in question time today where we hear from Senator Scar these remarks about our Attorney General when his own government set practically no standard at all, not only in terms of ministerial accountability. Senator. Well, no, I, I'm quite happy. I, I don't want to be interjected on while I'm making my remarks through you, uh, Mr. President. We have uh, 
looked at the, uh, this debate, these questions that have been asked of Mr Dreyfus, he has, been, uh, uh, he has disclosed in his uh, uh, Senate uh, members' interests everything that is required of him. On the other hand, we have seen countless episodes from members in the Liberal Party where we've been unable even, even to have a public debate about the nature of a conflict of interest because they have squirrelled and hidden away their interests and their vested interests. Mark Dreyfus, our Attorney General, has done has been absolutely clear and transparent about his interests, and he has said very clearly that he expects uh, to have uh, to divest those interests if, if uh, it should be satisfied that there is a perception of a conflict of interest according to the requirements of the code. This high standard that the Attorney General has set and that this government has set is not a standard that those opposite were ever prepared to hold themselves to. There is not even a provision in the code of the previous government that would see someone divesting themselves of the shares in the code uh, because of any perceived conflict of interest. We've seen this over and over again. Those opposite have had inherent conflicts of interest as ministers in the cabinet making decisions whilst owning shares. We have set a high standard, and there's nothing wrong with probing the merits of that here in question time. That's fine. That's appropriate. But we have a collective responsibility in this place, be we uh, senators, members of uh, the executive or not, to bear in mind uh, what has gone on for decades before. We are pursuing, uh, under the Prime Minister, a divestment process where these matters are ultimately asked about, and that is indeed what is taking place. Those opposite never held themselves to account in such a way. Senator Wong, in responding to those uh, questions, was very clear in what she said. The minister outlined that those questions have been asked about a number of ministers uh, in the House this week and that they have been indeed appropriately answered based on the accountability uh, of the ministerial standards. I liked Senator Wong's uh, uh, colour and flavour in her answer where our leader said, that doesn't uh, satisfy your thirst for some political schutzpah, that we should have such straightforward, clear, transparent processes. It's all very well for those opposite to seek to try and get some political mileage out of this when they have never ever sought to set a decent standard at all. You know, to that end, under the last government, we did not ever see a national anti-corruption commission that could also have oversight as such matters. We are very clear and positive in our duty to introduce legislation to establish a powerful, transparent an independent National Anti-Corruption Commission in the next session of Parliament. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Smith. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much, Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt would like to use 100 days or 100 days plus since the federal election to talk about the last 10 years. 
but let me make this statement. There is no virtue in raising ministerial standards, raising the bar of ministerial standards, if you're only going to lower the bar on compliance. And that is exactly what's happened. We have had a situation where the Labor Party, in seeking government, made much of the virtue of lifting standards of integrity in our country. I agree with that. Standards of integrity in our parliament and in our country need to be lifted. And indeed, I'm on the public record as supporting a federal integrity commission, and I'll look with great interest when the government delivers its, its bill. But the Labor Party made much virtue of coming to government wanting to raise the integrity standards. Indeed, in the Ministerial Code of Conduct, which contains Anthony Albanese's signature, he says, Australians deserve good government. The Albanese government is committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, hold that thought, including assistant ministers, will observe standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. That's what the Prime Minister not just said, but signed off on in the Ministerial Code of Conduct. <coughs> Labor is confused about integrity. It says we're committed to integrity because we're going to have a National Integrity Commission. But in the first hundred days, it seeks to abolish the mechanism for establishing in integrity on our construction work sites. It says we're going to abolish the construction industry watchdog. Then it says it's going to remove measures of transparency introduced by the coalition over the superannuation industry. On one day they want to be committed to integrity, but on the following days they do, by their actions, remove mechanisms of integrity in our country. Wow! And then we've had three parliamentary sitting weeks, just three parliamentary sitting weeks, and we now have five ministers, five ministers, including assistant ministers, who are now in breach of a ministerial code signed by the Prime Minister himself. We are seeing a Congo line of Labor ministers in breach of the ministerial standards. In this place, Senator Ayres, the Assistant Minister for Trade. In the other place, Mr Milshorten, the Minister for Government Services and the National in Disability Insurance Scheme. We've heard comments in regards to the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care. Add to that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Just three weeks of sittings and already one plus two plus three plus four five ministers, five members of the executive government. Add to that as Senator Add to that Senator Scar's contribution on the latest development in just the last 45 minutes in regards to the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus. Labor said at the election that it would make permanent and much needed changes to standards of integrity and accountability in government. Labor said it would have the lowest tolerance, the lowest tolerance for poor integrity standards in government. Judge Labor, not on what they said, but on now what they do. Some senators in this place have tried to make a virtue of the fact that Mr Albanese, in his ministerial code of conduct, has said, we're going to do better. We're going to do better. Well, the measure of integrity is not what you're going to do, but the standard in which you apply to those new measures. Mr Albanese, as the new Prime Minister, would do well to learn the lessons of past leaders in our country. And we would hope our great ambition is that in every day, every week, every year, the standards of integrity in our parliament, in our community are lifted. But these breaches of the ministerial code are a dangerous precedent and they deserve a stronger response from the Prime Minister. Senator Polly. 
Yes, thank you. Look, it never ceases to amaze me that senators from the opposition can come in and try and lecture the new Labor government about integrity. The, for, the uh, former speaker talked about learning from past leaders. Well, I can say one thing for sure, that those people on this side and the Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, will not take any lessons from Scott Morrison, from Malcolm Turnbull or Tony Abbott. We have set a very high standard when it comes to ministerial code of conduct. We also have set out our plan to the Australian people when it comes to legislating a national anti-corruption commission. We will deliver on that. But let's not forget that the integrity of a government doesn't just lie with a ministerial code of conduct. Let's not forget the waste and rorts, and that's clearly what they were. They were rorts by the former government. So the hypocrisy of those on that side to come into this chamber and try and sing their virtues of we did nothing wrong. Let's also talk about the dishonesty that they continue to perpetuate in this place in relation to the trillion dollar debt that they have left. This hasn't been left just to the Australian government, the Albanese Labor government. This is a debt that has been bestowed on the Australian people. And to come into this chamber, as they do, and trying to say this was all about the pandemic is quite wrong. It is, in fact, a lie. A lie. Let's also not forget the $20 billion in JobKeeper money that was paid to companies who profited. profited. Let's not forget about the integrity and the lack of honesty of those when they were in government in relation to the billions of dollars that were spent on the French submarines. But there were no subs. No subs. But what they did deliver was a blow to the French government and the relationships between the two countries, which, again, because of our government's integrity, because of the leadership of the Prime Minister, we have gone about renewing and restoring that relationship. Let's also not forget, because I think this is, this is one that will stay in the Australian psyche for such a long, long time, and that is the $660 million car park rorts. Car park rorts. They were going to build these car parks where there was no trains. Now, if you want to come in here and lecture us about integrity and, and standards, then those people in glass houses should not, should not throw stones. And let's also go back to the, what was it? A hundred million dollar sports rorts. Sports rorts. And these are the same people that come into this chamber, as they did today in question time, and, and the contributions, and I, I know there'll be a further contribution from those on the other side. But let's get real here. Do you really think that the Australian people are going to put their faith in what you say in terms of the standards that your government set and that they would want to measure ours against those? because they will not. They will not. Now, I know it takes a little while to get used to opposition, and we're not very happy because today we've passed climate change, another election uh, commitment that we took to the federal election, and so they're all a bit sore and a bit, na bit narky today, and I guess it's been a, another long week, and uh, the former senator respond, uh, reminded us we've only um, had three weeks of sitting. Well, the reality is the Albanese Labor government is setting a standard, a very high standard, and one that we will work with to make sure that our standards are upheld. But our standard is so much higher than anything that uh, 
you did when you were in government, and even that very low standard that you had was never, ever met. Thank you. Senator Van. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Wow. We just heard uh, about okay. this side of politics uh, being Solid. depressed Solid. after uh, losing an election. Now, we all know parties lose elections from time to time. When I first came into this place in 2019, what we saw on the other side was, uh, how did uh, Senator Cormann put it, the seven stages of grief being displayed each and every day. Now, what you can't say about this side of the chamber is our tails are up. We're positive. We're fighting. We're holding the, the, this government to account every time, every day. And if we had more sitting days, you'd be seeing more being held to account than possible. And today, when people ask why we need to hold them to account, well, we just learned of our fifth example today. We just took, learned of our fifth example today of the Attorney General, Mr. Dreyfus. Wow, the leading law officer of the land can't even get right understanding what significant extent means in the ministerial code. Now, maybe it's okay for a foreign minister not to know what significant extent means. Maybe it's okay for uh, Senator Ayres not to know what it means. You know, he is just the assistant minister for trade. But for the Attorney General not to know what the term significant, significant extent means, well, well it, it would. It would go down in writing and it is you know, codified in very many places in law. In law. So you'd think that our primary, our number one legal officer in the land would have some extent, uh, uh, knowing some idea of what significant extent means. It's talking about materiality. It's not talking about oh, a little bit there or a little bit there. It has an actual meaning. And that meaning is written in the ministerial code that the Prime Minister himself has signed, as my good friend Senator Smith has shown us today. You know, the other side keep on talking about integrity. But talk is cheap, and we're seeing that daily from this government, that they want to talk about integrity, they want to talk about parliament being a better place, they want to talk about it more family friendly. Yet, you know, last night we saw, with the uh, help of the Greens, you know, they guillotined debate. The Greens even guillotined their own disallowance motion. They just got, got rid of their own disallowance motion. Like, Really, this is what this is what's been to, you know, shown as transparency and a better parliament. I don't think so. Even the comments to my, my good friend Senator Hughes today in question time shows that the way this government is acting towards people, particularly women in parliament, shows no respect. So there's no respect for parliament. There's no respect even for their own code of conduct. This is just an, an incredible show of hubris. You know, that they can come in here and they'll talk about you know, this code and transparency and integrity, and apparently we're going to see uh, an integrity commission come before the, the parliament sometime soon. Well, do we know when? Yes, we don't know when. You know, they signed a, uh, an agreement with Timo Lester yesterday. Now, I tried to get a copy of that um, that cooperative defence agreement, it's not available. So there is no transparency from this government. You know, let alone what's happening with their, uh, their ministerial code of conduct, which seems to be, I think, as they what do they say in the Pirates of the Caribbean, more of a, uh, a, a, a something you lean to rather than something to be observed in the obvious. So we're not going to take lectures from those on that side about what, what is an integrity. We will look at what, not what they say, we will look at what they do, and we will ask them to be transparent, and we'll demand that they're transparent, and we'll hold them to account in question time, in take note, and in a few short weeks in Senate estimates. The Senate estimates, I might say, has been cut down a budget estimates, which has been cut down from the normal two weeks or eight days to uh, five days or six days. 
Like they're, they're not even going to allow us to hold them to account during Senate estimates. Now, I'm just waiting for them to cut the hours of Senate estimates as well to be a little bit more family friendly. But it won't be transparent and won't be. Thank you, Senator integrity. Van. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I uh, move that the Senate take note of the response uh, to my question from Senator Gallagher. Now, yesterday, the ABS released the national accounts, and the national accounts showed that profits share of national income hit a new record high, and that wages share of national income hit a new record low. These, Acting Deputy President, are astonishing statistics. In the more than 60 years since records have been kept, never have businesses been getting a bigger slice of the pie and never have workers been getting a smaller slice of the pie. Workers are back, in terms of their share of national income, to where they were 60 years ago. 60 years and no progress. And what did the RBA governor have to say about this astonishing statistic in a speech he gave today? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, the word profit wasn't even mentioned once. Instead, what Dr Lowe did is do what he's been doing so well this year, and that is running cover for corporate Australia. Here's what he said today. I'll quote from his speech. Business people are able to stand in the public square and say they're putting their prices up, and they can point to a number of reasons why. The community doesn't like it, but there is begrudging acceptance. And with prices rising, it is harder to resist bigger wage increases, especially in a tight labour market. Now, this is truly gobsmacking stuff from Dr Lowe. You've got corporate profits at record highs, you've got wages at record lows, and yet Dr Lowe is making up excuses for businesses to put up prices. Just another high priest of neoliberal economics, as my colleague Senator, Jordan, uh, Senator Steele John says. And uh, Dr Lowe is at the same time selling the fantasy of wage increases coming down the line. Well, I wish he was right, but I don't expect that he is. He's blabbing on about the RBA's business liaison program, and he's ignoring the fact that, that wage rises are a fantasy in part because Dr Lowe himself spends a fair bit of his time jawboning down wages. In July this year, he told workers they need to anchor their wage increase expectations at 3.5 per cent, while at the same time saying inflation was going to be higher. Well, real wages are where they were 10 years ago in this country, and you've got the RBA governor out there making the case for real wages to go even further backwards. This is truly Alice in Wonderland stuff. It's hard to make sense of at times, but I did see one distillation of the situation that I thought had significant merit. It was a tweet from uh, Mr David Taylor, who is uh, a reporter with the ABC's program The Drum. And Mr Taylor tweeted this out after Dr Lowe's speech. How did we get to the point where it's okay for the RBA governor to, one, to warn publicly against rising wage growth without mentioning record profits? We know profits are contributing to the vast bulk of inflation. Real wages are going backwards. I just don't get it, said uh, Mr Taylor. Well, Mr Taylor, I just don't get it either. I don't get it either. And you know who else I reckon doesn't get it? That's the vast majority of the Australian people whose purchasing power is going backwards, and yet they just got smashed by a 50 basis points interest rate rise from the Reserve Bank, smashing mortgage holders, smashing renters, smashing small business owners, to try and uh, allegedly get on top 
of inflation, which is actually not domestically being driven by wages. It's being driven by corporate profits. And I asked the minister today to acknowledge, and this is not for the first time, I might add, that I've asked the minister today to acknowledge the role corporate profiteering and price gouging is playing in driving inflation, and yet again the minister would not in her response acknowledge the role that corporate, corporate profits are playing in driving inflation. We need truth, we need accountability in the system, and we're not getting it. To put the question, those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. I call on the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Uh, before I call the government whip, I'm just going to, in my capacity as chair of the procedure committee, uh, move a motion to adopt the report. Honourable Senators, I present the Procedure Committee's second report of 2022, and I move that the Senate adopt the recommendation of paragraph 1.10 of the report with effect from the first sitting day in October 2022. The Procedure Committee has considered a proposal from the government to vary the Senate's hours of meeting and routine of business. The proposal responds in part to a recommendation of the Jenkins Review that the Houses review this sometimes long and irregular hours to strike a better balance between wellbeing and parliamentary business. The committee agreed that significant improvements could be made in the Senate by adjourning earlier on Monday nights and providing additional times when business will proceed on a no divisions basis. These changes reduce the need for senators and staff to attend into the evening unless they are directly involved in the matters being debated. The committee also agreed that sitting should start at 9am on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Private senators' bills will be dealt with on those mornings, with Monday mornings reverting to government business time. The committee also recommends procedural changes for matters of public importance and urgency motions, so that two such matters may be dealt with each day for 30 minutes each and that these be rostered by informal agreement between party whips and others, rather than being subject to a daily ballot. The motion I have moved would make the relevant amendments to the Senate standing orders effective from October sittings. I commend the report to the Senate. I intend to put the motion. I put, I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I table the report. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates. Uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 3 of 2022. And on behalf of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Provisions of the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and a related bill together with accompanying documents. Thank you. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages 5 and 6 of the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senator, I'll go to Senator Urquhart and then uh, I'll go to Senator Cadell, but I know that you're seeking the call, Senator Stilljohn. Thank, thank you, um, Mr Deputy President. Um, I take note of document 1, 3 and 5 on page 5 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Would you like me to keep going through what, uh, the package that I've got and then Yes, do and then we'll... Okay. Um, on page 6, I take note of document 12 and seek leave to continue my remarks. On page 7, under Committee Reports and Government Responses, I take note of documents 4, 5, 7, 1 and, uh, sorry, and 7 and take note, uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. And on page 7, under Auditor General's Reports, um, I take note of doc, uh, report number 1 and 4 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted to all those requests? Leave is granted. Is it, is it Senator Rustin? Yes. Um, I wish to speak on committee report number seven, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Cool. Is that fine? Yeah, you may. 
Yep. 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 Okay. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Um, today I want to inform the Senate of an extraordinarily inspiring event I was privileged to be part of this morning. This morning, seven-year-old Jeremy Carr from North Brighton in South Australia addressed the power of speech breakfast here in Parliament House. He told us that he loved skateboarding and BMX. He plays soccer. He loves baking zucchini muffins. He wants to be a car designer when he grows up, but preferably for Lamborghini. He did so for five minutes with no notes. For any seven-year-old, this is a pretty extraordinary accomplishment. But given that Jeremy was born with bilaterally and profoundly deaf, makes his story one of the most extraordinary stories of courage and immense inspiration. He won the Prime Minister's Award for courage for his outstanding speech. But Jeremy was also joined by a number of other young people uh, who were very inspiring in their own stories. Matthias Burnt from New Zealand, he was an incredibly articulate young eight-year-old. Twins Evie and Lilla Harmsworth from Western Australia, who in entertained the audience with a double act of comedy, was absolutely entertaining. Audrey Hawkes, a bubbly, bubbly young lady uh, from Queensland who wants to be a singer. Harper Rollinson from New South Wales, who lost her hearing as a result of treatment for cancer, who certainly hasn't lost her sense of humour. And Abigail Longathan from the Northern Territory, a cheeky and talented eight-year-old. The stories that these kids told us were absolutely inspiring to hear. They're real-life examples of the ways that good policy and focused investments can allow people to better connect with the full scope of life's opportunities and interests. That's because all of these children are cochlear, cochlear implant recipients. The children uh, spoke at the Power of Speech breakfast here in, in Canberra, was hosted by First Voice and sponsored by Cochlear. It celebrates the remarkable outcomes for cochlear implant recipients. The event was emceed by Rosie Gallen, herself a beneficiary of cochlear implants. But a really big shout out to First Voice and its chair, Jim Hungerford, for your long-standing commitment to improving and enriching the lives of children who are deaf or are hearing impaired. Your strong advocacy, your leadership, your role in informing meaningful public debate and health policy has changed the lives of so many young Australian children. Can I also extend the same gratitude to Cochlear for your work as a global leader in hearing solutions, having provided over 600,000 implantable devices, helping people of all ages live full and active lives? And thanks to Cochlear, the lives of children with hearing impairment is a world of possibility, not one of limitation as it used to be. But a message from the kids to Cochlear? They really want the new and improved version of the implants to be waterproof because they really love swimming. So if you could just do that, you'd make it absolutely perfect. But I have to say, that was the only thing that, that the kids were asking for. Their lives have been changed. They acknowledge it and they were so happy for the experience that they now have to be able to hear like other kids. So it's the role of governments to invest in medical research supporting early intervention to ensure those born with hearing impairments can get the best out of life. I strongly believe in the importance of looking to people's ability rather than disability, and these children should be our inspiration in ensuring we support Australians through our investment in the NDIS and how we ensure its viability into the future. Thank you to Jeremy and all the other kids for inspiring us to keep focused on that goal. Senator Cadell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise and uh, take note and seek leave to continue the remarks on uh, page eight, six under documents, items 9, 10 and 11, and on page seven under committee reports and government responses, item six. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Chair. I um, take note of documents number one, uh, number three and number seven. Uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Shoebridge, I think you're seeking the call. I am. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I, I seek to speak to item two in committee reports and government responses, 
the Intelligence and Security Joint Statutory Committee Interim Report, Extremist Movements and Radicalism in Australia Government Response. Um, the government has responded to the recommendation that the Parliamentary Joint Committee um, on, on Intelligence and Security uh, uh, refer for inquiry or consider for inquiry um, uh, an inquiry into extremist movements and radicalisation in Australia. Um, the, the growth in particular of right-wing radical extremism in Australia has been a matter of very real concern, um, I know, to my party and to many people in the community that we speak to. Um, it is particularly troubling, though, that this inquiry will be done under the cloak of secrecy of this committee without the broad uh, representation that is necessary to deal with the threats of extremism. This will, of course, go to the club that is the point the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the club that's been established between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, the club that has uh, fed, a, a fed the, the, the beast that is the growing surveillance state, the growing uh, security laws, the increased resourcing and empowering of uh, security and intelligence agencies in this state. But of course, that growing uh, body of laws and agencies, uh, budgets and staff that are there apparently and purportedly to keep us safe uh, have been conspicuously failing to, to, to deal with the growth in right-wing extremism. Uh, we have seen um, repeated calls uh, from across the community for some of the most offensive right-wing extremist organisations to be dealt with as terrorist organisations, as they have been in other comparable countries. Mm. But this inexplicable refusal of the previous government or this government to step up and do the same. And what do we know from this very brief interim report into extremist movements and radicalism in Australia? Well, we know that the in the last, and this is from the Director General of Security, that in the last, in the, in the two most recent annual threat assessments, um, and in fact as recently as March of last year, the Director General stated, in addition to the enduring threat from religiously motivated violent extremists, is a growing assortment of individuals with ideological grievances, so-called right-wing extremism, and I stop there to ask why is it so-called? It just is right-wing extremism. It's not so-called right-wing extremism. It is right-wing extremism. But anyhow, to continue, so-called right-wing extremism has been in ASIO sites for many years. And last year I called out what we've been seeing. Well, again, I'm just going to stop here. It may have been in ASIO sites, but there's no evidence that having viewed it, ASIO has taken just the steps appropriate to deal with it. Or if they have, they haven't persuaded the government to take adequate responses in, 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 in um, having observed it. But I, I go back to the Director General, who said, since then, ideological extremism investigations have grown from around one third of our priority counterterrorism caseload to around 40 per cent. This reflects a growing international trend, as well as our decision to dedicate more resources to the emerging domestic threat. And then in February 2022, the Director General stated that the most likely terrorist attack scenario in Australia over the next 12 months continues to be a lone actor attack. That, phase, that fact weighs heavily on my mind and the minds of our staff, and then says most of the radicalisation occurs online. Um, uh, Deputy President, um, so it is inexplicable in those circumstances how, given the threats of right-wing extremism, given the appalling attacks we've seen on democracy um, and on civil society by right-wing extremist elements, that whilst Canada and New Zealand have moved and listed the right-wing extremist organisation Proud Boys as a terrorist threat, there's been zero action from the Australian government. Zero action from this government. Indeed, Absolutely. in opposition, in opposition, as I'm sure you will remember, Deputy President, we heard a lot of noise from the then Labor opposition, the then Labor opposition shadow, saying, why isn't the government moving to list these extremist right-wing organisations? Why haven't they taken action? Well, where's the action from this government? 
New Zealand and Canada have listed Proud Boys. We're still waiting. Right-wing extremism is growing. Our security agencies are not addressing it, and this government to date has been silent. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. The question is that the Senate take note of the uh, committee report. Those with the opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, Senator Steele John. Uh, you should take note, Thank I believe, of uh, number four of the Auditor General's report. Yes, indeed. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you, Acting Chair. I, I uh, rise to take note of uh, the Auditor General's report. Um, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout, Department of Health and Aged Care. Well, this report's pretty damning. It's pretty damning of the last lot, isn't it? For folks watching at home who might not have had time to read this, and I, I don't blame you at all if you haven't, I'd like to, to draw the collective attention to a quote from the report's uh, first lot of conclusions. And I'll quote directly here. The initial uh, planning was not timely, with detailed planning uh, with states and territories not uh, completed uh, before the rollout commenced. And health underestimated the complexity of administering in-reach services to aged care and the disability sectors. Further, it being health uh, did not incorporate targets for the rollout into its planning until a later stage. The reality of these missed targets, the underestimations and the untimely planning is 14,214 deaths from or with COVID-19. That is 14,000 people taken far too soon uh, from their families with a virus that could have been stopped had the previous government acted in time, if they had listened uh, to the warning signs given uh, by the disability community, who knew from day one of this pandemic that there was the most mortal danger that we would be left behind by a government that so continually failed to incorporate lived experience into its planning processes. That is 14 thousand people gone. People like the incredible disability advocate and leader John Moxham, whose loss has devastated our community this week. I wanted to take the opportunity to offer my most sincerest condolences to Margaret, to Bruce and to everyone who loved him so dearly. Rest in power, John. It's one of the great regrets of my life so far that I didn't get a chance to know you more than I did or to learn from you more while you were with us than I had the opportunity to. We have lost so many people it is often too hard to think about. And COVID-19 isn't close to being over. How is it that our state and federal governments have gotten so good at ignoring the reality of this deadly situation? Everyone deserves to be able to participate in society safely, comfortably and fully. And the Australian government should be working towards this end. This report and in responding to it this afternoon, sets out in writing what so many in our community already know. This government uh, had no previous plans, previous serious plans, to provide vaccines uh, to those who needed them. The previous government clearly and evidently mismanaged the rollout. They underestimated the entire process, and when uh, we were already in the thick of it, with vaccines available for months, uh, only then did they start to take any kind of decent progress for those who needed uh, these vaccinations the most. I urge this government not to do the same now as we face the continuation of this virus and of long COVID 
and the extensive symptoms and suffering for thousands. And I want to finish by speaking directly to anybody, in fact, to the tens of thousands who I know in the disability community who are immunocompromised, who feel as though the nation, the conversation has left them behind, and is quite happy to see people pass away from COVID-19 as long as the rest of the business community is no longer inconvenienced. I want you to know that the Greens understand that for you this pandemic is not over that COVID-19 is still keeping you within your homes, and I therefore uh, seek leave to continue my remarks next thank, week. Thank you, Senator Stiljohn. And Senator Rennick, you also wish to, to speak on this document. Thank you. I can, Senator yeah, Rennick. I seek uh, to take note of the audit report by the Auditor General into the performance audit of Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Now, I have to say I was shocked when I heard the Auditor General even did a report into that, because the Auditor General wouldn't know what he's talking about. Also, we should also remember that the Auditor General is an ex-Labor staffer uh, who has shown to be partisan in the part, pa past, as we saw with the Leppington Triangle. However, I want to uh, make this very clear that the World Health Organisation came out in September 2021, September 2020, sorry, and actually said that the vaccine would not be ready for another nine months because there needed to be greater safety testing. They needed to do much more safety testing of the vaccine. And lo and behold, six weeks later, about a week after uh, President Biden was elected, suddenly, for the first time in 40 years, after trying to find a vaccine for 40 years, three different uh, pharmaceutical companies had found a vaccine. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounded like a bit too much of a coincidence for my liking. But for Senator uh, Steele, John, to be saying that this, the Morrison government didn't do everything to roll out the vaccine in time when just six weeks, when just six weeks earlier the World Health Organisation was saying that the vaccine wouldn't be ready until June 2021 is complete rubbish. How can you make a plan when there hadn't been a vaccine, when a vaccine hadn't even been invented? They'd been searching for a vaccine for up to 40 years, and they certainly have never used an mRNA uh, uh, encased in a lipid uh, at all. So to suddenly blame the Morrison government for not rolling out a vaccine that wasn't properly tested on immunocompromised people, and I just remember that, uh, Senator Jordan uh, Steele John, it wasn't tested on immunocompromised people, it wasn't tested on people who were getting uh, anti immune uh, tablets at all. So for you to be claiming that it wasn't rolled out fast enough isn't actually true at all. And as it turns out, we actually still have had one of the lowest COVID death rates in the world, not because of the vaccine, I might add, but because we kept the country locked down for two years. So the best part of the country was locked down for two years, and you're still complaining, you and your mate, the Auditor General, who we know can't be trusted because he couldn't actually zone, know the difference between an agricultural zone and an industrial zone, and ran partisan politics. And I will be writing. Uh, to the Attorney General about his inability to remain uh, impartial, the Auditor General. So why he would suddenly find the urgency to have to do up a uh, report into the rollout of the COVID vaccine? I mean, this guy would not have a clue. And we should also point out that he never once talked on what the TGA did. And I, and I will quote: "The Pfizer never tested the spike protein in humans." Now, how can you roll out something that's never been actually? Uh, tested on somebody and, and, and then say it's safe and effective. But did the Auditor General raise that? No, 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 no. So I would suggest that the Auditor General uh, should really uh, take a good look at his own position. I don't think it's right that he stays in this position given that he's an ex Labor staffer. Uh, you know, he, was a, uh, and that's, uh, he was a staffer back in the late 80s. Uh, for a Hawke Keating uh, uh, government minister, and I think because he is impartial, he should re uh, reconsider his position. On, and I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. Is just, thank you, Senator Rennick. Is uh, leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, I just want to ensure that uh, Senator Still John, before um, asked for leave to continue his remarks, and there was uh, no objection to that, so leave is also granted for, for that. Just to cross that off, and I understand. Oh, hang on, we'll just. Um, the motion before the chair is that we take note of uh, Auditor General Report Number Four. 
Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And Senator Shoebridge wishes to go to document 12 uh, on page 6, which is uh, the interim report of the Defence and Veteran Suicide Role Commission. So, Senator Shoebridge, you have the call. Uh, Deputy President, um, I wish to continue my remarks on the interim report of the Royal Commission on Defence and Veterans Suicide. Mr. Deputy President, the Royal Commission's interim findings are both shocking and sobering, deeply sobering. What they show is a system that is failing veterans. The Australian government has spent some $14.4 billion on wars in the Middle East, um, including Afghanistan, since 2001. That includes that $8.5 billion on military operations just in Afghanistan, more than $4 billion on operations in Iraq. And while the country is spending billions of dollars to send mostly young people off to fight wars in far-off countries, we are failing to properly support veterans when they return home, fundamentally changed and in many cases deeply traumatised by their service. It's a tragic fact that more current and former ADF members have died by suicide than in combat in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars combined. The Royal Commission, in its interim report, and I commend the commissioners for the work they've done, for the sensitivity of their, act, of, of their report um, and for their survivor-focused approach to the Royal Commission, but the Royal Commission identified over 50 previous reports conducted since just 2000 that are relevant to the topics of suicide and suicidality among serving and ex-serving ADF members, and also noted more than 750 recommendations. And they found that most of these recommendations have not been implemented. And indeed, the Royal Commission was limited in how it could review, particularly, reports of this parliament because of a, the operation of parliamentary privilege. And they've made urgent recommendations to the government to seek to lift parliamentary privilege to be able to uh, pr appropriately scrutinise and reflect upon the, the, the reports and recommendations of committees of this parliament. But what we have seen since 2000, those 50 previous reports, 750 recommendations, largely uh, unimplemented, is in fact two decades of failure. And as the commissions noted, and I quote, We've been dismayed to come to understand the limited ways that Australian governments have responded to these previous inquiries and reports, and dismayed they were. The Royal Commission has heard damning evidence demonstrating that the system that's meant to be there to help veterans is instead too often harming them. And Deputy President, I don't hold the current government responsible for the mess that the system is in. They've inherited it. Um, Yes, there may be some cul culpability going back, going back over a decade, but the veterans I've spoken to don't hold the current government responsible for the mess. But I and they do hold the government responsible for stepping through and fixing it and responding with urgency to the recommendations from the interim report of the Royal Commission. The way the Australian government is currently dealing with veterans' claims for compensation and rehabilitation was found by the Commission, by the Royal Commission, to be a contributing factor to defence suicides. Let's just pause and reflect on that for a moment. The system that is meant to be there to help veterans is instead contributing to veteran suicide, a double failing of the duty that we have to those people who have served. That's a shocking conclusion. And indeed, as the interim report shows, there are currently some 41,799 outstanding claims. Some have been outstanding for well over 300 days. Indeed, that number has almost doubled in less than two years. And yes, some efforts are being made currently by the department to increase staffing and respond to that. But the backlog doubling in just two years, the delay that that gives to veterans in getting urgent treatment, having their health prioritised, is, is a significant part of, of the harm that's been delivered um, to veterans. Veterans, indeed, are too often left to deal with the traumatic experiences of war and then are further traumatised by the system's failure to appropriately respond, to compensate and, importantly, to rehabilitate them. As one veterans advocate said, this, referencing the waiting time, is the damaging factor for a lot of veterans. They're sitting there, hanging on, 
waiting so they can go to the doctor and find out exactly what's wrong with them and get it paid for and get looked after. This is what they're waiting on. Waiting on treatment, Deputy President. Waiting on being helped. Survivors of abuse within the ADF face similar injustices and interminable waits, sometimes stretching out five, ten years. They struggle equally against broken systems and a culture that permits abuse, that exacerbates trauma by obstructing calls for support, fair compensation and accountability. De Mr De Deputy President, we can and much, must do better, and the government can and must urgently respond thank, to the recommendations of the interim you, report. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. And I, um, you're seeking leave to continue your remarks. No one, uh, um, uh, no one objects. Uh, leave is granted. And the question before the chair is the Senate take uh, note of document 12 on page 6. Those with the opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. There's no further um, uh, documents or committee reports. I will now move on to ministerial statements, and I call the minister. Thank you. I table documents relating to three orders for the production of documents concerning pension changes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we now have some. Before we proceed to the consideration of. Oh, you have one more. Sorry, um, minister. Uh, well, in fact, this is a message. We will proceed to messages, which is what, what the th I was. <laughs> yes. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question before the chair is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Fringe Benefits Tax Assessment Act 1986 to exempt benefits relating to cars that are zero or low emissions vehicles and for other purposes. Uh, Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Uh, uh, leave is granted. Uh, Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question before the chair is that the debate now be adjourned. Those of opinion say aye, those against say no, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives agreeing to the Senate resolution proposing an extension of time for the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards to present its report. And we uh, Clark. General Business Debate, Order of the Day number 18, Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to make a contribution on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. This matter uh, has a lengthy history and it was a decision made in this place 25 years ago to pass the euthanasia law Act 1997, which amended the right of Australia's territories to legislate in this space, and this bill intends to undo that decision. Uh, Parliament has seen nine separate attempts over the last 18 years to hand the territories power to legislate assisted suicide, the first in 2004 and the most recent just last year. And the bills were either voted down or indeed scrapped. Now, it must be pointed out that this bill has made another comeback under the guise of restoring rights to Territorians. But ultimately, it cuts through the very core values of our country, values that have been held since Federation, which is, of course, the sanctity of life. This bill is only about giving those living in the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory access to assisted suicide. And personally, I will not be supporting this bill, uh, and that position comes from a very deep and personal conviction. Under no circumstance could I ever support a human being ending their own life, whether it's sanctioned by the government or not, and it simply does not sit right with my conscience. Now, I believe that life is sacred and life should not end on anyone's terms not your own, not your doctor's and not the government's. And the outcome of signing a piece of paper for a doctor is the same as dying, frankly, by any other method. 
Now, euthanasia is a relatively new practice in Australia, and it was one uh, that is changing the way that we view health care. Instead of investing in better palliative care in Australia, this bill puts that very thing at risk. Order. If we continue to view euthanasia Order. as a palliative Order. care alternative, we will discourage further investment, research and better care for those that need it. In 2018, my colleague Senator Patrick Dodson told this place, and I quote, more needs to be done to ensure that First Nations people are receiving palliative care within their communities, where First Nations people are already overrepresented at every stage of our health system. It is irresponsible to vote in favour of another avenue to death. Paving the way for euthanasia and assisted suicide leaves First Nations people even more vulnerable, when our focus should be on working collectively to create laws that help prolong life and restore their right to enjoy a healthy life. Now, Senator Dodson reflects on the grave disadvantages of euthanasia for Indigenous Australians, but of course these issues apply to all Australians. If we choose euthanasia as an acceptable palliative care option, then over time it would appreciate the value that we place on life. Now, intended or not, once you start thinking <clears throat> Once you start something, uh, it always finds a way to advance itself, and I do not believe that the sponsors of this bill intend to cause any harm. But over time, as more people access euthanasia, Australians will desensitise to its use as a genuine end-of-life option. Now, the Netherlands made euthanasia legal in 2001, and in 2005 they became the first country to decriminalise euthanasia for children. In Belgium, euthanasia was made legal for adults or, in rare conditions, emancipated minors in 2002. In 2014, in 2014 they amended euthanasia laws to allow voluntary child euthanasia without any age restriction. The child can request it and verify that they understand that what they're asking for, and with the parents' and doctors' consent, the child is euthanised. Over 27,000 people have been euthanised in, euthanised in Belgium since the laws were passed in 2002, and almost one in five people were not expected to die of natural causes in the immediate future. People are now accessing euthanasia for psychological conditions. And this extract is drawn from the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, Volume 46, 2021. And it reads, I quote, Another point of controversy is the fact that the Belgian euthanasia law allows euthanasia for both physical and psychological suffering, but it does not specify how the difference between the two should be conceived. The absence of any consensus or legal guidance on how to define psychological suffering makes it possible to use the concept in an increasingly broad way. Available empirical evidence and reports show that euthanasia is performed increasingly frequently in cases of psychological suffering, e.g. for schizophrenia, borderline disorder or depression. Now, these mental health issues are sadly increasingly common here in Australia. However, what's distressing is these conditions are treatable, but the Belgian government allow these patients to euthanise themselves in the, same, in the name of compassion or human rights. Now, I don't think anyone here would want to see Australia go down this path, the path towards an on-demand assisted suicide. But I remind this place that the territories do not have the same degree of checks and balances as the states. We must ask ourselves, if we allow the territory and authorities to pass assisted suicide laws, can we guarantee that the appropriate safeguards and checks will be in place to protect Australians? No, we cannot. The Australian Capital Territory Government is the first and it is the only government to have decriminalised the possession of small amounts of illicit drugs like ice heroin and cocaine. 
the drugs that have caused so much pain and destruction in our community. How can we ensure that the Chief Minister Barr does not take legislation of assisted suicide to the extreme like we've seen him do with his drug laws? Mr Order. Acting Deputy President, looking past my personal objections, our constitution grants powers to the Commonwealth to make laws for the government of any territory. We've been given a greater responsibility over our territories, over our territories I beg your pardon, to make sure that there is sufficient level of accountability. Now, passing this bill and granting the territories the right to legislate assisted suicide laws with limited accountability, in my view, is a risk far too high. Now, I wish to remind the Chamber that only 18 months after the Honourable Kevin Andrews moved the Euthanasia Laws, in, in, uh, Euthanasia laws Act 1997, the Northern Territory held a referendum to decide if it should become a state of the Commonwealth of Australia. And it's pertinent to note that the Labor government of the, the day supported the No campaign. Now, accordingly, the good people of the Northern Territory narrowly voted it down, and the result of this referendum meant that the Commonwealth continued to retain its oversight of this matter. I do not support this change. So do not pretend this bill is about giving the same rights states have to territories when the Northern Territory had that right, had that opportunity to have those rights, but they declined. Mr Acting Deputy President, I actually, in listening to the other contributions when we started this debate earlier in the week, uh, I want to reflect on the fact that this debate has been engaged in a very respectful way. I understand that there is a real diversity of views on this matter. People come at this from all sorts of different perspectives, and I respect the fact that we are able to have a debate as, as important as this and do it in a respectful way. And the discussion on this matter is, of course, very important. But I encourage all senators to truly consider what's at stake here. Do we want to set ourselves on a path that could lead us down to the same direction that other countries around the world, and I cited the situation in Belgium, where we end up providing uh, euthanasia, assisted suicide, for people uh, with clinical diagnosis of depression, schizophrenia and other, other mental illnesses, and, as we've seen, in other countries where children are able to access these services. Now, there's no law in Australia right now in any state that would allow that, but that's the point. The, we, this passage of this legislation here would enable the ACT, the Northern Territory, to be able to put in place laws that, without the same checks and balances that you have in states, that could quite easily allow for an even greater uh, moving towards those, those sort of, uh, th without those sort of limitations. And I don't think that that is something that we would want to see. So I urge senators, when you're considering where you're going on this conscience vote that's appropriately before us here, uh, that you consider uh, all of these matters and uh, I urge you to vote against this bill. Thank you. And just before I call Senator Billick, may I remind all senators that because this is a conscience debate, I will be coming down particularly hard on any interjections, as all senators should be heard with respect and allowed to, to express their views. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, if I can just begin by making a couple of comments about Senator, Senator O'Sullivan's um, contribution. I want to make it very clear. I've done a lot of work over many, many years with palliative care, both palliative care Tasmania and palliative care Australia. And the issue in regard to this uh, debate is that palliative care and voluntary, and I underline the word voluntary assisted dying, are not mutually exclusive. In fact, palliative care can be a great resource uh, in the area of voluntary assisted dying. Uh, but can I thank my um, Labor colleagues in the House who introduced this bill, the member for Ballarat, Ms King, and the member for Eden Monaro, Ms McBain. 
It's hard to believe that it's now 27 years since the Northern Territory Parliament passed the rights of the Terminally Ill Act. They were the first state or territory in Australia to legislate for and regulate, and regulate the process of voluntary assisted dying. It's not euthanasia and it's not suicide. It's voluntary assisted dying. And after the Act was passed and before it was overridden by the Federal Parliament, seven people sought assistance to end their lives under the Act. All seven had advanced stages of cancer. Of the seven, four were able to use the provisions of the Act to end their lives. Another two sought assistance but died before the Act became law, and one died after the Act was repealed. The Northern Territories Act was enforced for almost two years when the Australian Parliament passed the Euthanasia Laws Act 1997. The Federal Act prevented not only the Northern Territory but also the ACT in Norfolk Island from passing laws to allow for voluntary assisted dying. And since the bill was introduced, there have been many attempts in this parliament through private members and private senators' bill to repeal the provision of the Euthanasia Laws Act and restore the rights of the territories. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole length of those um, various um, attempts to do that, but I'll say this. In 2016, a bill was introduced, this time a collaborative effort between Senator Di Natale and Labor Senator Gallagher, but like most of the others, were not proceeded with. In 2021, during the last parliament, national, uh, sorry, in 2021, during the last parliament, National Senator Sue McMahon introduced the Ensuring Northern Territory Rights Bill. And while there was some progress on the second reading debate, this bill did not come to a vote. The one bill that did make it to a division, Senator Linehelm's bill, was neg negatived by a margin of only two votes. So while we've been grappling with the issue of the rights of the territories to legislate for voluntary assisted dying, we've had extensive debates on the issues in all state parliaments. In fact, I think Senator O'Sullivan comes from Western Australia. Western Australia has voluntary assisted dying laws. So it's all right for the state that he lives in to have it, uh, and we didn't get to have a say in this chamber whether Western Australia gets to do that or not, but when it comes to the territories, we have to treat them differently. Um, sorry, I've lost my spot. Um, every state parliament has now passed laws to provide some regulatory framework for suffering terminally ill people to seek assistance to end their lives. And as I said, this chamber did not get a vote to determine what every, uh, every state did. So why do we? Why do we have to do that in regard to the territories? These laws take effect on various states and are already in effect in two of the six states. In my home state of Tasmania, the legislation which passed was developed by Legislative Council member Mike Gaffney after a very long and very extensive community consultation process. And this consultation process allowed the legislation to be very thoroughly scrutinised to ensure the language was consistent and correct and the checks and balances against misuse were watertight. The End of Life Choices Voluntary Assisted Dying Act passed the Tasmanian Parliament last year and commences operation on the 23rd of October this year. And you will notice from the titles of the various um, repeal bills put forward in federal parliament that there have been a lot of terms used, a lot of terms bandied about, and as I said, some of these are inappropriate. And it's really important that we get the terminology correct. We're talking here about voluntary, voluntary assisted dying. We're not talking about euthanasia or suicide, as I've mentioned. So those against it use that language uh, to run the emotive argument, uh, and I, as a, I, I've, I just find that not tolerable because you have to understand the bill, you have to understand the word, what the word voluntary means. We're not forcing anyone to do it. Um, and you hear all these horror stories, but I don't understand why it's all right for all the states to be able to do it and not the territories. I, if anyone can explain to me why that's all right, and give me a logical argument, I'm happy to listen, but I haven't heard a logical argument about it yet. Ending one's own life by suicide is usually the result of mental ill health such as psychosis or severe depression. And suicide's a tragedy, don't get me wrong, and every possible measure should be taken to reduce the incidence of suicide until we eliminate it entirely. But by contrast, voluntary assisted dying is a rational act 
made by someone whose life-limiting illness is causing them intolerable pain or physical discomfort, and as a result, they have no prospects for quality of life. Suicide tends to be preceded by isolation and loneliness, not always, but usually, whereas voluntary assisted dying usually brings patients closer to family and loved ones. As for euthanasia, this is a procedure used to kill someone painlessly to end their suffering. With voluntary assisted dying, the doctor provides the patient the means to end their life and thereby end their suffering. So ultimately, the power to make the decision remains in the patient's hands. It's important that we make these distinctions clear when we talk about voluntary assisted dying. Years ago, I was actually opposed to voluntary assisted dying, but my views have changed. Some recent experiences, of course, have had a profound effect on my thinking about the topic of death and dying and how I die and how much dignity I have when I die and how I want the choice, may want the choice to be mine. I mean, I might get run over by a bus tomorrow and, heck, wouldn't there be a whole lot of people interested in my position? But, you know, if I've got the choice and I'm in such severe pain and I've got no quality of life, then I want to be able to make that choice. Only a few years ago, I stayed for two weeks by the bedside of a very close personal friend as well who was dying in a palliative care suite. And I'd known my, friends for, my friend for over three decades, uh, and we were partners in crime together for over three decades. And I'd witnessed her cognitive decline over several years, resulting from early onset dementia. At the beginning of those two weeks, she lost the ability to swallow, and the doctors expected her to only live for one other day. But she held on for two weeks receiving regular pain medication, and it was a great relief to her loved ones when the suffering finally ended. I've changed my view on voluntary assisted dying before this incident, but I still had, it still had a profound impact, um, effect on me nonetheless, and probably just served to reinforce my views. Seeing people die or dying changes your perspective of death. I used to be a nurse. I've seen people die. I've laid out the dead. I've seen people have to hang on or hang, you know, being kept alive with no quality of life. And I cannot accept that that has to be the way for the people in the territories if it doesn't have to be the way for the people in the states. But we've got a bit of a culture in Australia where we treat death like a taboo subject. We don't talk about it nearly enough, whereas in other cultures they're much more open about the subject. We even seek to substitute straightforward words like death and dying with euthanisms like passing away or passing. I'm committed to turning this around, as a lot of people in this chamber know. And as co-convener of Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care for a number of years, I've spoken extensively about the need to plan for and discuss our end-of-life wishes in order to have a good death. We do it when we're having a baby. We have plans to have babies. People want women to have a good birth and to have a good experience. When it comes to dying, we should have the same respect for dying. Part of our discomfort with the idea of assisted dying is probably brought about by our discomfort with the idea of death generally and our reluctance to discuss it openly. And I'm sure more people would be open to the idea of voluntary assisted dying if they openly discuss the topic of death as well as what their dying wishes are. That's why I love the idea of death cafes, an initiative that's gaining popularity in which people get together over tea or coffee and have a frank, open discussion about death. More discussion about death would also help to overcome the pervasive misunderstandings about palliative care. And I am disappointed to hear people voice suggestions that arguing for investment in quality palliative care is somehow an excuse for not rendering assistance to terminally ill patients to end their own lives. As I said, they're not mutually exclusive. It frustrates me because I'm both a supporter of voluntary assisted dying and a strong advocate for quality palliative care. And I know palliative care people, because I speak to them regularly, understand that palliative care can assist with voluntary assisted dying. As I said, it's not an either or proposition. But I do suggest, as I have earlier in my contribution, that these views are put forward by people They've got a very narrow understanding, quite often, of what palliative care is. So just while I'm here, let me bust some of the myths. Palliative care is not just pain management at the very end and, and other care. It's not just for dying people in a hospital bed and it's not just for old people. 
Palliative care is for anyone of any age, including children, who have a life-limiting illness. It can be provided to people in the final days of life or the final years. It can be provided in any setting—a hospital, an aged care facility, a home, or even out in the country, out in the community. It addresses the physical, social, emotional, psychological, cultural, and even spiritual needs of the patient. For example, if you've got a life-limiting illness and your dying wish is to go bungee jumping, then having someone to take your bungee jumping could be a form of palliative care. For anyone listening, I hope this example helps to broaden your perspective on palliative care. Having conversations about our dying wishes and investing in quality palliative care in Australia are two ways we can ensure that people with life-limiting illnesses have the best end-of-life experience possible. And isn't what that what we want for them? Shouldn't we all want that for anyone with a life-limiting illness? But regardless of how good palliative care is, we know it will not end all the pain, all the suffering and all the discomfort. There is a need for other options for people whose quality of life cannot be assured. For many patients advocating for voluntary assisted dying, just the knowledge that this option is available gives them comfort and lessens their fear, even if they may never exercise that option. While I've spoken at length in this contribution about voluntary assisted dying, let's be clear that what we're debating, uh, that we are not debating whether to legislate for assisted dying here, but whether to allow the territories to do so, just like we allow the states. This is not fundamentally a debate about voluntary assisted dying, but a debate about territory rights. That much is made clear by the title of the bill. Going back to Senator Leinhelm's bill, I spoke in the second reading on that bill four years ago. I just want to quote a paragraph from that speech. What I said then was, I do not believe it's for me as a senator elected to this place to determine whether the Northern Territory or the ACT should legislate for voluntary assisted dying, just as it's not for me to determine whether Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia, New South Wales or Queensland should. It's not for me to decide whether the safeguards of the Northern Territory or the ACT's assisted dying legislation are sufficient. I support this bill because not do, I do not see it as fair to treat Territorians as second-class citizens and to say to them, the states are mature enough to govern themselves, but you need federal oversight. That is essentially what this parliament did when it passed the Euthanasia Laws Act in 1997. So, quickly going back to my speech, my fundamental objection to the Euthanasia Laws Act is that it created in Australia two classes of citizens, those who are governed on state matters by their state parliaments and those who have federal oversight on matters that would normally be dealt with by their territorial parliaments. I understand the Constitution gives this parliament the power to deny territorians certain powers that are afforded to the states, but I see no reason, no compelling reason whatsoever for asserting those powers. As far as I'm concerned, doing so treats Territorians as second-class citizens and it smacks of paternalism. Our constitution was adopted over 100 years ago, and it's imperfect, but improving it is a difficult and expensive process. One way we can improve the operation of our constitution without the expense of a referendum is through the conventions we choose to follow. And I believe giving the territories the same legislative powers as the states is a convention that we should agree to adopt and uphold, even if our constitution allows us to do otherwise. It's worth noting that other speakers during the debate on Senator Leinhelm's bill supported the bill despite their personal opposition to voluntary assisted dying. 16 seconds. So I would urge anyone in this place who opposes voluntary assisted dying to consider upholding the principle that Territorians should have their own right to decide. After all, imagine if the tables were turned. Thank you. Senator Napanjimpa Price. Thank you, Mr President. This bill has challenged my thinking very deeply. I've come to this parliament to consider every piece of legislation that comes before us, and it is my obligation to the people of this country to pursue a deeper level of understanding and argument for and against each piece of legislation, never taking anything for granted, and especially on an issue as serious as permitting society the ability to end human life. I've heard very shallow arguments from my fellow federal Labor colleagues from the Northern Territory and our very own Northern Territory Labor Attorney General who claim this is purely about giving Territorians rights 
and anyone who opposes this is effectively denying our rights as Territorians to make our own decisions. In my opinion, taking a human life is far more serious an issue deserving profound consideration as opposed to political point scoring or gaslighting to elicit a supporting vote. Given our Attorney General Chancy Paik, our Senator McCarthy and the member for Lingiari, Marion Scrimger, are of Aboriginal heritage, I would have hoped that they would consider the possible consequences for and the current deeply held concerns of the Territory's Aboriginal population, who are some of our most marginalised Australians. The Northern Territory has the highest proportion of Aboriginal Australians in the country, at 30 per cent of our population. The majority of this population consists of those whose first language is not English and who experience the lowest levels of education, the highest levels of unemployment and welfare dependency, the lowest life expectancy, the highest rates of domestic, violence, domestic and family violence and the greatest health challenges in the nation. Voluntary assisted dying is incompatible with the closing the gap health and wellbeing targets of closing the gap in life expectancy within a generation by 2031, and significant and sustained reduction in suicide of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people towards zero. The Northern Territory government are also charged with the responsibility of protecting the lives of Territorians, but have recently acted contrary to this duty, instead using human rights as the basis for their argument to allow alcohol to be assumed, consumed again in remote communities. They've argued that an alcoholic should have the right to drink themselves to death, and if that alcoholic is also a violent perpetrator, their potential to commit violence has been prioritised by this territory government over the rights of the perpetrator's victims to live a life free from all forms of violence. It is a human right for every man, woman and child to live a life free from any form of violence, including alcohol-related violence. Despite desperate pleas from vulnerable community members and leading Aboriginal health and legal services, this Northern Territory Labor government, who now seek the right to debate voluntary assisted dying, completely ignored these pleas. I now feel distressing calls on a regular basis from people who are experiencing the immediate consequences of the Northern Territory government's actions. These individuals and their communities are re-traumatised by the alcohol-fuelled violence that has returned to their communities. In two communities in Central Australia, families have fled due to feuds. Children's lives are disrupted, as are the lives of those now being displaced. This is contributing to the gangs of children now back on our streets of my hometown who are not attending school and who have no adult supervision. So you can forgive me for having no faith or confidence that this current Northern Territory Labor government is capable of determining legislation that lends itself to ending the lives of human beings. My other concerns speak to cases I have come to learn of in other countries like Canada, where laws allowing assisted dying have seen individuals who have been misdiagnosed with terminal illness end their lives wrongfully, or cases where the prognosis has been delivered to a patient estimating they only have months to live, when in fact they have had years left. But the consequences of the initial prognosis has brought their lives to an end prematurely. There is the mental capacity of individuals seeking assisted dying to be considered. When there have been cases of individuals who have ended their lives without involvement of family members, who sadly only learn after their loved ones have passed away that they had sought assisted dying. The mental capacity of these individuals was not known or considered by treating doctors, yet if family had known, they still would not have been able to challenge their loved ones' requests due to the legislation's determinations. I have a niece in her early 30s whose kidneys collapsed some years ago. She has two children in their early teens. She decided recently she no longer wanted to live and ceased attending her dialysis appointments. It was deeply concerning to us as a family that she had come to this conclusion. It was very likely the fact that the increased level of toxins in her blood due to avoiding dialysis was contributing to her inability to make sound decisions about her health. As her family, we did everything in our power to keep her alive. 
We had her committed to care and arranged counselling for her to better understand the need for her to keep fighting for her life and continue to be dialysed. Her children needed their mother. This is why I fight for better life outcomes, better quality of life for all Australians, especially for our most marginalised, to respect the sanctity of life by fighting to save lives. While I acknowledge the other 70 per cent of the Northern Territory is not Aboriginal, I have a responsibility to all of our Territorians. The proposed repeal of Kevin Andrews' bill does not create equality between states and territories, as the following points show. Territories and states are fundamentally different. The Northern Territory Self-Government Act of 1978 NTA, is an act of the Commonwealth Parliament and can be changed as Parliament sees fit. State constitutions subsist by S106 of the Constitution and are protected by it. They cannot be changed by the Commonwealth Parliament. Two, the Commonwealth Parliament has plenary power over the territories by S122 of the Constitution. That can't be changed save by referendum. By contrast, the Commonwealth Parliament may only legislate in matters affecting states within the powers granted to it by S51 of the Constitution or exclusive powers like defence. Three, the Administrator of the Northern Territory is appointed by the Governor-General. State governors are appointed by the Queen. Four, by virtue of S53.5 of the NTA, the Northern Territory Parliament does not have power to confer on courts or tribunals powers to resolve employment disputes. That restriction remains. Five, finally, finally and importantly, by S72 of the NTA, the Commonwealth indemnifies the Territory in relation to any claim for damages, which but for the NTA could have been brought against the Commonwealth. That means that the Northern Territory does not stand on its own two feet, but is supported by the Commonwealth. Therefore, the Constitution demands that every one of our selected members of federal parliament take greater responsibility for the territories within our nation as opposed to our states, whether we like it or not. But if this bill is to pass, and because of my very grave concerns, then I would urge any Northern Territory government that wishes to debate legislation for voluntary assisted dying to un undergo thorough, thorough consultation with Territorians of all backgrounds, but especially from our most vulnerable constituents. I would also urge especially those who argue this bill is only about supporting the rights of Territorians that once you've determined your legislation, you put it to the vote of the people of the Northern Territory so that it may truly reflect their wishes and rights. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I have thought more deeply about this issue than any other issue I have thought about in this place. And I have changed my view from a past time when maybe I took a more classical liberal approach with respect to matters such as this to one where I reflect deeply, deeply on the threat to the most vulnerable in our community in relation to the passage of this legislation. If this bill were only, were only about the rights of Territorians, it would not be a conscience vote. It would not be a conscience vote. And that recognition of this as a conscience vote includes a recognition that it is about something more than just the rights of Territorians. I do not believe that the ends justify the means, nor do I believe that you should focus entirely on the means and disregard the ends or the results of what happens. Hence, when I come into this place and consider an issue such as this, and I see that in terms of protecting the vulnerable, the consultation with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, our First Nations people, considering the unintended consequences of this legislation, when I consider all of those issues and I see in terms of safeguards, in terms of 
consideration given to those issues, there's barely a page, barely a page of consideration, barely a page of consideration to those matters. The reality is, the reality is, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that the Con Constitution of Australia places an obligation upon us, places an obligation on us to consider whether or not the legislation that was introduced by a previous parliament should be repealed. We have the power, therefore we have the responsibility, and it's up to each and every one of us to determine how we discharge that responsibility. And I pay tribute to Senator Nampajimpa Price with respect to her position, her ethical position. It would not have been an easy thing to do, being a senator from the Northern Territory, to, to do that. And it reminds me, it has echoes of the great Edmund Burke, who, when he had to speak to his constituents in Bristol in that famous speech, he said, When I come to Parliament, I'm not just here as your cipher, I bring with me my own conscience. And I have to apply my own wisdom to that which is before me. So I really do congratulate you on that speech. I have material concerns with respect to voluntary assisted dying, and the more I look into it, and I have looked deeply, the more concerned I am on a number of bases. And I think Senator Member Jimba Price, her comments with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are very, very important to consider, and I'll be making some comments in that respect as well. first point I want to make is voluntary assisted dying is not entirely a private act. This is not like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, because by its very nature, in terms of the processes initiated through voluntary assisted dying, you are, if you choose to go down that path, involving others. You are involving others. You are involving the medical profession. You are involving the state, which has to have checks and balances to try and assess whether or not a person's consent is valid or invalid. You're placing obligations on a whole range of people. It is not just a single private act. This is broader than this. This is broader than this. And I'll seek to bring that into stark relief shortly. It also has national significance. We have human rights obligations which we have entered into internationally, including with respect to the disabled, that have been entered into by our country on a national level. We are the provider of the NDIS, the NDIS, which we hope provides services to our disabled such that they never get into the position, never get into the position where because they haven't received adequate services, they are forced, they're forced to choose a Hobson's choice that the only way they can end the suffering because they haven't been provided adequate services is to go down the voluntary assisted dying route. We're the provider of health services. The Palliative Care Association of Australia, after the election of the most recent government, wrote to the government and said, congratulations, as they should do, as each association would do, and they said, we hope you look, we hope you look at the shortage of palliative care services in this country. So we're all put on notice. We are all put on notice. Everyone in this place has put on notice that there are inadequate palliative care services in this country at this point in time. So if a person is in that invidious position of trying to get access to palliative care services, concerned, scared of the pain, scared of the suffering when they haven't got access to that service, I say to you, we should make sure they've got access to those palliative care services first. That should be our primary responsibility. I'm going to read to you from a very disturbing article from Canada, a first world country in many ways very similar to Australia. And I'll make this point first. In their annual report on medical assistance in dying in Canada, they give the statistics for the rates of medical assisted dying in Canada between its introduction in 2016 and 2021. The number of people accessing voluntary assisted dying in Canada has increased from 1,018 in 2016 to 10,064 in 2021, a tenfold increase, 1,018 to 10,064. So let's have a look to see what is actually happening in Canada. And I quote from a very recent article by Maria Cheng of Associated Press 
the medical writer. And I quote, Alan Nichols had a history of depression. This is from Toronto. Alan Nichols had a history of depression and other medical issues, but none were life-threatening. When the 61-year-old Canadian was hospitalised in June 2019 over fears he might be suicidal, he asked his brother to bust him out as soon as possible. Within a month, Nichols submitted a request to be euthanised, and he was killed, despite concerns raised by his family and a nurse practitioner. They've got all the safeguards in Canada. We can have pages and pages and pages of safeguards in legislation, but what we have to ask ourselves is, what is the practical reality? Nichols' family reported the case to police and health authorities, arguing that he lacked the capacity to understand the process and was not suffering unbearably. Among the requirements for euthanasia, they say he was not taking needed medication, wasn't using the cochlear implant that helped him hear, and that hospital staff has improperly helped him request euthanasia. Alan was basically put to death, his brother Gary Nichols said. This is happening in Canada, a first world country, at this point in time. I'll give you another example from this article which you can see in terms of what is actually happening on the ground in Canada. Before being euthanised in August 2019 at age 24, Sean Taggart struggled to get the 24-hour-a-day care he needed. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Is that happening in Australia? Of course it is. The government provided Taggart, who had Lou Gehrig's disease, with 16 hours of daily care at his home in Power River, British Columbia. He spent about 264 Canadian dollars a day to pay coverage during the eight hours. Health authorities proposed that Taggart move to an institution, but he refused, saying he would be too far away from his young son. He called the suggestion a death sentence. Before his death, before his death through voluntary euthanasia, Taggart had raised more than Canadian $16,000 to buy specialised medical equipment he needed to live at home with caretakers, but it still wasn't enough. I know I'm asking for change, Taggart wrote in a Facebook post before his death. I just didn't realise that was an unacceptable thing to do. And in light of what is happening on the ground, the United Nations has actually written to the Canadian government, raising concerns that its law breaches the convention relating to provision of non-discrimination to people suffering from a disability. This is in Canada. This is in Canada. Here's another example, perhaps even, uh, perhaps even more horrifying. Roger Foley from the same article. Roger Foley, who has a degenerative brain disorder and is hospitalised in London, Ontario, was so alarmed by staffers mentioning euthanasia that he began re secretly recording some of their conversations. So this is someone suffering from a deeply, deeply difficult disease in hospital, being so disturbed by the conversations that health professionals in a first world country were having with him, he started recording them. And this is what we found. In one recording obtained by the AP, the hospital's director of ethics, of all things, told Foley that for him to remain in the hospital, it would cost, cost north of $1,500 a day. Foley replied that mentioning fees felt like coercion and asked what plan there was for his long-term care. And this is how the ethicist responded. Roger, this is not my show. My piece of this was to talk to you to see if you had an interest in assisted dying. End quote. That's what's happening in Canada. An article in August, just last month, in relation to the position in the Northern Territory and our First Nations people. I'm not a member of our First Nations people, but when the concerns were raised in that regard, I felt a moral obligation to do what research I could in relation to what the experience was in the Northern Territory. And I came across this article. It's entitled Right Legislation, Wrong Jurisdiction. And it contains an extract from a written statement to the Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs Inquiry into Euthanasia, undertaken by Chips McAnulty. Chips McAnulty was charged by the Northern Territory with the obligation to go around to different Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory and consult with them in relation to the legislation which had been imposed or brought into effect in the Northern Territory. Following that consultation, even though, even though personally 
He supported euthanasia. He was desperately, desperately concerned that voluntary assisted dying was inappropriate, was inappropriate in the Northern Territory context. He was desperately concerned. He found out of the 900 First Nations people he consulted with, only two, only two gave any support to voluntary assisted dying. And what was most troubling, what was most troubling was the fact that he believed it could be totally counterproductive and that Aboriginal people may not attend at health clinics because they'd be concerned with respect to what was associated with the health clinics, that it could actually lead to that sort of additional dysfunction in that context. I'll quote. However, for reasons I will explain, I'm not convinced that acquiring objective knowledge of the contents of the legislation had any significant impact on Aboriginal knowledge and perceptions of sickness and health, life and death. For this reason, it is my personal view that the existence of the legislation presents—and I will quote this and listen to this very, very, very carefully—the legislation presents, I quote, a continuing threat to the health and well-being of many Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory." End quote. Now, this is someone who believed in the philosophy of voluntary assisted dying, but after he travelled across all those communities, came to that view. Another quote I'd like to give from that article. It is worth noting in this context that private Aboriginal-owned clinics have demanded and received written undertakings from staff that they will not participate in euthanasia so as to reassure patients that these clinics are safe to attend. Legal and other reasons preclude this occurring in government clinics. And an attempt to amend the legislation to exempt Aboriginal community clinics from participating in euthanasia failed to pass the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly. Again, another quote. I personally support my having access to euthanasia but not in the Northern Territory. It is arguably the right legislation, but certainly the wrong jurisdiction. My reasons for this are both simple and complex. And I, I suggest to everyone that they read that article. And if this legislation goes through, it's likely to that, in particular, Northern Territory legislators pay close regard to the words of Chips McAnulty in that respect. It's very, very important. This is a very, very, very difficult issue. An extraordinarily difficult issue, but having read extensively into the most recent experiences of what is occurring in first world jurisdictions, countries like our own in Canada, and seeing how those experiences could translate into an Australian context, I simply cannot support legislation where the only safeguards we're, we're given are no safeguards. There's just a page. A page of legislation. In good conscience, I simply cannot support this legislation. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, four years ago, in August 2018, I stood in this place and spoke against the private senator's bill, the Restoring Territory Rights Assisted Suicide Legislation Bill 2015. That legislation failed, not just because I voted against it. Now we have the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022 to consider. This bill will remove constraints on the legislative powers of the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory, constraints that were enacted in 1997 in order for the Commonwealth to overturn Northern Territory legislation which was in the, the first in the world to legislate euthanasia. Four years ago, that is more than two decades after the NT legislation was cancelled, euthanasia was legislated uh, elsewhere across Australia. The Victorian Parliament in November 2017 had passed voluntary assisted dying legislation but it would not come into effect until June 2019. My home state of Western Australia was next. Legislation was enacted in December 2019, and I, and I protested about that. 
Today, every state in Australia has voluntary assisted dying legislation, although in some places the laws are yet to come into effect. So the landscape now is markedly different from four years ago. Euthanasia will soon be able to be practised in all parts of Australia, apart from the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory legislation back in the mid-90s was called the Rights of the Termini Terminally Ill Act. ROTI was the anachronism. And four people took advantage of it because the Commonwealth, before the Commonwealth intervened. I recognise that legislation before us now, the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, does not automatically revive the Northern Territory ROTI Act, but as the explanatory memorandum spells out, it will ensure that the ACT and the Northern Territory Parliaments will be able to allow their citizens the same rights as people living in the six states now hold. And if the two territories want to follow suit, they will have benefit of lessons from the legislation that the states have already worked, worked out and worked upon. Personally, I still hold the same reservations as four years ago about laws which license euthanasia or assisted dying, especially as they may affect First Nations peoples. But in the end, <clears throat> I see euthanasia legislation as whitefellow law to be used by the non-Indigenous population. It's worth recalling the research, as was quoted by Senator Scar previously, the research into Aboriginal views on euthanasia which was commissioned by the Northern Territory Government when its Roddy Act was passed. The research team conducted 21 meetings across the Territory involving 900 Aboriginal people from around 100 communities. They found that at least 90 per cent of those Aboriginal people opposed the legislation, as distinct from the 70 per cent support nationally for euthanasia. Palliative care was universally supported by Aboriginal people as the way people were traditionally cared for under their law. That's still our way. We nurse our elderly into their death in our own communities, sometimes at great personal sacrifice. And remember this, in remote communities, as already been alluded to, there isn't the palliative care services available that are supported elsewhere. And as I said in this place four years ago, any proposal by the Northern Territory to reintroduce assisted suicide legislation must occur in consultation with First Nations health services and communities because First Nations peoples are at a higher risk of being in a situation where assisted dying might take place. I said that four years ago. I have pondered deeply about how to approach the legislation before us now. And in spite of my fundamental spiritual opposition to euthanasia, I have never held to the slippery slope argument. I accept that adequate safeguards have been written into the laws that now prevail in the six states. They may not be adequate, but they're better than what was proposed. For that reason, and in recognition of the widespread non-Indigenous support for the voluntary euthanasia, I intend this time to abstain from voting. I would not want to be the one person whose no vote sank this legislation. I want to talk about other factors that have come into way upon my deliberation. Many of you here would have been lobbied by faith-based organisations to oppose this legislation. Some of those lobbyists have invoked my advocacy. In particular, about the anathema of euthanasia in First Nations peoples to support their cause. The Australian Christian Lobby, for example, has campaigned against this legislation under the headline, Protect Indigenous Lives. And yet, this very same organisation, which purports to be concerned about First Nations peoples, has been peddling offensive propaganda which scoffs at the Aboriginal spiritual beliefs and belittles arguments for First Nations, a First Nations voice to this parliament. 
And Mr Mark Niles is the managing director of the Australian Christian Lobby, who harangues his followers with video clips called The Truth of It. In an 18-minute rant back in June, he railed against the Uluru Statement from the Heart as a pagan document, which he screwed up and tossed at the cameras. A voice to pilot, Isles asserts, is the agenda of critical race theorists who want to divide people on the basis of their skin colour and to implant, in his words, some kind of trouble, some kind of cancer into an otherwise good system. Hiles compounds his, con his, offensive, his offence in another video only a couple of weeks ago when he said he eschews the welcome to country because they affirm paganism and entangles one in false spirituality. I've been distressed by these scornful, hateful diatribes from so-called Christians who are prepared to recruit First Nations peoples to support a campaign against euthanasia and yet won't allow them a seat at the table. Those sorts of diatribes are injurious to respectful discussion. They have no place in our national discourse as we progress towards a referendum to entrench a voice in the constitution. Those opponents of the voice of the parliament say it will be divisive. Those same opponents fail to recognise that their arguments in itself is divisive. Rather than dividing us, I say a voice will be an instrument of healing and reconciliation, a first step in the journey to resettle our relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dodson. I call Senator Macdonald. Thank you. And I want to start by uh, acknowledging the respect and consideration that has in large part been shown by others during this debate, because uh, like all conscience debates, uh, they are decisions and, um, and, and thoughts that weigh heavily upon us all, I'm sure. I rise to discuss the greater rights for the Northern Territory, but I have sincere reservations surrounding the possibility that euthanasia legislation will be a consequence. And while, as a North Queenslander and a Northern Australianer, I do have enormous sympathy for the Territorians having greater autonomy without needing approval from the Commonwealth for the decisions they make. This is, of course, a result of the Northern Territory Self-Government Act of 1978. This bill asks for more decision power on land acquisitions and employment dis disputes. And I would normally think that this is an excellent move that would streamline the administration of the Territory and encourage productivity gains and development. But I have, as I said, sincere concerns with the other aspect of the bill, which will repeal the Commonwealth's rejection of the Territory's ability to, uh, to legalise euthanasia. I, in all good conscience, cannot agree to figuratively hand a gun to someone knowing it would be used to end a human life, no matter the watertight legality of that person being able to hold it. I have reservations about assenting to this bill in its entirety until there is a much more uh, serious discussion about the options to improve the range and availability of palliative care in the Northern Territory. Just this year, famed Aboriginal actor David Gulpilly was forced to undergo palliative care in South Australia, far from his Arnhem, La Arnhem Land home, due to the lack of services. And his family has described how distraught he was at not being able to die on country and it has been reported that this is a wide-ranging problem throughout the Northern Territory. In January this year, the ABC reported that the then federal government had pledged to improve uh, care options across remote Australia, but had stopped short of outlining any specific future plans. The Northern Territory government was also reluctant to promise any new facilities for palliative care in the Territory bush but said that they had recently improved their end-of-life care services in Alice Springs and Darwin. A spokesman also said the Northern Territory Government would support patients who wish to die at home on country, including with transport back to country if that is a request from patient and family. But in a study into remote area palliative care by research body BMC Palliative Care, found Aboriginal people have a growing need for palliative care 
but struggled to have convenient access to it or even information about it. We also have to wonder exactly how much consultation euthanasia advocates have done with the Territory's population broadly and the Aboriginal population uh, in specific. And in the 1996 study by Territory Government researcher Chris McAnulty, as referred to previously by Senator Scar, uh, revealed that while so-called right to die advocates, of which he admits he was one, believed they could just travel around Indigenous communities educating people about euthanasia and be hailed as heroes, the results were in fact the exact opposite. And 21 teams of researchers were tasked by the government with canvassing 900 Aboriginal people in the Territory, and of those 900 people, just two responded favourably to adopting the rights of the Terminally Ill Act. The main reason uh, given was superstition based on tribal belief that killing someone, even via a medical procedure sanctioned by someone wanting to die, was abhorrent. And furthermore, they feared that if killing someone with doctor-administered drugs were made legal by the government, then those drugs could be used by others, either sinister people with evil motives or could archer men and sorcerers to commit murder. Now, I appreciate that this is not a view held right across the Northern Territory, but it is, I believe, our responsibility to ensure that we are protecting everyone, but most importantly, the most vulnerable in our community. The findings also stated that allowing medical professionals, usually the most trusted in Aboriginal communities, to end life would erode that trust and lead to people delaying treatment and or seeking alternative remedies. And indeed, once the concept of euthanasia was explained to them, Many Aboriginal people stated they would not feel safe going to the doctor anymore, even for minor ailments. And the report author, Mr McAnulty, again a staunch advocate of euthanasia, made the sobering conclusion that the Northern Territory was certainly the wrong jurisdiction to legalise, legalise assisted dying. He didn't say arguably or possibly. He was unequivoc unequivocal. The Territory was certainly the wrong jurisdiction. So what price do we pay on delaying, people delaying treatment and ultimately becoming terminally ill when early intervention could have saved their lives? How can we celebrate the Northern Territory having more of a say over its own destiny while knowing its most vulnerable people would be adversely affected by this aspect of the change? The other grave concern I have is that we are simply offering a solution that is easy compared to the much more difficult task of ensuring terminally ill Territorians can access all treatment options. The Northern Territory has the lowest life expectancy in the country, at an average 74 years, compared to 80.5 years right here in the ACT, and its population is spread out far and wide from the main population centres. And it should be a matter of human decency and responsible government to ensure seriously ill people have the choice of a full suite of treatments, not influenced simply by where they live or their personal finances. I point to the, the uh, House to a recent development in Canada where reports have surfaced of people being encouraged to undergo euthanasia because they couldn't afford expensive treatment. Uh, in one case reported in the media, a war veteran with PTSD and an acquired brain injury was offered the following choices, undertake long-term and expensive treatment or euthanasia. And how has the situation gone from, oh, we just want people to die with dignity, to maybe you should agree to be euthanised instead of paying all these nasty medical bills? His conditions were serious but not considered terminal, and yet medical staff reportedly offered medically assisted dying as a money-saving option. I've heard from people concerned their loved ones can be convinced to end their lives by unscrupulous family members or spouses. So-called elder abuse isn't just limited to financial scams, it can manifest as physical harm and medical, medi mental degradation to the point that sufferers make major decisions that make no sense to their families. And it is great worry to people that greedy people will take advantage of sick elderly relatives' fragile mental states to get them to agree to end their own lives. A big part of improving medical care and, me and treatment options is improving the Territory's economy. and One way to do this, of course, is to open up the vast gas reserves in the Beedaloo Basin. 
The major reason for the Northern Territory status as a non-state is its reliance on Commonwealth funding to administer itself. Its population is small and extremely spread out, and many people live in the most remote parts of Australia, which increases the cost to government to provide services. The obvious answer to the Northern Territory winning full statehood is for it to reduce its reliance on federal funding and to become more self-sufficient. The quickest way to do this is, as I've said, to unlock its vast gas and mineral deposits in areas such as the Beedaloo Basin. The Northern Territory Labor government is in financial dire straits. Its net debt as a percentage of GDP is the highest in the country. And even with its impressive tourism offerings, a handful of operating mines, vast cattle stations and busy live export port, there's just not enough people and not enough money coming in. And as long as the Northern Territory needs the federal government to pay the bills, the federal government will continue to have a say over its affairs. Meanwhile, right under its feet are some of Australia's largest deposits of oil and gas, namely in the Beedaloo and Georgina basins, worth billions of dollars. There is opposition to that from cattle producers, environmentalists and Indigenous groups. But if a compromise can be found, the Territory could drastically improve its chances of self-determination as a state. I would call on this federal government to continue the momentum gained by the previous government the revitalised Northern Australia agenda. The Territory is in dire need of more people, more industry and more development. And it beggars belief that while the Labor Party thought floods in Sydney and Brisbane deserved instant action, large parts of the Northern Territory are cut off during every wet season, leaving people isolated without access to fresh food. The Territory cannot grow, cannot determine its own destiny without federal attention and real practical help. The Northern Territory is truly special to Australia, but it deserves to be granted more autonomy, but we must be mindful of unintended consequences. So specifically, I would ask that before there be any further consideration given to allowing for euthanasia to be granted in that territory, that the people of the, of the territory be asked themselves, do they have suitable alternative care? Do they have end of life uh, provision for palliative care? And is this something that they would truly want to contemplate, or are we just exposing the most vulnerable parts of our community to another risk? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. I call Senator McCarthy. <coughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, Senators, one of the most powerful moments, I think, as an elected member in this country is being able to stand up and represent the people who put you uh, in the place to represent them, whether it be at a local government le level, uh, whether it be at a state or territory level, or whether it be here in the House of Representatives or indeed the Senate. How incredibly precious is that opportunity to represent? And one of the most wonderful things about our country is our democracy. Uplifting, a shared space where we can debate, agree, disagree, and have the opportunity to make laws on behalf of the people who put us in these places. President, I stood for the people of the Northern Territory in 2005 and represented the people of Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory Parliament, indeed for a number of terms, an incredible honour. First Nations people of all different dialects, over 100 Aboriginal languages, still maintain and still strong. And yet when we come to an issue about whether the Thank people you, of Senator the Senator McCarthy, the time for this debate has now adjourned. I'll call Senator Green. Thank you, President. A few weeks ago on the August the 23rd, Torres Strait Islander regional leaders came together on Mazic Island to mark an important historical milestone, the 85th 
anniversary of the first ever Torres Strait Islander Council Conference. As a senator for Queensland, I feel lucky to serve such a culturally rich community. The Torres Strait is made up of hundreds of islands in the strait between Cape York and Papua New Guinea. There are 15 unique communities represented by the Torres Strait Regional Council, led by my friend Mayor Philemon Mosby. While I've spent a lot of time in the Torres Strait, this was my first time visiting Masic Island. Masic is a community of 250 people only. Its history is one of fishing, activism, religion, song and dance. Mazik is represented by Councillor Hilda Mosby. Hilda has made the progress of her community her life's work. During the time I spent with her touring the island, she communicated the issues of her community through profound story and frank feedback. Hilda was hosting hundreds of visitors on Masik Island, but took the time to take me to the quiet corners in need of repair and the proud monuments of her community's history. Like her peers on the regional council, Hilda is hands-on and extremely passionate about her community and region. Torres Strait Islanders comprom comprise of 15 communities, each with their own custom, law, culture and, most importantly, delicacy. It takes real work, thoughtful leadership and generous compromise to build consensus amongst the islands, and that's exactly what was achieved on this historic occasion. Masic Conference drew a through line between the past of the Torres Strait, its present and its future. Community leaders shared insight from the very first Council Conference held on the 23rd of August 1937. It would be remiss of me to not acknowledge that this is a historical date for more than one reason. Not 30 years later, on the 23rd of August 1966, Vincent Lingiari led the Gurunji strike or the Wave Hill walk-off on the exact same date in the calendar. Fast forward to 2022, and August 23 was the date of the Torres Strait Islander community leaders signing and reciting what they referred to as the Mazic Statement or the Voice from the Deep. The Mazic Statement outlines a path to self-determination and regional autonomy for the Torres Strait. In my first few hours on the island, I heard Deputy Mayor Banny say this is the beginning of a new beginning for the Torres Strait. This refrain was repeated through the celebrations. In the context of a looming referendum, communities striving for new beginnings feels full of promise. We spoke at length about what this statement means in the context of a voice to parliament. As my good friend Thomas Mayer said on this occasion, this statement gives strength to the campaign for a voice to parliament. It complements the Uluru statement rather than competing with it, because the statement is about a community clearly articulating their ambitions for their kids, their grandkids and future generations. Torres Strait Islanders are a people renowned for their clever, patient campaigning. And through my time visiting the Torres Strait as a senator for Queensland, I have observed that an important part of building consensus is sharing story. After years of spending time with community, I took the time during my address to share with elders where I had come from and how that translated into my strong commitment for collectivism and justice. I spoke about education and collectivism, learnt from the trade union movement and reflected on the ways in which our histories interweave through shared activism and cooperation. I was grateful to deepen my knowledge of the history of the Torres Strait and in the many ways it was communicated. It is hard to put into words just how much can be communicated with story, dance and song. Pages of beautiful words brought to life through movement and sound. I want to talk about Councillor Uncle John Ebendo. Deep in the hot afternoon, just after lunch of sandwiches and fruit, he stood up in front of a crowded room and through his words and his story, invited the rest of the Torres Strait Island leadership to culturally adopt me as their daughter and sister. I'm very honoured that they collectively said yes. And I realise that this is symbolic in nature but I was very deeply moved. I take this generous welcome in the spirit that it was offered. 
with the thoughtful consideration to how I can contribute to this community and profoundly respect for the history that I have been invited into. That contribution starts here today, using my voice to build awareness, consensus and enthusiasm, not only for the Massic Statement, but for a voice to parliament that is so deeply needed to restore self-determination to the people of the Torres Strait. With the remaining time, I want to read the Massic Statement into the Hansard tonight, and I do so wearing this necklace that Philemon Mosby was wearing when he read this Massic Statement for the first time in front of the crowd. He gifted it to me before I left the island. The statement says, to establish principles and parameters on behalf of the peoples of the Torres Strait and Northern Peninsula area to act together in unity in order to pursue and achieve self-determination and regional autonomy, and in doing so, preserve our distinct and diverse spiritual, material and economic relationship with the lands, territories, waters, coastal seas and other resources with which we have connection under custom and Aboriginal tradition. The aims of the Massic Statement are in accordance with Article 3 of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on the 13th of September 2007 and supported by the Australian Government on the 3rd of April 2009 and the preamble of the Human Rights Act 2019, we seek to achieve our right to self-determination as the peoples of the Northern Strait, Torres Strait and Northern Peninsula area. By virtue of our sovereign right, we have the right to freely determine our political status and to freely pursue economic, social and cultural development. In keeping with Article 4 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in exercising our right to self-determination, we have the right to autonomy and self-government in matters relating to our internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing our autonomous functions. Therefore, we will create partnerships with key regional stakeholders, the Queensland and Australian governments together, with other relevant organisations to better equip us to work together to achieve our regional goals and aspirations. In working together as representatives of the people of the Torres Strait and the Northern Peninsula area, obtaining a safeguard our human rights enshrined in international, national and Queensland law. And the statement reads, passed 23rd of August 1937 was the beginning of regional autonomy. Present, the 23rd of August 2022 is the beginning of a new beginning, the Massic Statement. 23rd of August 2037, in the future, the beginning of regional sovereignty. I want to thank all of the people of the Torres Strait who welcomed me to Massic Island. Through this statement, we see enormous grace. It's a hard-fought consensus on the future of a truly unique region. It is the beginning of a new beginning of the Torres Strait. It is a beginning of a pathway to a voice to parliament. I implore other senators in this place to hear these words, to work with us and to take up the generous offer that the Uluru Statement delivers, that the Massic Statement delivers and that a voice to parliament promises. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator McGrath. Thank you. As the clouds of war enveloped the world in 1939, a long forgotten Irish politician uttered a truism, democracy, freedom and liberty must always be defended, and that Southern Ireland, as it was, should support Britain against Nazi Germany. Most of the Irish political class shamefully backed neutrality. James Dillon was an Irish nationalist of the old school. He and his family had for years, through democratic means, fought the British for Irish independence. Notwithstanding that historical hinterland, James understood that liberal democracies must always back other liberal democracies. While Australia and Israel do not have the historical dislike of Ireland and Britain, Australian support for Israel 
shall be no less surprising nor less forthright than the words uttered by Mr Dillon. Israel is a beacon of liberal democracy in a sea of democratic darkness. Since 1948, Israel has long fought not just to exist as an independent state, but to fight for the survival of all her people. Existing in a permanent state of war, not because it is an aggressor, but it is a victim. A victim of history, a victim of hatred, a victim of historical anti-Semitism. Yet Israel is anything but a victim. Its citizens, all her people, Jewish, Christian, Orthodox, Druze, Muslim, non-believer, are all free. It is the birthplace of innovation and the start-up. It is turning its deserts into, into a food bowl. Most importantly, it is a democracy, a vibrant, boisterous carnival of elections. So much so that, as I speak, Israel is undergoing its fifth election in three years. None of the enemies of Israel have ever held a free election. None of the enemies of, of Israel are free liberal democracies. None of the people of the Middle East have the freedom of all the people of Israel. To the north, the terrorist army Hezbollah has turned Lebanon and southern Syria, Syria into client states of Iran. Iran is an evil, despicable regime intent on using nuclear weapons to destroy Israel and all Jewish peoples. While to the south, the bloodthirsty terrorist group Hamas have turned Gaza into a giant launching pad for rockets into Israel. On the West Bank, the corrupt Palestinian Authority rules with Western donor financial support. Yet it is a regime that uses the ugly politics of hate to remain in power, a regime that honours suicide bombers, both with money and monuments. The miracle is not that Israel has survived, but it has thrived. And for that, we in Australia are grateful. And we can only wish that the rights and freedoms enjoyed by Israelis would be shared by all the peoples across the Middle East. And perhaps the haters of Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas should read the words that you read as you leave the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. Remember only that I was innocent, and just like you mortal on that day, I too had a face marked by rage, by joy and pity, quite simply a human face. Freedom conquers all. Thank you, Senator Burrell. Senator Cox. regarding free trade agreements and the importance of Australia pushing for Indigenous inclusion chapters. Australia's free trade agreement processes lack any transparency or the ability for communities to actually comment on the potential impacts before they are agreed upon. The report 193 of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties highlighted that civil society groups, unions, community members, traditional owners and environmental advocates are not provided with the same level of access to these negotiation processes as business and industry are. The report also stated that Australia's free trade uh, agreement consultation process is inadequate and indeed very tokenistic. And this is because corporations get a seat at the table over environmentalists, unionists, traditional owners and community members. These deals often benefit large corporations and compromise human rights, labour laws, cultural heritage and environmental protections. This process is so secretive that we only see the agreement once it has been agreed to, so there's no scope for any actual amendments without serious concessions. The government claims this secrecy is in fact uh, an issue of national security, which frankly is a bit of a cop-out, and I'm not convinced that this is the only option. In fact, we know it's not. New Zealand has a much broader and even more transparent consultation process that starts before negotiations even begin 
and actually continue until the free trade agreement is ratified. There are public consultation meetings and an opportunity for everyone to make a submission and participate in the parliamentary examination processes. Another feature of New Zealand's treaty negotiation process is the dedicated Māori engagement to provide any active partnership and respond to the range of needs, aspirations, rights and interests of Māori as a Crown Treaty partner. So this again is yet another reason why we need to be pushing for a First Nations federal treaty in this country. Australia's treaty agreement framework falls short in its transparency, accountability and upholding human rights and environmental standards. This needs to change. The Australian Labor Party, when they were in opposition, and the Australian Greens have argued that Australia's free trade agreement making process should be better and more transparent. And for years, these two major parties have written trade policy in favour of big corporations and at the expense of community, workers, human rights, traditional owners and the environment. Another major flaw in this process is, is that, in fact, this government and previous governments have not pushed for an Indigenous inclusion chapter in our free trade agreements. The Australian-UK free trade agreement, which was signed last year in December, does not include a chapter on Indigenous trade. And in the recent trade agreement between New Zealand and the UK, there was, in fact, a chapter that contained provisions for cooperative uh, activities to strengthen the trade relationship between the UK, New Zealand and Māori enterprises. The aim of this chapter is to help Māori enterprises maximise the opportunities that arise during free trade agreements alongside New Zealand and UK enterprises and recognises the importance and value of Māori to New Zealand's economy and, in fact, to its society. This means that the UK government is open to the inclusion of, of these chapters and if they are pushed to include them, this government could do that. The previous government clearly didn't care enough to push this, and it seemed unlikely that the current government will actually care to try and do this and amend the agreements to provide the inclusion of such a chapter. And since the parliament has not cared enough to set up an inquiry into the potential benefits of Indigenous inclusion chapters, we don't even know what we're missing out on because we haven't even asked the question. We've had our land stolen, our cultural heritage destroyed, and now there has been a recent rise in companies who are using native ingredients, the First Nations botanicals, marketing themselves as First Nations companies and making huge profits, but the profits are not going back to the community. These profits are actually sitting in a select few. Often they are run by whitefellas and they're stealing and capitalising on our knowledges. We need an Indigenous inclusion chapter that is actually going to place First Nations business at businesses at the heart of that. Thank you, Senator Thank Cox. You. Senator Billy. Thank you, um, President. <clears throat> On Monday last week, I was pleased to attend the Australian Government's Building Community Forum in Hobart, followed later in the day by the Hobart Jobs and Skills Summit. I was joined at the Jobs and Skills Summit by my colleague, Senator Brown, and Member for Lyons, Brian Mitchell. The Assistant Treasurer and Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, Dr Andrew Lee, attended both meetings. Unlike the previous government, the Albanese Labor government has been listening to and consulting with a broad range of stakeholders on issues confronting Australians. The Hobart Jobs and Skills Summit was one of over 100 across Australia, including three in Tasmania, that fed in from local representatives of workers, businesses, training providers and other stakeholders to the National Summit in Canberra. Tasmanian summits have also been held in Launceston and Devonport. Hobart Building Community Forum was the sixth across Australia to hear from Australian charities and not-for-profits about the challenges they are facing as well as where they are finding success. It's refreshing to have a federal government, a federal Labor government, that is ready and willing to work with Australian charities rather than trying to gag them, restrain them and bury them in red tape. This government is a friend of charities and the decade-long Liberal war on charities is finally over. The 100 representatives at the forum came from charities of all sizes and across a range of causes, including religion, environment, education, health, 
including mental health, poverty, homelessness, disability, public interest journalism and even animal rescue. Many had suffered through the pandemic, with donation revenue falling and struggling to re-engage disengaged volunteers while demand for their services went through the roof. We heard from charities that regulation or red tape was a big issue for them, as was funding certainty. While the previous government dragged its feet on fixing Australia's outdated charity fundraising laws, and uh, you might remember I worked with Dr Lee on pressuring them to adopt the recommendations of the Senate inquiry I chaired to relieve charities of this $15 million a year red tape burden, I was pleased to hear Dr Lee say the government will be looking at reporting requirements for grants and will provide longer funding agreements so organisations can focus more of their resources on service delivery. We also heard from charities that they would like more support to engage and recognise volunteers and to achieve deductible gift recipient status. So I'd just like to thank everyone who attended and contributed to the forum and Dr Lee for his consistent work over many years consulting with and acting on the needs of charities. Now later in the day, the same day, the Jobs and Skills Roundtable hosted by Dr Lee, Mr Mitchell, Senator Brown and myself heard from more than 70 business, union, civil society and education leaders from across Tasmania. Among the feedback we heard were calls for incentives for businesses to host apprentices and the need to address the discrepancy between Tasmanian and mainland wages, a phenomenon known informally as the Tassie Leisure Tax. The lower average wages paid to Tasmanians provides an incentive for Tasmanian workers to leave for mainland jobs, but little incentive for in-demand workers to move to Tasmania. Attendees expressed fear over the risks the gig economy and labour hire currently poses to secure, safe and well-paying work. There were strong expressions of disappointment over the previous government's gutting of vocational education and training, particularly TAFE, and there was broad agreement that TAFE needs to provide the skills Tasmanians need in the changing economy. We also heard that there is a need to rethink how our education system delivers career education to young people. We were told that migrants need a simplified system for their overseas qualifications to be recognised in Australia. Sometimes skilled migrants are caught up in red tape, and this causes them to end up unemployed in the sector unrelated um, to, to end up employed in the sector unrelated to their qualification. Also discussed was the need for housing and infrastructure supply close to where there is demand for work. All in all, it was a collegial and productive discussion and the outcomes of that discussion, along with many others throughout the country, were fed into the National Summit in Canberra. So once again, I'd just like to thank all the participants for coming together for such a broad-ranging conversation and for Dr Lee for being there for both forums and facilitating the Building Community Forum because these events show how the Albanese Labor government seek to listen and consult with the Australian community. It shows that we will bring people together, not divide them. It's a stark contrast to the politics of division practised by those opposite when they were in government and which they continue to practise to this day. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator D. Smith. Thank you, President. We marked Vietnam Veterans Day on the 18th of August, a solemn occasion on the anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan that honours the service and sacrifice of the many thousands of Australians who fought in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. One of them was my father, who served with the 7 Royal Australian Regiment. I was proud to observe the occasion by attending a wreath-laying ceremony at the RSL Wanneroo near my electorate office in Perth's northern suburbs. This year's commemorations also coincided with the 60th anniversary of the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam's deployment. This was the first Australian contingent to set foot in South Vietnam and the last to leave. Today I wish to share some of the history and to honour their service of this most highly decorated Australian unit, one of the most highly decorated units to serve in any conflict. The unit first arrived on 3 August 1962 originally numbering 30 men made up of a mixture of officers, sergeants and warrant officers under the command of Colonel F.P. Ted Sarong. It was informally known as The Team and 1,009 men served with the unit over its decade of operation, 998 of them Australians and 11 New Zealanders. The team provided training and leadership to South Vietnam forces, giving instruction in jungle warfare techniques and technical areas such as signals and engineering. 
For its first two years, it was developed, deployed on operations as observers only, providing advisory support in the field without the authorization to engage with the enemy. This was unsurprisingly impractical, as they were often caught in ambushes without the right to defend themselves. In 1964, these restrictions were lifted, thrusting the team into some of the fiercest, fiercest fighting of the war. The first member to be killed in action was Warren Officer Class 2 Kevin Conway at the Battle of Nam Dong on the 6th of July 1964. Thirty-three men in the unit would eventually give the ultimate sacrifice of their country, and another 122 were wounded. For many in the team, service in Vietnam was an isolating experience. They often worked alone or in pairs in small advisory teams which served with Vietnamese units. Their dispersal meant Australia had a, a countrywide presence and with it the ability to assess the situation well beyond the borders of provinces in which most Australians served. The difficulty of their task formed part of their identity, with the, unfit, with the unit motto being persevere. In the foreword to the book The Men Who Persevered, an account of the team's role in Vietnam, team veteran Major John Hartley provided this description of their experience and their service. A unique quality of the team was its varied and frequently changing function. Certainly there was a training element, but members also led units, advised all manner of Vietnamese officers and officials, served on headquarters and determined policy. They were closely involved with regular and irregular forces, with special forces and Cam Cam Cambodians with combat support and combat experience and service support units. At one time or another, they were deployed individually or in small teams to almost every province of South Vietnam. Despite their small numbers, they remained the Australian face in the memories of many Americans and Vietnamese who also served in that conflict. When Australia and American forces began to withdraw from Vietnam, the team's operations reverted back to their original task of training, providing South Vietnamese forces with vital preparation. The last members of the Australian Army training team Vietnam would withdraw on the 18th of December 1972, the last Australians to leave the conflict. It's appropriate to end this contribution by noting and recognising that four Victoria Crosses were awarded to its members, with numerous other awards and decorations conferred, including those conferred by the United States and the Republic of South Vietnam. Tonight, I acknowledge with great pride the service of all Australians who served in the Vietnam conflict. Yeah, yeah. Your service is remembered, and today it's honoured. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator Smith. The Senate now stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 12th of September at 10 a.m.